Hello, welcome to the Django REST Framework tutorial series. In this one, I'm gonna take you step-by-step step to build your very own REST API. Now, why would you ever wanna do this? Well, if you wanna make a tool for other developers, building a REST API is probably one of the things you'll start with. You'll actually learn how to make your website be able to communicate with other pieces of software, whether that's a React.js application, a Vue.js application, or another Django project or a fast API project, or really anything. Because once you have the structure of a REST API, your software can communicate to all other software anywhere in the world, and you can do so securely, which is fantastic. Now we'll start with a pure Django REST API, because it's definitely possible. Then we'll see some of the downsides of that to introduce the Django REST framework, which actually really shortcuts how we can build our own REST API and it does so in a way that, well, I've been using for years. Then we're gonna go ahead and build our own Python client, a client that will emulate if another developer was interacting with our service. Then we'll go ahead and create a JavaScript one so you can see how that's done, even if it's a little complicated. And then finally, we're gonna integrate with a third-party REST API service, and it happens to be the sponsor of this series, Algolia. Now, I actually use Algolia on codingforentrepreneurs.com for search. It is my default search engine as of today, which is fantastic too. I am really, really enjoying their service, but you'll see that Algolia is a result of building a really powerful REST API itself. And you could do that too, and it starts right here with the Django REST framework. Now, my name is Justin Mitchell, and I'm gonna be taking you through this one step-by-step. Step. Of course, if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, let's jump right in. All right, so let's do a quick overview of the tools we'll be using. First and foremost, if you ever get stuck, all of the code is right on GitHub for your reference. So check the link in the description for that, or just navigate to cfe.sh slash GitHub, and you'll find all of the repositories that we have. Next, we're gonna be using the Django REST framework. Hopefully that's fairly obvious by the title of this series, but the idea here is we wanna go into this in a lot of depth. It's not gonna cover every aspect of the Django REST framework because the documentation is incredible. I think once you have a solid foundation, you can go through the documentation really, really easily. And the Django REST framework is built on top of, of course, Django, right? So you absolutely need Django to run the Django REST framework. Hopefully that's clear, but if it's not, hopefully it is now. Now, the thing about Django here is we can go in depth in a lot of ways with Django. I am not gonna go in that much depth, but I will cover some of the basics on at least getting our Django REST framework stuff up working and why you might need the Django REST framework and not just Django. That's, I think, a key part of all of this too. Next, of course, we are gonna be writing all of this stuff in Python because Django is written in Python, Django REST Framework are written in Python. So make sure that you have some experience with Python. Check out my 30 Days of Python series if you do not. Really fundamental understanding of Python is okay. Like if you can do functions, you're probably okay. If you can make classes, you're probably good. That also assumes that you know how to do variables and stuff like that. Next, of course, is we're gonna be using Python requests. So when you design an API, a REST API, with something like the Django REST framework, one of the cool things that you're gonna to wanna to do is actually test that it's working. I'm gonna go into a lot of detail here. This is not automated test. This is like as if you were developing something to use that API. Again, I'll go into this a lot more in this series. Python requests will allow for us to do that. Next, of course, we're gonna be using the Django course headers. This is really important in order for all of this stuff to work correctly. Um, and it's gonna be a little bit more important once we get into some of the web-based component of this for the client itself. Again, that might be a little complicated, but I do wanna set this up to make sure that your Django REST framework is ready to work with other applications pretty well. And then of course, I'm gonna be using VS Code as my text editor, my code editor. You can use any one that you'd like. This is the one I'm gonna use and I'm gonna set up and stuff like that. It's free, it's open source, so I highly recommend that you do that. So if you have any questions on the tools and stuff like that, let me know in the comments. Otherwise, let's keep going. Now we're gonna go ahead and set up a Python virtual environment to isolate all of our project versions and whatnot. And then we're gonna go ahead and start our Django project open up terminal or PowerShell, depending on what system you're on, and go ahead and type out make dir p, 
And then it's gonna be in your user root, which is this tilde line right here. And then dev, this will create a new folder called dev if it doesn't exist. Then we're gonna go ahead and call our root project folder as DRF. You can call it whatever you want. Just be aware of what you end up calling it. We hit enter here and now I'm gonna go ahead and CD into that folder. Of course, change directory here. And if I do PWD on Linux and Mac, I see the actual path. If you're on Windows, you can do DIR. That will show you that same path as well. Notice it has my username in there and whatnot. So I can also open this folder with simply open period on Mac and Linux. If you're on Windows, it's just II period, and that will open that directory. Cool. So now what I wanna do inside of this root is I want to actually create a virtual environment. Now we do this by using Python, the version of Python that we wanna use. In my case, I'm using Python 3.10. You need to use at minimum Python 3.8. So Python 3.10, dash M V E N V V E N V. Now I'm actually going to be putting my virtual environments in a new folder called V E N V. This is a bit of better practice if you've seen what I've done in the past. But anyways, so once I do this, this is going to contain all of the files and reference files, third party packages, all of that stuff that's related directly to this particular project, not to any other Python project, but this one in particular, as you might already be well aware. Now, if you're on Windows, the command is probably gonna be something a little bit closer to Python 3.10, python.exe, dash M, V, E, M, V, V, M, V. Cool. So once you actually have this V, E, M, V folder or this virtual environment folder, we need to activate it. We need to do this every time we start working with our project. So to do this on Mac and Linux, it's source V, E, M, V, bin slash activate, just like that. Now it's active as we see right here. If you're on Windows, it's dot slash uh, VEMV slash scripts slash activate, and that will also activate it as well. And it'll look very similar. We'll have this VEMV at the beginning of that. Now, when I talked about actual differences in Python versions, the package versions, that has to do with, of course, everything we install through pip. So if I do a quick pip freeze, I should have nothing installed. In my case, if I open up a new terminal window and do pip freeze on my main computer, well, I don't even have pip running here, right? So that is a sign that my virtual environment is working. In some cases, you might see other packages installed. So let's actually install a lot of our packages. Before I do that though, I'm gonna go ahead and do code period. What this does is open up VS Code for our project. If for some reason that didn't work, just open up VS Code, you would see uh, something like this and then navigate over here and hit open folder or just simply file open folder. And then you can navigate to the folder you wanna work in. And so now that I've got VS Code here, I'm gonna go ahead and save a workspace file. So we'll go ahead and save workspace as and DRF code workspace. Simple enough, not that big of a deal. So from going forward, we're gonna be using VS Code for entire environment. So I can actually toggle the terminal in here as well. So whenever I open this up, this is just control tilde. Okay, so control tilde will toggle this for you and that's true on Mac, Linux and Windows that will toggle open up a terminal window. Of course, that's identical to this terminal window. It's just slightly different in the sense that it's inside of VS Code. And so if I actually run this now, again, I need to make sure that I run source VEMV bin slash activate to activate that virtual environment. That is a key part of this. Okay, so now that we've got all this all going, we've got our virtual environment, I'm now gonna go ahead and add in a requirements file. So requirements.txt. Now we're gonna just add in all those packages that I mentioned in the tools. So Django, Django REST framework, uh, Py YAML, we might end up using Python requests, and then Django-cores headers. Okay. So in my case for Django, what I want to do is I want to actually have a specific Django version because Django itself does evolve mostly over time more than all of those other packages in terms of how it actually works and how it functions with other things. So what I want to do here is go into the Django project and look for the current version. In my case, it's 4.0. Now, I always recommend that you should probably use the LTS version, which in this case is 3.2 but I'm gonna go ahead and go with 4.0 and I'll just show you how easy it is to switch between those two versions. What we're doing here won't have a major impact on the Django versions. 
So what I can do is say Django equal greater than or equals to 4.0.0 and then less than 4.1.0. That's it, right? So 4.1 is the next version. And this will actually install the latest version of Django 4.0. When we come back into our virtual environment, activate it and run pip install dash r requirements dot txt. This of course will install everything. Now I realize for some of you, this is a lot of review, but I always like improving best practices when it comes to my own requirements txt and my approach for these virtual environments, which is why you see slight changes from time to time. I'm also gonna go ahead and upgrade pip. So pip install upgrade and pip, and there we go. So now with that going, I'm also gonna create two new folders in here. So the first one is gonna be called backend. And then inside of here, I'm also gonna do pi client. So backend is where our Django project's gonna live and the Django REST framework. Pi client is gonna be something that consumes that backend, which we'll see just in a little bit. So inside of this backend here is actually where I want my Django project to run. So I'm gonna CD into that backend and we'll go ahead and do Django-admin start project. And I'm just gonna call this CFE home. And then I'll just put a period here. So it creates it in inside of the backend folder. And then I've got this whole project here. Now I actually recommend that you stick with me on calling your Django project CFE home that way, a lot of the paths and how I do things isn't gonna be a whole lot different going forward. So now that we've got some of these fundamental things done, let's actually build our first Python API client. It's actually pretty simple, as we'll see. In a moment, we're gonna go and create our first Python API client. But before we do that, I wanna mention that there are new files in this project, and that has to do with Git, that's G-I-T, or version control. Same with this number down here. So four dash end, this is actually corresponding to, this is the fourth section. And once I actually finish this fourth section off the video, I'll actually submit that code onto GitHub so you can have a direct reference. So if you go into these branches here, you can see the state of the code at the end of that section. And if you're ever confused what section it is, just check the video. It should have the correct section for which one you're gonna to want to reference. Okay, cool. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and create our first Python client. And so I'm gonna go ahead and create a file in here called basic.py, and I'm gonna go ahead and import requests, and I wanna set an endpoint. Now an endpoint in terms of a API client is really kind of like your URL, right? You could call it a URL, but it's very often that you'll declare it as an endpoint because throughout your client, you'll have several different endpoints. So when you're working with a REST API, there's gonna be a lot of different endpoints. Let me just show you one for example. So I'm just gonna go and say HTTPS www.github.com, right? So I can declare this as an endpoint. So if I copied that and went into github.com on my browser, I'll see what this data ends up doing. Let's actually look at it inside of a incognito window where I'm not logged in. This is our github.com page, right? So what actually happened here was our web browser made what's called a request to the GitHub servers at github.com and it returned what? What did it return? What did the browser return? I, I really hope that you already have a sense as to what it returned, but if you don't, that's okay. We can take a look at something called view source. So in the developer stuff, we see view source, it returns an HTML document. That's it. So the server is sending back a document the web browser reads that document and then makes it look cool, basically. So this is not an API endpoint at all, or a REST API endpoint at all. It's really just gonna return HTML. So what we wanna do is use an actual REST API endpoint. Don't worry, I'll explain the API of it all in just a moment, uh, but I wanna use an endpoint that's real. To do that, I'm gonna go ahead and use a place called httpben.org. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy httpbin.org and paste it into this endpoint. So what we see here is a bunch of different potential items that I can use. So if you click on any of these items, you see that there is a path here. So in other words, if I go into uh, httpbin, let's just actually take a look at this path in our browser. So if I go slash status slash 200, I actually am going to a path. This is another endpoint. Right, so I'm gonna go ahead and put this one above. 
and we'll actually look at that endpoint as well. So that's pretty cool. Now, this is why you call it endpoints is because there's many different endpoints that a API, a REST API will end up having. So I'm going to use one called anything. This endpoint will echo back what I send to it, which we'll see in a moment. So to actually request something here, we need to use the library called requests. We need to use the API that's in this library. In other words, I need to use something called requests.get. This is basically an API, but it's a function. It's an actual method that's built into it. So API just stands for application programming interface. So application programming interface. Okay, so using this library is a form of using an API. It's just not always thought of that way. Another way to think of an API is like your phone, right? So your phone has a camera and every app that uses that camera uses an API to grab that camera. Now, why am I telling you about this and the library one? That's because these are examples of not APIs. These are just library APIs. These are not REST APIs. So REST APIs are what we're gonna be using and what we're gonna be building. They have to do with the internet. That's really more of like a web API. That's kind of how you're gonna to wanna to think about this as a, it's a web API. It's certainly not the only kind of API that a web can have, but it is the one that we're using. Now I'll, I'll go over REST itself later, but for now, just think of REST APIs as a web-based API. Now that doesn't mean that it has to go across the internet, but it does mean that it's gonna use something called an HTTP request. Now, remember back when I said we're using Python requests. Now, the reason for that is because it does HTTP requests for us. So it actually does the kind of requests that we're trying to do with our APIs. Now, this might feel very complicated. So let's go ahead and start looking at more practical things. First off, we're gonna do using the request library, we're gonna use the get method here. This is gonna emulate a HTTP get request. And actually, before I do anything, that endpoint, I'm gonna go ahead and just grab the home page of HTTP bin, which is what we've been on, right? So if I go back in here to just HTTP bin.org, this is the home page. Okay. So if I actually do this get request, I should get a get response back, right? So this request right here will be assigned to the variable of get response. And what I can do in here is do get response dot text. This is printing out the source code or whatever is responded, the raw text response, the body response, if you will. So now if we save this, let's go ahead and do a quick run here. I'm gonna go and run Python and pi client slash basic dot pi. I hit enter and what do I get back? Hey, what do you know? It's identical to the source code. So if we go into view developer view source, this is the same thing. So what you may have seen already and something I might have even shown you on one of my videos is how to actually scrape data using Python requests. That is how to open a web page and grab the data that you may want. Now, in our case, that's not what we want to do. We want to use an actual REST API. And of course, HTTP has that. So if I change this to simply anything, just really just changing the endpoint to anything, what's gonna happen here? Now, if I run it, I actually get a different kind of response. It's formatted data that my actual Python application could in theory use, right? So that's the huge difference here. On one hand, a regular HTTP request, a non-API request will give you HTML, a REST API request, which is still HTTP, but it's a, let's say it's a REST API HTTP request that will send usually something back called JSON. Sometimes it's in XML and other formats, but we're going to put it in JSON. I'll explain JSON in a moment. So this is really just the difference. On one hand, a web API allows your application to work with another application through the web through the internet, some sort of internet request. When it comes to an HTTP request, you get HTML, that's made for the browser, that's made for humans to look at. REST APIs isn't really made for humans to look at. 
Granted, we can design software around them, so humans sort of have to look at it, but it's not really meant for humans. It's meant for software to communicate with each other over the web. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this JSON thing here. I'm gonna go ahead and comment this out for a moment. And what we got here is we can actually look at this text again, and we see this data right here. So if I copy this manually and pasted it in here, this is actually a valid Python dictionary with the exception of this JSON null here. It's almost a Python dictionary, but it's not. It stands for JavaScript, so JavaScript object notation, which is almost a Python dictionary, but it's not, right? They're just slightly different. And that's because JavaScript object notation or JSON, right? Some people call it JSON, but to me, JSON is a buddy of mine. JSON is an object type. That's really how I think about it. But you can call it whatever you want. Just know that that's what I do. Anyways, so um, now that we have understand hopefully a little bit more, trust me, we are gonna be working a lot with JSON. We're gonna be working a lot with all these things. So even if it's still confusing, hopefully over the course of the series, it'll be a lot less confusing because we're gonna create a lot more clients. Okay, so anyways, so we've got the potential to use JSON. It's almost a dictionary. Now, what we can do here is if it is JSON response, we can actually run something like git response JSON, and I can now actually print this out as a Python dictionary. Now it is a proper dictionary. So I can copy this raw code again, and we can paste in here. This time, the JSON of it all is declared as none instead of null. In this case, that's the only difference. There are, of course, a lot of differences that could occur, uh, but that's the main one. So the other cool thing about the Python request library is I can actually pass in my own JSON data. So if I do JSON equals to, again, a dictionary, I'm gonna go ahead and say query and hello world. Okay, so again, if I'm gonna be using JSON with respect to Python, I need to think of a Python dictionary. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this and we'll go ahead and run this again. And now what happens is HTTP Ben actually echoes back what I sent to it. Now it echoes it back in a way that might not be that familiar with you because it's giving you a bunch of other data. Uh, but the general idea here is it is echoing back the data that I sent to it. Before it did not, right? So if I look at it before, it just has empty data here. Now there are other ways to send data. I don't have to send it as JSON, I can send it as raw data. And when I run that now, it's actually in a different location. It's now considered form data, uh, just slightly different, but different enough. And we see the content type being application, HTTP form URL encoded. Again, so changing it back to JSON, this is gonna show me a header that has changed to application JSON. Okay, so there's a lot of details that maybe you don't think that you need yet, and maybe you don't, but the thing here is that we can actually play around with a bunch of different data types to interact with a REST API. We can send form data, we can send JSON data. Uh, typically speaking though, if it's gonna receive JSON data, you're gonna send JSON data. So what you send, you typically receive. That's kind of how it goes. It's not always the case, but it's something that you might consider. So this has been a really long-winded way to write some incredibly basic code and an incredibly basic Python client. Now, what we wanna think of in terms of clients is very similar to like your web browser client. This is a way to interact with the internet. When you create a client, it's gonna be a way for you to use Python to interact with your REST API. So in other words, this Pi client has nothing, literally nothing to do with the Django REST framework and Django or even Python on the backend or whatever is running this endpoint, this client does not care. And that's another key thing about REST APIs is they can, can be consumed across all kinds of different clients. So in, in other words, if we actually look on httpbin.org slash anything and hit enter, I get the exact same data, or roughly speaking, the exact same data that I did with my Python project here. You might see it as something a little bit more like this, but this is the same response. And if we look at the source of it as well, you can see that it's also still the same response. So I actually just showed you two different clients, 
One is a client through Python. The other is a client through Chrome or whatever web internet browser you have. So you can have almost an unlimited amount of clients consuming a REST API as long as they can do these really cool HTTP requests. Okay, so now we wanna build on top of all of this, of course, and we wanna actually control what the client sees. We wanna control this endpoint. We wanna send out the data we wanna send, not the data that uh, somebody else designed, right? What somebody else designed is incredibly helpful for us, but it's not necessarily something that we want to do. Now, before we go, I want to mention one last thing, and that's this endpoint here of status 200. What we can see, though, is there's also this thing called status codes. So get response.status code. We can also see what that is. And if I run this again, I'm getting a, a 404 not found. So instead of actually using this endpoint, we'll just go ahead and comment this out for a moment to just stick with anything for now, just so we can see this status code here. If I run it again, I see this number of 200, which of course, if I comment out some of these print statements, I will still see that number of 200. So this status code is something that you might not be that familiar with, but it's something you definitely use all the time. So in other words, if you actually go to a page that does not exist, this status code is 404. So there are a number of status codes that we'll need to take into account when we start building the backend. And it's just things that you can already start playing about with and also learning about. So check out the GitHub uh, or rather the Wikipedia article on HTTP status codes because it is pretty fascinating to learn more about it. Um, but again, we will go over those things going forward. Okay, cool. Uh, so if you have any questions on this one, let me know. I realize we covered kind of a lot here, but I really wanted to sound, send a foundation for what it is that we're really trying to accomplish, which is first off creating a way to consume an API and then creating a way that we can actually design the API. We can actually just dictate what should be consumed or what can be consumed. So that's what we'll do going forward. So that last one, I unloaded a lot of things on you. So now we're gonna go ahead and chip away at each little piece of that little by little to put it all into perspective. So the first thing that I wanna do is really just change this endpoint in my Python client here, which of course means that I want my Django project to run. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up a, another terminal tab here. You can do it either on the side here or you could just hit plus here and have uh, two different tabs. It's really up to you on how you wanna go about doing that. I'm gonna have it on the side so I can always see that Django is running. I do this when I'm just testing things out locally. You can as well. So what happens here is I'm in two places. One is gonna be in the root of my actual entire project. The next one is gonna be in the root of my Django project. So I'll just CD into the back end here. And I'm gonna run the simple command. Let's go ahead and list those things out again. The simple command of python manage.py run server. I'm gonna also declare the port I wanna use. Now, if you have used Django before, you know this is the default port, but I wanna make it very clear that this is the port I'm using. You can ignore all errors for now, but that's the port that I wanna use. Okay, so what is key about this is this development server running at this URL or this, what is it called? Endpoint. So I can actually copy this right here and I can change this endpoint in my API basic file or my client file. And now I have a new API endpoint, right? Now it's actually based off of Django. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the error first. So I'm gonna stop the Django server and I'm gonna go ahead and run Python pi client slash basic.py, hit enter, and I get this connection refused. All this is saying is that Python requests cannot access this, this URL. It, that's it, it just cannot access it. It just does not exist. And of course, if I did the same thing in the browser, so if you hit command period or control period, you'll see this too, site cannot be reached. The browser does the same thing. Hey, what do you know? Error connection refused. It's the same error. Okay, um, I only wanted to show you that so that I can then run the server and I can go ahead and modify things a little bit inside of this basic code, and that is getting rid of this JSON stuff. I don't have those things available yet. I do have the status code though. So now I should be able to print out the raw text as well as the status code on this endpoint. I'm not even gonna open it on my browser at this point. 
I'll just go ahead and run my basic client again. And now, what do you know? I got HTML coming through. And if I scroll up a bit, it says getting started with Django, tutorial, all sorts of cool stuff that are related to our Django project. And of course, if I go into my web browser now, I see this here, pretty cool. So for a lot of us using this URL, 127.0.0.1 is okay. I'm actually gonna go ahead and go off of a local host. If this works for you, stick with local host. I actually prefer writing local host for a number of reasons, uh, but one of them being that it's a little bit more practical in the long run for all kinds of systems and also even in production. Um, but we'll get there some other time. For now, just go ahead and use your local host or whatever, you know, whatever works, either one. Just make sure that one of them works and you can actually use it. Okay, cool. So the key thing here though is the port. We wanna make sure that we always have that port available. Whatever that port ends up being, we wanna make note of it when we're working locally. Otherwise your endpoint is gonna be incorrect. So in other words, if I change this port to 8002 and try to run it again, I still get that connection failed. Okay, cool. So that's it. That's it for this one. I just wanted to show you how simple it is to do a request through our Python client to our Django project. We're that much closer to already having our first API. Now let's actually create that first API. At this point, hopefully it's not incredibly surprising that when we run our Python client to this endpoint on Django, what we get back is, well, HTML. We get back exactly what this web page is showing us. So what I wanna do now is actually create my first API view to actually give me JSON back. Hey, so we can do this stuff again, okay? So to do this, I'm gonna go ahead and close out the running Django server with Control C, and then I'll list out, make sure I'm in manage.py. I'm gonna run Python manage.py start app, and I'm gonna just call it API. So typically speaking, when you create a new app, you're gonna to wanna to come into settings.py and go into the installed apps here and just add it in as API. Again, I haven't done a whole lot with Django just yet. The only real thing I did was start it and then add this new app called API. So we'll leave it just like that for now. Next up, inside of the API project or the API app itself inside of Django, we're gonna go into views.py. Okay, so in here we're gonna design our very first API view, our API endpoint view. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of everything that's in here and just run from django.http import JSON response. Notice that the SON is lowercase. Hey, what do you know? JSON response, what the heck? I want JSON, JSON response. Hey, it's built into Django, isn't that cool? Now I'm gonna define a function-based view and I'll just call this API home and it'll take in a request. We'll let it pass in args and keyword args even though those are probably not necessary for us at this point. Then I'm gonna go ahead and return a JSON response. And let's spell it correctly. And so notice that I actually did not capitalize it correctly. I spelled it correctly, but just didn't capitalize it correctly. So let's go ahead and do that. And now I'll go ahead and return with a message saying, hi there, this is your Django API response. Okay, cool. So now that we have this view, what I'm also gonna do is inside of this API, I'm gonna go ahead and create urls.py. Now you certainly do not have to go this method. The reason I'm going this method is to just simplify where all of my Django projects API URLs are. Not everyone does this. Some people actually bring it right into the root Django project URLs. I'm just gonna have it separated out because I'm assuming that you're using other parts of your Django application and you're not just building an API with Django, which you totally could. But let's go ahead and create the URLs here. So we'll go in from django.urls. We're gonna import the path function and then we'll do from dot views or rather from dot, we'll import views as a way to make it a little bit easier to grab all of our different views in here. And then I'll do URL patterns equals to a empty list here. And we'll first off declare path and it's just gonna be an empty path and we'll do views.api home. Okay, so of course, that's this view right here. And by all means, if you like doing an explicit import, which I typically do, you would do something like that instead. 
Those are, the, those are roughly the same things, and then you would just use the function itself. So now that we've got that URL, I need to bring this URL into my primary URLs file. This is for all of Django, right? And so what I need to do then is inside of this import, I just need to import include as well, and now create a path for my API. So API slash, uh, this path is gonna be like local host, whatever my port is, in my case it's 8,000. API, that's gonna be this path. And then if I run include and then api.urls, this is gonna be going off of this package right here or this module, this Python module. And then inside of here, we've got .urls and that's what that is referencing. And then it maps to all of the URLs in here, which this means that this is gonna be also localhost 8000 API and that's it, which is great. Okay, so we will definitely play around with these URLs a lot more going forward. I just want to set up something basic. Okay, so let's go ahead and run our project again, our Python manage.py run server. And I'll again declare 8000 just to be explicit about the port that I want. And so now that I've got that port going, I'm going to go back into basic.py and I'm going to go ahead and add in slash API, that new URL path that we created both in terms of the main Django URLs, as well as the API app URLs. These are now corresponding to each other. And so in basic.py with this, I can actually go ahead and run. Let's just run it like this. Actually just pretend like it's JSON right off the bat, run it and what do you know? It prints out not only the raw text from here, it prints out the status code and then it prints out that JSON. And we could go even further and say something like message and then I can go ahead and run that and boom, you now have a Django API endpoint. It's really just that simple. I really like it, but the, the, one of the biggest problems with this at this time is merely the fact that, well, uh, our view is raw data. I want different kind of data here. I do not want this raw data. I want data that comes directly from the database. So let's go ahead and start that now. All right, so now what we're gonna do is have this view actually echo back some of the data that our Pi client is sending, or really any client for that matter. And it's gonna to emulate to some degree what HTTP bend.org slash anything does, where it was echoing things back to us. So the main thing here is I wanna actually be able to see how to grab this data on the Django side itself, as well as another piece of data called params, and I'll explain this in a moment, and We'll pass both of these things in so we can see what's going on with this request directly. Then of course, this response itself, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of any sort of um, dictionary lookup there and just get the entire raw JSON. And I'll also get rid of these other print statements too. Okay, so back into our view, how do I actually get all of these things out? So the first thing is gonna be that JSON data, which is actually from request.body. Now I want you to know that this request that's being passed through that is a HTTP request instance from Django, right? It has nothing to do with Python requests, even though it sort of looks like it. You add an S there, it's a completely different thing. You keep it in with just one single value. Request is an instance of the HTTP request class, which you can see in the documentation. There's a lot of things that you can look at there, um, or you could also print out the dir of request. That would also give you stuff like request.body. So anyways, let's go ahead and say body equals to request.body here. And so what I'm gonna assume is this body is going to be JSON data, but not quite JSON data just yet. It is actually gonna be a byte string of JSON data. We can verify this by printing out that body data, right? So I've got some JSON data in there. Let's go ahead and just run the client. And what we see here is it is a byte string of a JSON string essentially. So a stringified version of a JSON object. Um, that might be a little confusing, but the, just the general idea here is I see that there is a string essentially around a dictionary. This is always a good hint to me when I'm working in Python that what's in here is most likely JSON itself. So to convert it from this string into a actual Python dictionary, we have to import the JSON package. And what we can do here is I'll just call this my data being a empty dictionary. I'll go ahead and do try 
data equals to json dot loads and there's going to be that body data and then i'll just do accept and pass for the moment and then we'll just go ahead and print out what that data is and more specifically i want to actually print out maybe the keys that are in here because it's a dictionary itself so i'll go ahead and do data dot keys right this will signify of course that it is now a python dictionary and what we see here is it's actually doing that for me okay cool so it prints out the keys and now of course i can actually see that data now this means that i can use this data in all sorts of ways which of course we will talk about soon uh, but for now i can actually change my json response to just returning back this you know dictionary itself because this right here takes in a string of json data and turns it into a python dictionary usually right which is kind of cool and the only reason i put it in this try block is because it's certainly possible that your body does not have any JSON data. So like in the case of this, what if I came back here and just closed that off like that and then ran it? Well, I shouldn't have an error on my server. I should just return back with, you know, an empty dictionary of some kind. But I can actually add to this data. OK, so the things that I might add are perhaps I want to add in the headers so I can say data headers equals to, well, request dot headers now in the years past older versions of django you would do request dot meta and then get all of the headers from that argument which is still in the documentation but newer versions of django use request dot headers and it's well a lot nicer we can also do data dot content type which actually should be in the request headers but we can access that directly so we can do request dot content type as well Right. And there's definitely other things that I could continue to add to this. Looks like I have, um, oops, I did context type. That should be content type. Try that again. Um, and so, and we've got HTTP headers is not JSON serialable. Okay, so I'm gonna leave this out for just a moment and we'll explain that in a moment. I'll go ahead and print out what those headers are to see why. So when I run this, I get content type is application JSON as well as the original data that I sent through, at least some of it. Okay, so the reason that the headers were not JSON serialable, which really just means that it can't turn that headers dictionary back into JSON, which is this right here. Um, so there's probably a number of things that I could do to ensure that I can change it back, uh, but I don't really need to echo it perfectly back. I mean, potentially you do, but maybe not. Um, so another thing to think about here is you, if you did json.dumps request.headers, you'd probably see that same error. Right. So let's save that again and run it again. And yes, see, I get that same error. So HTTP headers cannot do that. Um, so perhaps if I change it into a dictionary itself, that might solve the problem. And let's try that again. And sure enough, it does. So let's go ahead and now use this as just simply converting it into a dictionary. And let's run that again. And so now I get that those headers coming back. Cool. Um, so the other part of this is perhaps that last data point that we want to echo, which is the params here. Now these params are query parameters. So whenever you see on a URL, you know, question mark, this arg equals to this value, those are query parameters. This is the key, this is the value. So what I have here is actually ABC one, two, three. Now you can set that directly on an endpoint and it will work inside a Python request, or you can use this param value to send it. So if we save that and run this again, naturally I don't actually have any things coming through, but if I actually come back into my view, I can print out request.get. So what this does is this will get me my URL query parameters uh, always, right? So it doesn't matter where you are, in a Django view, as long as you have access to the request object itself, you can use request.get. Within that same breath, we can also use request.post. We'll talk about that when we get to the post portion, because I'm currently not doing post methods, I'm just doing get methods. But if we run this again, we can see here is that query parameter, right? So that's what's coming back from those params. So what I can do then is say params, or rather data and params, equals to the dictionary of request.get, okay? 
yet again. Let's try it again and see what happens. And we've got our parameters coming back just like that. And of course, if we take those parameters out, let's take a look at what that looks like. I run that and now it's just empty parameters. So this echoing is now a lot closer to what I have with this HTTPBand.org. Now, why is it that I'm talking about all of these things? Well, it highlights a number of items that we wanna know about on any given view in Django, but more specifically for using JSON responses, right? So we had an issue right here where this couldn't automatically be converted into JSON data. So we have to take account for that um, if we're doing it manually like we are. And the way we take it account is just to enforce a dictionary value from these items, right? So whatever it ends up being, it becomes a dictionary value. Now these could still fail potentially, um, so it is something we would want to keep track of because of the data types, right? So JSON and Python, JavaScript and Python, they don't all perfectly interact with each other. JSON does a really good job at it as we've seen, but there are still some downsides uh, to at least this method of echoing and stuff like that um, and, and just returning JSON data. So now the big question is, how do we do something not a whole lot different than this, but instead using you know actual Django models to accomplish the response, no longer echoing back just what the request is. Because realistically, what your request is gonna end up doing is maybe, for example, you would say our post ID, or let's say, let's do something more like our product ID is equal to some sort of product ID that we will actually want to look up in the database. And that's okay in terms of how this is structured. This would actually end up working. You know, perhaps you would have it as a URL parameter or perhaps it would be in the URL itself. Um, there's a, like I said, there's a number of different ways on how we can actually pass that data. But generally speaking, if we send some data in like this on the Django side, we now see roughly speaking how we can grab out that data and attempt to then do a lookup in our database. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. And I, the reason we also want this fundamental understanding is because having this sort of building block will definitely carry over once we start using the Django REST framework. Now we're gonna go ahead and create a Django model and respond on our API home view with an instance of that model. So let's go ahead and close out our Django server here and just run Python manage.py start app and we'll call it products. Okay, so inside of CFE home, we'll go into settings and we'll add products in there. And then inside of products, we'll go ahead and add in a model. This model is gonna be really simple. It's just simply gonna be class product models.model and it's gonna have three fields. That's gonna be title, content and price. And of course, if you're familiar with Django models, title is often a character field or a char field with a max length of some kind. I'm gonna do 120. And then my content is often a text field. In this case, I'll just allow it to be blank and null. And then finally, my price is going to be a decimal field and we'll give a max digits of 15. And then a decimal places of two and then default being 99.99. Okay, very simple model, very simple application. So now what we're gonna do finally is run our migrations for an entire project. So we'll go ahead and do Python manage.py make migrations and then Python manage.py migrate. If you're not aware, make migrations, that command just basically tells Django, hey, we need to let the database know about everything that's happening in models.py and then migrate, just make sure that the database does actually change based off of what's happening in models.py among other things. Okay, so now we've got those migrations done. We can actually jump into the Python shell, the Django shell. So Python manage.py shell, and then we'll go ahead and do from products.models, we're gonna import that product, and then we'll go ahead and do product.objects.create and title being hello world, content being this is amazing, exclamation mark, and then price, we'll go ahead and do 0, 0.00, and there we go. So I can do the same thing over again with maybe a different product title or something like that, and say hello world again, there we go. So now I have two products. 
So one of the ways that we can get a random product is by doing product.objects.all, then order by with a question mark in here, and then just saying first. So every time it's gonna, roughly speaking, give me a different model, which we see by the numbers changing. So those of course are the instance ID or the actual model object ID. Um, so the thing about this is if you're really confused as to what's going on here, check out my try Django 3.2 series because that will cover a lot more of the basics behind Django and really give you a, a really solid understanding of this. Uh, but just generally speaking, it's pretty simple, right? So we've got a product model and then title, content, and price. Those are fields. So if you think of it in terms of like a spreadsheet, of course, a database, it's just fields in that. And then each row is a new instance of that field. Um, or that whole entire thing. Okay, so with this in mind, uh, let's go ahead and jump into the API and actually respond back with some of this data. Okay, so what I wanna do is I wanna actually get rid of everything that's in here currently. And I wanna just highlight what it is that I'm trying to do here. All I'm trying to do is I wanna get my model data and there's gonna just be random data to start. So it's gonna be product.objects.all, again, that order by, and question mark, and then first. All this does is makes a random query set and then just grabs one of those values and this will give me my model instance. So of course I need to import this product. So we'll go ahead and do from the products.models import product. Now we've got that class imported so I can actually do this lookup. So once I have this data, I'm gonna just go ahead and declare data is an empty string, right? That's it. Then I also wanna say if model data, because it's certainly possible that if you don't have any products, you won't have model data. So if the model data is there, I'll go ahead and say data and title is equal to the model data dot title. And we can think about this for each part, right? So model data dot content and then data and price. And hopefully already you're like, wow, this is tedious, okay? So that's kind of the point is I want it to look tedious because it is tedious to do it this way. But now that we've got this, if of course we go back into our um, Python client, the JSON data is still coming through. We will definitely address that, but at least it's gonna print out that response. So let's save everything and let's go ahead and run that client now, right? So I'm gonna hit enter. I got connection refused. Oh, of course, I need to run my server. Let's go ahead and exit out of the Python shell. And then let's go ahead and run our server with our porch declared so we remember what it is. Up oh, and that's odd. Oh, I didn't spell manage correctly. Hey, that's fun. Okay, so manage.py run server 8000. And there we go. Okay, so now we've got that running. Let's try that client again. It's giving us a error and another little query error. They should say objects not attribute object. Okay, so let's try it again. Third time's a charm, so it is. And there we go. So now we actually will get sort of random data that's coming through here. It doesn't seem that random, but it is. And of course, if I wanted to add in the ID of these things, which is of course in a model by default, unless you change it, right? So model.id, that field of ID, comes in by default from models.model. So we save that and I run it again. Now I can actually see the ID for these objects. And hopefully what's starting to sh take shape in your mind, at least a little bit, is how we will eventually be able to change this to being an actual ID, to actually do a lookup to our end part, right? To actually our API endpoint. And so, this is actually not great right here. This is something I wanna change. Now, what's happening here is sort of the process of called serialization, where we wanna take a representation. In this case, it's gonna be a instance. So we've got an instance, so let's say a model instance, aka this. We wanna turn it into a Python dictionary, and then we want to basically return JSON to my client, right? That's essentially what I'm trying to do here. So what's happening here is incredibly common to basically take a model instance and turn it into a Python dictionary. So that's actually something that we wanna do for sure. 
but I'm also gonna make this a little bit more manual than it's been. I'm actually gonna go back a step on the JSON response to try a different kind of response as we'll see. So let's go ahead and take a look at that now. Now we're gonna convert a Django model instance to a dictionary with a really simple built-in method. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go from Django.forms.models, we're gonna import the method called model underscore two underscore dict. So this is most likely used in Django forms, a topic that is really interesting, just not something I'm gonna really be covering in this one because we're gonna be using the Django REST framework for the vast majority of things. But this model to dict is really cool because now what I can do is just say data equals to model to dict of that data. And we can save that and then I can go ahead and run this. And what do you know, that same exact stuff is coming back. The other part that's really cool about this is then I can declare the fields that I wanna add in. Let's say for instance, ID and just title. I don't want anything else, right? I can save that and then run that. And what do I get? ID and title. This is great. And also if I do ID and price, so let's do ID title and price, no content, right? Um, I can now specify the exact fields that I want this API to respond with. Now, of course, this is working towards the basic product like this right here. Maybe we will be a little bit more specific as to how that comes through. Um, but the other thing that it's also showing me is that this right here is a really clean and easy way to just narrow down data from a model instance. But what I wanna show you is if you weren't using JSON response, if you're just like, oh, I wanna do this the absolute hard way and see what that looks like by using something called HTTP response. Now, the difference between these two is JSON response accepts a dictionary as an argument. HTTP response accepts, well, it's supposed to be a string. So let's leave it just in as that, and I'll run the client. Naturally, I get a JSON error. So if I go back into my basic.py, I'm trying to print out JSON here. So Python request is like, hey, this is JSON data, convert it into JSON data and use it. In my case, it's not JSON data. It's, well, we can look. So I'm gonna go ahead and print out the git response headers as well. And we'll just take a look at what's actually coming back. So the headers are coming through here. And what we've got is content type text slash HTML. So going back into our view, the HTTP response by default, the content type is going to be text slash HTML. That's what it does by default. So to change it to JSON response, we can change the content type. So let's go into our headers and say content and dash type being application and JSON. We can save that, run this again. And it's now saying it's application JSON Let's see if we can actually uh, render out that JSON now. So we've got the correct headers in here. So I'm gonna go ahead and uncomment these print statements. And now I'm gonna go ahead and try and render out the JSON data that quote unquote is coming through. Still get an error. I got this ID title price thing. Well, this of course is because what I'm actually sending back is a dictionary. It's this dictionary right here. Trust me, I'm working out to something, you'll see. So what I need to do from this dictionary is I need to turn it into a JSON string. So the JSON data string would be json.dumps of data, and then we would return that data string, that JSON data string. I run this, now I get object of type decimal is not JSON serialable. Now this has to do with this price here. This price field is a decimal field, and if we print out this data and run it again, and then I'll scroll up before the error. What we see is a actual decimal place right here. That's not great. So it's actually not converting it completely in here. And so herein lies one of the issues with trying to do all of this stuff manually yourself, like trying to really peel back the onion to figure out how everything works inside of Django. Trust me, I love doing that. Um, but I also wanna highlight that this is where Django REST framework really can come in and just clean things up for us in a number of ways, as we'll see. So this JSON response doesn't need me to dump the data into JSON anymore. It'll convert it for me. Now, sure, I could convert it most likely by doing dict equals, you know, data equals a dict. This should actually maybe solve that problem for me, uh, but even that didn't actually work. So I'd actually have to change the price itself or update how it's being serialized through JSON. Again, not something I wanna do right now. By all means, go ahead and do it. 
the main thing about this was this model to dict here. So, cause I'm not actually gonna do any of that, right? I'm just gonna return back um, the JSON response of that data. Okay, so we save that and now it's actually working as intended because it does all of the heavy lifting for us with just a simple JSON response here. So the other part of this too is to realize that um, Django itself is written of a bunch of different Python code. And if you know how to use it correctly, you can really you know, augment how quick you can spin things up. And to me, that's where the Django REST framework also shines. It, it just really makes things a lot faster. Now, all of the things that we've been doing so far have to do with getting data, like actually just looking up, but it has nothing to do with sending in data. That opens a whole nother can of worms that we might discover a little bit more of with a pure Django product here. Um, but what I actually wanna do is start thinking in terms of this stuff and converting it into the Django REST framework. So that's what we'll do, start doing in the next part. Now we're gonna go ahead and convert our API home view into a Django REST framework view. It's actually pretty easy to change, but it does take two new items here. The first one, we're gonna go ahead and import from rest underscore framework dot response. We're gonna import the response class here. This response class will take over the JSON response class. I'll get rid of these comments here. The other part of this is I need to bring in the decorator. So, well, we have a few options. Let's go ahead and take a look. We'll do from rest framework dot decorators. We're gonna import the API view decorator, and then we'll just wrap this on our API home view function. So this is now a Django rest framework API view, right? So this is a DRF API view. All of a sudden because of this, mostly because of this, and in part because of this. Okay, so let's go ahead and save it. Let's run our client again. And now we're getting a API views missing a list of allowed HTTP methods. Okay, so the cool thing about this is we now have to declare what methods we want to allow by default from any given API request. So let's say for instance, we just want to get, once I do that, it now will require only get. What if I did a post method, only post methods here? then I run this again, now I get method git is not allowed. So it's already doing some basic permissions on here. Now, of course, if I were to do this a little bit differently, if I wanted to do it sort of the hard way without the REST framework, so if I was doing back to Django stuff, I absolutely can say if request.method, you know, is not equal to git, or let's say post in this case, just because it's simpler, based on our current client. I can then return a response, so we can stick with the same response here. And I can say detail and get not allowed. And then I do a status of something like 400. So changing the status code uh, to 400, which I believe is what, oh, we said 405 here. So we'll change this to 405 instead of 400, um, just based off of what I saw right here. So that's the status code right there. Okay, cool. Uh, so let's go ahead and run that again. And now it's essentially the same thing, uh, but I had to write out a bunch of stuff to get there, including the status code, right? And I don't have to want to have to remember all the status codes all the time. So wouldn't it be better if Django REST Framework just did it for me? And that's exactly what's happening here. Now, something that's also baked into this that I haven't done yet, which we will get into, is authentication related items. Doing a pure Django view with an API, much like what we have here, and authentication is, well, not a easy task to just spin up and do. It's it's non-trivial. Um, so that's another really cool thing about the REST framework as we'll see. But now we have the same view, roughly speaking, and we have a way to just, you know, use the REST framework. But I do want to take this another step further, and that is instead of using model to dict, I actually want to use a built-in serializer or a custom serializer within the REST framework itself. So let's take a look at that. 
In a moment, I'm gonna introduce model serializers with the REST framework, but I wanna set the stage for it. First off, if I created a property on this product, something like sale price, and I want it based off of anything, right? You could even call it a discount, whatever. Let's say for instance, it's gonna be based off of the price itself. I'm gonna go ahead and do a float substitution here with percent dot two F. So I have two decimal places and then percent. And this is gonna be float of object at price times 0 0.8, okay? And oh, not object dot price, but rather self dot price, okay? So now I've got this sale price property here. Now, if I jump into the Python shell, we should be able to get that no problem, right? So from products.models import product and product.objects.first and then sale price. I hit enter and let's actually do dot last. And now I got 960, okay? And of course the actual price I think is $12. And so 80% of $12, which should be about 960, um, roughly speaking, especially how flow calculations are. Nevertheless, we have this property now. So what if I wanted to go back into my view into this model dick thing here, and I wanted to add that in. I wanna say price or rather sale price, save it, exit out of the shell, run the server again, and then run Python and pi client basic.py. Hey, where's the sale price? Now, naturally I could add a key to this from the model data and do all sorts of stuff to make it work, but it's not showing up by default. That is one of many features as to why I wanna use REST Frameworks serializers. So if we go into products here and create a new file called serializers, .py. I like doing it plural, similar to like if I was creating a model form, I would call that forms.py. And actually let's look at a model form for those of you who may or may not be familiar. But Django has a entire topic that we can spend a lot of time on called model forms. So it's very similar to this. We do class forms and then we would import the model. So from the models, import the product, and then we'd say class product form and it's forms.model form and then we do class meta and the model is related to the product. The fields that we want to include here are the fields we want to include. Let's say title, content, and price. So that's a model form, right? Now I go into depth on model forms in many other places, but we're not doing that here. I just wanted to show you this because of how similar serializers are or model serializers are to model forms. So now in serializers.py, instead of importing forms, we'll go from REST framework, we're gonna import serializers. And of course, instead of forms.modelForm, it's serializers.serializer, model serializer. And then typically speaking, you would call it your product serializer, okay? Roughly the exact same as model forms. And there are a lot of overlapping features that they have that will uncover as we keep going. But now inside of my fields here, what I can do is write out sale price. This of course is a reference to this property of this model. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So it could be an instance method. It could be a property. When I say an instance method, I could say something like get discount and this could do some crazy calculation. In this case, I'll just return back, um, I don't know, 122, it means nothing in this context. But um, if I put that in here too, that in theory will be interesting to see what happens. Nevertheless, I now have this product serializer. So what I'm gonna do is into my API, into views here, I'm gonna import it. So from products.serializers, we're gonna import our product serializer. Model data, I'm now gonna actually call instance and I'll break down the explorer as I work on this. This is definitely how you're gonna to wanna to call it going forward. Just leave it in as, as instance. I'll comment out the model to dict stuff for a moment and just go off of this product serializer. So we'll go data equals to product serializer of that instance. And then we just have to call the method of data after that. So this makes it a class of that instance. 
and then data is the actual data that's coming through from that instance. We'll see that a lot more <laughs> in the future too. So now if I run this basic here, look at that. I've got my title, I've got my content, sale price, price, get discount, great. So one of the things that you might be thinking about is I don't want it to say get discount on my serializer. I want it to say discount or whatever, right? So if I save it as discount and run this again, of course I get an error because there's nothing called discount, right? So if we look at our model, there's get discount, but there's no other field called discount, okay? So how could I actually implement this? This is what's cool about model serializers or serializers in general on REST framework because I can enrich them with other values. So what I can say here is say discount equals to, so this is now that field name that was missing. It's gonna be equal to serializers.serializer method field. And we can pass in something called read only being true. So we save that and now I run this and still getting the error, okay? So it's not finding the get discount error, right? So it's saying has no attribute get discount. So it's actually looking for another method called dis get discount. To make things less confusing, I'm gonna go ahead and go back into my serializer and say, we'll just call this my discount. So we can see what this error is now. Okay, so we save that. So we run it again. Now it's saying that it has no attribute get my discount. So what we need to do is we need to find get my discount of self and object. And what this can return is object.get discount. Cool. Super long winded way to get there. But the nice thing is, check it out now. My discount is the name of it. It is no longer uh, get discount. Now, there are other methods on, on accomplishing this same thing, but what I wanted to show you was just a way to peer in to one of the many reasons why you would even use the Django REST framework and a model serializer might be the reason. I mean, there are other things that are really good about the Django REST framework, but look at how simple it made my JSON data that my client can now grab. Right. So the other part of this that I wanted to highlight is the fact that I can get the actual instance. So this OBJ here is the instance that's being called. Right. So whatever that instance is, whether it's we can actually print out OBJ.ID to even see that instance. Right. So if I run this again, I see the ID of one. If I run it again and again, those IDs will rotate based off of that query set that I had before. So the cool thing about this, too, is if I had OBJ dot user, I could grab the user dot username and so on. If I had a foreign key relationship like obj dot category, I could grab that stuff as well, right? Now, of course, I don't have those things just yet and that will be stuff that we'll look at. Uh, but the main thing here is the model serializer does a couple things really well. To reiterate, number one, it will just do the model to dick stuff for us roughly the same way. It serializes that data in a really nice and clean way. And then number two, we can start to enrich the actual serializer, the data that's coming through in a very clean way as well. Now, obviously, or maybe not so obviously, I can augment these values with actual inline fields as well. We'll take a look at that as we go forward too. But just a general idea here is the serializer itself has a lot of implications for how we can really change the representation of our data in any given view, and we can do it with a number of serializers, right? So for instance, if we wanted to have this as our primary product serializer, we could do that. We could say primary, and then our secondary one. Now in this case, they're exactly the same, and I'm not actually gonna save this, but you can totally have multiple serializers for the exact same model is really the point there uh, in cases that you might need that. Now, this is where you're gonna experiment and your own projects are gonna start to make it clear on what you'll need from these various serializers. And you know, realistically in this series, we're gonna only scratch the surface of all that is possible with all of the variations that you can do with serializers. Uh, but hopefully what this does is highlight and maybe make you a little bit excited about using these serializers. One thing that is so cool that we haven't done yet though, is serializers very similar to forms can actually ingest data, can take data in 
and clean it, it can ensure that this data is correct and right. Um, and so that's a, definitely another thing that we'll need to do. In other words, we're gonna need to start using the post method here. We need to send data to our backend, not just get data from our backend. So naturally that's something we will work on uh, as we go forward. If you were to go in your browser to this API endpoint, you're gonna see template does not exist. And that might be a little strange. And the only reason for this is because we didn't actually follow the installation steps for the Django REST framework. We just installed this way long ago and didn't actually add it into the installed apps like you should have. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that now, jump into settings, and then just add in the REST framework here and save it. And then if you go back into the API itself, you'll see a much more browsable API. It's a little bit better formatted and there's a lot of cool things that we'll end up seeing with this. And we can also test our APIs in there as well. So speaking of testing our APIs, let's go ahead and take a look at our views here. What I wanna do now is actually change this to being a post request, a post request only. And what that means then is I'm actually gonna be getting request data. So you might be tempted to say request.post here, and sometimes this is okay, but usually it's gonna be request.data. And that's especially because of how our API endpoint or our actual API client ends up working is we're gonna send in JSON data, and we wanna change this to simply post. Now, this is just a HTTP method change, that's it. Technically speaking, there's really nothing else going on that's that much different than just the method itself that's happening. And the post method is typically locked down and there to ingest data. And we wanna do this in as secure of a way as possible. So the REST framework does help this a lot. If we were using a pure Django view and we used something more like the JSON response, let's actually take a look at what happens here. If I do a JSON response with this, we will take a look. Um, so before I go any further, now I've got this data here. I will just echo that data back, essentially. So let's go ahead and run our basic client here with that post request going. So Python and Py client, basic.py. We hit enter. I get this forbidden CSRF cookie not set. Now that's because API views for the REST framework don't necessarily need that cookie set. Inside of Django, that cookie absolutely has to be set. It's one of those security features that Django has built in, which is a good and bad thing. In this case, we're gonna consider it a bad thing because we're not needing to use that. We wanna just use the API view itself. And again, we'll go ahead and declare that post request in there. And so now if I run this again, now it actually echoes back what I have in my post request. So what I wanna do here is actually just change this to being title and we'll call this hello world. So what I'm doing here now is I'm gonna send this data end. It's just simply hello world. Right now it's just pinging right back to it, right? So it's getting that data and then sending it right back. Of course, now I wanna actually send it through my product serializer. I want to validate this data. That's actually one of the other pieces that the serializer does really well. So we can go ahead and say serializer equals to this. And now we're gonna go ahead and pass in data equals to data, as in the request data to make things even more simple. We could look at it like that. Um, and again, it's not request.post and it's also not omitting data equals, which would actually, we could take a look at what that ends up happening if we do that. Then what we can do is say, if serializer is valid, then we can just go ahead and print out the serializer.data and I'll just go ahead and set the data equal to the serializer.data. So all this does is it makes sure that the data that's being ingested, the data that's being sent to this API endpoint, it's just checking that it matches how this data is formatted, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and do one real quick thing here and say try and accept return none for my discount for a moment. We'll implement a little bit better of a method shortly, but for now, I'll go ahead and add this in and we'll go ahead and run this. Now it's pinging back. Well, it has my hello world, but it also has this other data in here as well. That data, of course, is coming directly from these fields right here. Now, some of the fields are missing because there is no data, uh, but also because, well, 
we aren't actually doing anything with this serialized data. In other words, I can save this data. So if I go to serializer.save, this is actually going to be um, our instance itself. This is going to be where we can actually run this data itself. So I'll go ahead and say that. We'll print out the save data and take a look at what that does. And then we'll go ahead and run this. And now I get this object of type product is not JSON serialable, right? So in other words, now I need to bring back that serializer.data instead of the actual data itself. This is actually the instance itself. So you could do stuff with that instance from the serializer too. This is very similar to if you know Django forms really well, uh, forms.save or whatever the form is, is very similar to that. The only difference here is the serializer, you cannot do uh, commit equals to false. Uh, it's not necessary. You only call save when you actually wanted to save that data and that's it. Okay, so if I run this again, now it actually saves this data for me based off of all of the other parameters of the model itself. And then it returns the enriched data. It has all of that other data for us, which is fantastic. Let's leave the save off for a moment and really just have that serializer data printed again. Okay, and then back into my client here, I have that title still. I'm gonna go back into my models as well, or rather the serializer as well, and I'll return this item here so we can address what happened here. So if I save this and run it now, it's gonna give me this error and it's saying collections ordered dict does not have the attribute get discount. Okay, so what's happening here is we don't actually have an instance anywhere. So inside of our view, this actually created an instance. This is not a created instance. There is no instance data that has been enriched in all this. In other words, nothing was ever saved in the database, which means that we have no real way to access this instance method because there is no instance. This is the only way to create an instance from the product serializer. Now, if you aren't familiar with how these instances work and stuff like that, you'll be like, nah, I don't get it. Maybe, maybe not. But the idea here is when we use a serializer method field on a model serializer, it's assumed that there's an instance attached to it because there's a model attached to it. But as we saw, you don't necessarily have to have that. So what I can do to hedge this is really just say, if not has attribute or has a TTR, this object or whatever's being passed in here of ID, then we go ahead and return none. Now, when it comes to an actual instance of a class, we could also do if not is instance of, well, the OBJ and the product class itself, we could also return none for that. Both of these things serve a lot of the very similar purpose as far as checking this object data, this data that's coming through, so we don't see that error that we saw, where it's like, has no attribute get discount. Now, the only way you would know about this is by going line by line and commenting things out and all that. I intentionally wanted this thing to break so we could see something like this, like when things go wrong, how do you bring it back? Anyway, so now that when I run it, it still is validating this data, but what it's not doing is it's not adding additional data that wouldn't have already been part of this serializer, right? It's not adding the price that's from the database. That's not touching the database. There's nothing instance related. It is adding the content, uh, which is curious. I think the only reason for that is because it can be blank and true. That is something you'll have to test out. My discount makes probably the most sense is because it's actually trying to go off of a product instance and looking for that attribute. But in this case, it's not based off of the model instance at all. It's only based off of the serializer and the serializer method field. Okay, so that is ingesting data. And there's, <laughs> there's a lot of things built into this and baked into this that you know might not seem that important at first. But the keys are here. One, we have a serializer. It could be fairly broad or kind of small. It could only just have fields and stuff like that. What that will do is verify the data that's coming through does match the requirements of the serializer first, second, the requirements of the model. In this case, the requirements of the model are title. 
That's it. The title is the only thing that's required. So going back into basic, if I change this to just content here or whatever, any, any field name really, and I try to run this again, now I get another error, right? So I can't actually return that error. Um, so going back into my view here, I'm actually, this is no longer valid. So one thing I could do is return a different response, like something like a message saying invalid data, not good data, and then a status of like 400. Or in this is valid method, I can actually raise an exception in here that will also catch what that data is. So before we do that raise exception, I'm gonna take that off and save it. Run this again, now it says invalid, not good data, right? It doesn't give me a lot to go off of there. So if I do raise exception, what I'll end up seeing is a more robust error message for this request. So this is now going, hey, uh, your data that's coming through here does not have the field title. So if I put the field title in here and just say, you know, none, it's save it and hey, now it's giving me a little bit better of an error that it can't be null, right? So now I can of course say ABC one, two, three and save it and so forth, right? Next, if we did something like price and we did ABC one, two, three, four and tried to save this one, it's now gonna say invalid number. So this is the validation part of things that not only actually validates it on the backend, actually in the view itself, but then if we wanted to let them know or let the clients know that you're messing up, we can raise this exception. If we don't want them to know, we can just say, hey, this isn't good data. Pretty simple, I think, overall, although there are a number of layers that like might take some time to get your head around. That is gonna come with testing these things out over and over again. Now, serializers and views are critical to the Django REST framework. Absolutely critical. They're like the main thing. There are other pieces to it, but these things in combination together are what we'll experiment more, a lot more going forward to really, really understand how the Django REST framework ends up working. So even if this was like a little uncomfortable or just not fully sinking in yet, hopefully after we do a few more things with views and serializers, this part will make a ton of sense. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and actually jump into generic API views. So initially I'm gonna introduce a lot of these generic API views and then we'll peel back the onion a bit to better understand how they actually work after you get them actually running. So let's go ahead and jump into our products, into views here. And I'm actually gonna get rid of all of the Django based stuff and really just use the REST framework. So the first thing we'll do is import from the REST framework. We're gonna go ahead and import our generics here. And then we'll also import from dot models. We're gonna use our product model. And then from dot serializers, we're gonna import our product serializer, okay? So I'm gonna create a class, a function or class-based view rather, and we're gonna call this our product detail API view, okay? So I'm using the retrieve API view inside of the Django REST framework. So this is gonna be inside of generics dot retrieve API view, okay? So the things that make this up are plentiful, but we're gonna go off of just the fundamentals for now. The first thing is simply our query set. So we can do product.objects.all. Now, of course, if you are a little bit more advanced in Django, you know that you can actually write custom query sets. So if you wanted to change that query set, you can just do something like get query set. We'll go into that a bit more later, but for now, we'll just leave it as query set. Next, we want to actually serialize this data. Even if it's one item or many items, we just pass in something called a serializer class and then our product serializer. Now there's something else that's really important to know about when it comes to a detail view of some kind. A detail view will get one single item. So what also comes in here that I'll just comment out for now is the option to set which field we want to do and perform a lookup on this query set. So think of it like product.objects.get. What is that lookup field that you have here? In my case, it's PK. And then what's the number? Or what is it that you're looking it up by? Now, of course, if you do something like ABC, that's an invalid lookup and we'll take a look at that as well. But anyways, that is all we need to do for this view. It's pretty simple. 
uh, and we'll see the result in just a moment. But the idea here is just how powerful generic views can be and how powerful class-based views can be if you fully understand what's going on. I hope at this point you also already have an inkling as to what's going on based on what we did with this API view home, right? What we practice with on there. So now that we've got this, let's actually create a URL to handle it. So inside of products, I'm going to make a URLs.py in here. This, of course, is just to keep all of my product URLs in one place. That's it. So this entire app, I want all of the URLs related to this app in one place, and this is where I'm putting it. So we'll go ahead and do from Django.urls. We're going to go ahead and import our path here, and I'll do from dot import of views, and we'll go ahead and add in URL patterns. And this, of course, is an empty list here that we will put our paths in. So the very first path I'll do is related to this particular view. And so I'll leave the path itself out for a moment and we'll do views dot, and this is gonna be our product API view as view. I'll also come back to this in a moment. Okay, so what is the path that we want to declare here? Well, if we think about our lookup field, we want the specific lookup field. What data type is the primary key by default? Now, if you don't know what it is, then yeah, go check it out because each model itself does have a primary key in here by default. Now that primary key is an integer. So we can actually feel good about our URL path being what data type it is, so int first, and then the actual field name next, or really the keyword argument we wanna use. But in our case, since we're using the generic API view here, we basically wanna put whatever our lookup field is as the keyword argument in our URL parameter. Cool. Now, of course, if you're newer to Django and the Django REST framework, you might be like, everything I just told you might be going over your head. And if that's the case, if you're like, I don't understand anything that you just said about URLs, keyword arguments, and all that, check out my Try Django series, pretty much any of them, because I do talk about it. But certainly Try Django uh, 3.2 and up will go into this specifically for these kinds of paths here. Now, let's talk about this right here. This is different than what we had in our API, where it's just simply the function name itself. So every once in a while, you'll see class-based views written like this. And every once in a while, you'll see them written a little bit more like this. So inside of the view file itself, you might see something like product detail view, and it equaling to whatever that value is. And then you bring this in here instead. It's kind of up to you on how you want to design that pattern. Personally, I think this is extra code, but it is a little bit cleaner and it maybe looks a little bit like a function-based view. I personally don't do this ever. I just do as view. But it is nice to keep it in here to know that it is a possibility if you are interested. Okay, so now we've got a view function. We have our URLs. Of course, we already had our serializer and our models. It's time to actually bring in the URLs to our Django main configuration URLs, which in this case I'm putting into URLs.py. I'm going to copy this path because it's roughly the same as this path, except we'll just put products here with the trailing slash. And of course, it's going to be products.urls. Now, it's important to note that the API URLs, I actually could have, roughly speaking, the same path. In fact, I could actually go in there. I'll just put a little comment for it because I'm not actually going to do this, but Let's go ahead and put a little comment as to what it could look like. It'd be something like that. And then including the include import up there. Uh, but you could do something like that where all of your API URLs are in one place. This is something I end up doing if I have my Django project doing a lot of other standard Django views in conjunction with a lot of the Django REST framework views, right? So if I have a lot of API stuff and a lot of Django views, then I put them all pretty much in one place for the API and then another place for the Django project itself. That's what's the beauty of this include stuff. It's, it's really, really powerful on how that all works. Okay, so with that all the way, we now actually need to actually test this endpoint here. And so what I'm gonna do is inside of my Pi client, I'm gonna go ahead and create detail.py. And it's roughly the same as what we had before, right? So we've got our endpoint here. We've got our, our actual request itself and the response itself. So I'll go ahead and copy this and I'm gonna delete a bunch of stuff 
just to make it clean and really uh, concise as to what it's trying to do here. Okay, so the first thing is it's not a post request, it's a get request. We are looking up data now. The data we're looking up is related to products and then some primary key. In my case, I should only have one product. Okay, so this is gonna be my endpoint here and that should correspond to this URL except I don't actually have a trailing slash. So in this case, we want to be explicit about trailing slashes. In this case, I added one. If you don't have one, then your lookups might not work correctly. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's go ahead and go into the root of our entire project and run that detail.py. So Python, py client slash detail.py. What do you expect to see? I hit enter, what do you know? It actually gives me the detail of that data. Now, of course, another thing I could do about this is I could actually look at the Django REST framework browsable API that's activated by default, and I can see this same stuff. And if I go into a product that maybe does not exist, like 2000, it just gives me a 404 not found, which is fantastic. This is built into those generic views. It's built into the Django REST framework. I didn't have to touch any of that logic whatsoever. So of course, this is only the first of several of the gen generics we wanna look at, the actual generic views we wanna look at before we start unpacking it, before we really nail down all of the nitty gritty of this. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the Django REST framework create view. And so to do this, I'm gonna go ahead and say class, the product create API view. And of course it's generics dot create API view now. And the things that we need to include are the query set, so product.objects.all, and then also the serializer class and our product serializer. Hey, these look awfully similar. In fact, they're the same thing, which is pretty cool. Now I'm gonna go ahead and do product create view, and of course we will also have it in as view. I will stick to this naming convention, although like I said before, I would always pretty much put that in to my URLs. Okay, so with this in mind, let's go ahead and bring this in. We'll go ahead and declare a new path here. Now you might be tempted to add a slash there. I'll tell you why you shouldn't do that. And we'll go ahead and use our product create view, of course. Now the slash here is basically doing this. We've got slash API slash products. This is where these URLs are mapped to from URLs here, right? So API slash products. Notice there's a trailing slash there. And so if we go into our URLs here, we've got this path. This will give us two slashes, so we can leave it empty. I think Django will also warn you about that, but I just wanted to make sure that you knew about it for sure. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's go into our Pi client here. I'm gonna create a new one, and this is just simply gonna be called create. So inside of my detail view, um, or the detail.py client rather, I'm gonna go ahead and use the same thing, roughly speaking, but this time I'll go ahead and just do our new create endpoint. Now it should be mentioned that, you know, you might be like, well, why don't I have it at slash create, right? And this has to do with what we'll do in the next portion. Okay, so for now, we'll leave it as this. So it's just there. And I'm gonna use this post method again, as we've seen, and we'll just save it just like that. That is, I don't have any other data that I'm passing. So I just wanna run Python py client slash create dot py, hit enter gives me title, this field is required. Great, the basic validation is still working. So now I'll go ahead and put my data in here and we'll go ahead and add that title in and say this field is done or whatever you wanna call it. And we'll go ahead and run that create and I'm still getting that title. Oh yeah, I still need to pass it here. So let's go ahead and do JSON equals to that data and we'll go ahead and run it again. And now I'm actually getting it with that title. And of course I can continue to make this, right? I could do this over and over and over again. And it's actually creating new instances, which is actually kind of hard to tell based off of what's coming through here, but it is definitely there. And if I put in like, let's say for instance, price, and we do 32.99 or something along those lines and run that again, it actually does the correct price. So that would be a way to test it. Now, one of the things we definitely wanna to work towards is with this create view, Perhaps if I'm an admin user, maybe I wanna show a different serializer class. That is something we will work towards. That's a little bit more advanced than where we're at right now. But one of the things that you 
definitely might want to do is in this create method, like when it's being created, perhaps I want to assign something to that data. So let's go ahead and try that out. So perform create is a method that you can do on a create API view here. Now you could write this method on any other actual view. It just won't be called unless it's a create view. So on perform create, it takes in two things. That is the instance itself and then the serializer. And then in here I can do serializer.save. And if I had my user instance, which I do not at this point, I can actually assign the user just like that. So we'll probably come back to that. And I can also print out what's in the serializer itself. And then we just want to call the serializer and dot save. And maybe we should spell it correctly. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and save that and let's see what that print statement is. So now it should actually print out what the serializer is. So let's go ahead and run it. And now we get that serializer data, right? So we've got a number of things that are coming in here that are related to the serializer. What if I do serializer.cleaned or rather validated data? Let's try that one and run it again. Now I can actually see the data that it's coming through or that's actually in there. So what I can do is say title equals to serializer.validatedData.get title. And I could do that same thing for the next part, which was, what do we have? Content, okay, so content, okay, or none. If content is none, then we'll go ahead and say content equals to the title. And that way we can actually see this in action. So content equals to content. And let's try that again with a slight change. Now I get the content that's coming through based off of that title. Uh, just a really simple way to add additional context to this serializer in this create method. Now, what do I tend to use it most for? And that's this right here. Or you can also send a signal here if you're familiar with Django send signals. You could send a Django signal here if it's not necessarily related directly to the model itself because there's a whole discussion we can have on Django signals. But anyway, so that's the baseline of the product create API view. Really, really nice. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at the product list view. Now we're going to go ahead and do our list API view. It's really simple based on everything we've done so far. So we'll go ahead and do product list API view. <laughs> Shocking, right? It's exactly that. Okay. So that is the basic of the product list API view. And by all means, wrap that into the URLs you want to use. Now I'm actually not going to use this method. Why? That's because of our product create view. I can actually do a product list create view and really just changed my API method to adjust for that. And again, it's still basically the same, except it's just slightly different. And that is actually why on my route here, I have it like that. So then what I could do is I actually don't need to change create.py at all. But what I can do in my Py client is list.py and using the same endpoint, I can list everything out, but just change the requested method. How cool is that? So now we have a way to list these things out as well as how to create them. So python slash Py client and list.py, hit enter, and there we go. So now I'm actually listing out everything in my database. And of course, one of the nice things about having the REST framework, by default, we can actually look at the browsable uh, API here, and this is giving us all of the listed view. And hey, what do you know? I can even try out submitting this data in as well, uh, which is pretty nice, right? So I really, really like the fact that I can just do those things really fast and really, really succinctly. Now, the thing is, what's the next part of this, like how can I combine other kinds of views? Now there are other kinds of views that I actually left out and that is updating something or destroying or deleting something. And so that's what we'll do in the next one is actually look at the view that does both of those things. So combining views like this is really, really common. 
unless of course you need to have different endpoints. Now, the other thing is, as I mentioned before, you can have different kinds of values for different users, including what they can and can't do, like permissions that any particular user has. That stuff will come after we do some more authentication and understand how the views work a little bit more, because we'll take a look at that too. Each one of these functions has a very specific purpose to it that is often based off of the actual HTTP request itself. The list create view is a good example of this. If it's a post method, it will assume that you're trying to create something. If it's the get method, it's going to assume that you're trying to list something or list a query set. We're going to look at this same idea, all three of these things, that's our list create view and our detail view as one single function one single function based view. So what I want to do here is I want to think through the logic first. We're going to define the product alt view and it's going to take in a request and then args and keyword args. So the idea here is we're going to be distinguishing things based off of the request method. So if the method is get, then we will do either a get request, like actually get data. So get request as in a detail view, or we will do a list view. This of course is going to be based off of the actual URL. So that means I need to get my URL args. We'll talk about that in a second as well. So go ahead and say pass for a moment. Then if the method is post, then we'll go ahead and create a, an item, right? And so we've actually definitely already seen a lot of these things just in separate parts. So if we look at the create method, for example, in views.py, uh, we currently have that create method there, right? So I could quite literally copy this and bring it into if post, right? And so I've got my request here, there's our post method, and I need to bring in and change this to an API view itself with a few imports. So I need to allow the get and post methods in here. So let's go ahead and do those imports now. So from rest framework, dot decorators, we're going to import the API view and then from breast framework and dot response, we're going to import the response. Another thing I want to import is from Django dot shortcuts. We're going to import get object or 404. Now, another thing you can absolutely use is from Django dot HTTP. We can also use HTTP 404. I'll show you just briefly how to do both of those things. Okay, so first off, the list view is probably the easier one. So what I'm gonna do here is create the list view. First off, the query set is product.objects.all, right? Or whatever query set we end up using. So I'll keep it in as just simply query set. I'll write it out as query set, but a lot of times the variable is just QS. That's what you'll see often. Um, next, to actually serialize a query set, it's also pretty easy. First off, we'll do our data and we'll use our product serializer again. This time I'll pass in that query set as an argument, as well as many being true, and then just grabbing the data like that. And then we can just return that response of that data. Okay, so far so good. So how do we actually do a detail view now though? That's the big question here. So the list view is fine, but how do we get that detail view? Well, this is gonna have everything to do with the keyword arguments that are passed here. So the keyword argument is gonna be primary key, or at least that's where we're going because we're going off of the default of the detail view here, that lookup key. And so basically what I'm gonna say here is if PK is not none, then I'm gonna assume this is a detail view. Otherwise, we will assume it's a list view. And that pretty much covers the gambit. And realistically, I don't need this else clause because I will return a response in here as well. So I probably could just go back just like that. The else clause is just to make it a little bit more clear, um, I guess, but I think this is pretty clear. So what is it that we're gonna do with this primary key here? Well, first off, I need to get the object itself, right? It's not a query set anymore. So I do wanna show you how to do it with a query set first though. So query set, and then we could just go ahead and do filter this down and say PK is equal to PK. And really I could say if query set, uh, you know, if it does not exist, so you could do that it does exist or you could say it does not exist. This is where I could do that raise HTTP 404. 
that would actually be handled correctly within the Django REST framework because of this decorator, which is so cool. It makes things really easy on us. But that also means that I can do something more like this, where it's just grabbing the object or OBJ, and that's get object or 404, the product class or the product model itself, and then the lookup field name, and then the actual lookup value, the keyword argument here. Okay, and then once we have that, assuming that it does give us an object or it does not raise an HTTP 404, which it could if that object does not exist, which we will certainly test in a moment. Then I'm gonna go ahead and say my data is equal to that product serializer again, passing in that object. This time, many of course is gonna be false. We don't need to declare that, that is the default, but I'll go ahead and add it in for now. And there we go. So this product alt view is now a function based view that does the same as pretty much everything else. The one exception that I did not update was this right here. So this perform create method, the exact same data is going to come right here. So I can just paste this in here. And let's go ahead and tab it back, make sure it's tabbed correctly. And I'll tab this over. And I think that should solve how that's all done, including saving the instance itself. And so that is our actual data. Oops, I tabbed that in a little too far, uh, but there we go. So now it's identical and it's all in one single view. So we could of course test this and we should. In our URLs, I'm gonna change both of these to that one single view. And now with my client, I'll go ahead and do the Python and Py client. And then we'll go ahead and do detail.py. I should get that data. Then we can do the list.py. I should still get that data. And then we should also be able to do create.py and again, still getting that data. And of course, the last thing is maybe we want a not found item or a not found um, actual view or uh, rather lookup view here with a ID and whatnot. So inside of my, cli uh, my Py client here, I'll do not-found.py and it will just basically be the detail view uh, but some ridiculously large number here that I certainly do not have in my database, although that is an integer. Hopefully this will work as intended. We'll go ahead and do, we'll take a look at it. So save it as Python and Py client slash not dash, or that should be underscore, no dashes in Python modules. What was I thinking? Let me just rename this real quick, underscore. And there we go. So Python, Py client not found. We hit enter, this integer is too large. Yeah, I thought that might be too big. Okay, let's try that again. And now we get a not found. Very cool. Okay, so let's go ahead and well call that a day. Uh, so the big thing here though, of course, yes, I, I definitely did this really fast and I personally already know how to do all these things. But the problem with this view is not that it works, it certainly works, but it's confusing. Right. So if you are familiar with the Django REST framework and you just look at these generic views, not confusing. In fact, we don't need this list view at all. I can comment that one out. Uh, this is these two are not confusing at all. I think they're very straightforward, very easy to do, very easy to run with. This, on the other hand, I have to be like, wait, wait, what's going on here? Hold on. OK, I'm a git method, blah, blah, blah. Right. It, it just adds confusion. This is why using those generic views is another like great thing is because well, we can all reuse them then. I can look at your code with a generic view and have a sense of what's going on. You can look at my code and have a sense of what's going on. If you see these function-based views, which tends to happen in function-based views, a lot of the logic is like all over the place. Um, again, because function-based views are so flexible, because they have to be, you have to write them from scratch. Class-based views are also flexible, or they can be, but it's a lot of modifying to make that work. Function-based views aren't quite like that. Uh, but nevertheless, it's still cool to see how this is all done. And I think there's actually a lot in here that it can help illuminate a little bit more about the Django REST framework, especially like this query set thing. So if we needed to enrich a serializer, this might be one way that you end up doing that with a serializer method field, which is something you could check out later. Uh, but for now, I'm going to leave it like this um, as far as the views are concerned. But of course, in my URLs, I want to bring this back to the actual ones that I was using. So the product detail view and also the product list create view, just like that. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Let me just open that back up. Okay, great. 
And so, of course, now the next step would just be to do that edit and destroy views, um, not necessarily together, but the idea here is we have a better understanding, hopefully to some degree, why the generic views are so good and you know why the function-based views are still good. They're really flexible, um, but there leads to a lot of confusion or potentially a lot of confusion in there. Now, once you get experience like me, maybe you're gonna mix and match how these things work, um, but realistically, this alt view is not something you'll use very much. It's really meant to illustrate what you could do on one view. Uh, and what you could also do, thinking a little bit further, is you could also change to HTTP methods to update and then maybe destroy to you know delete, uh, which is definitely something that you could do all in one view. In other words, I could do all of CRUD in one single function-based view or a class-based view as well, that's just not something I recommend doing because of this hazy logic in here, as I mentioned. Let's keep going. Now we're gonna go ahead and add in the update API view as well as the destroy API view. Now, both of these views are very similar to the product detail view, except they might contain additional data and they use a different, well, what do you think? HTTP method. So let's take a look. First off, I'm gonna go into my URLs actually. I'm gonna de design two new URLs in here to handle the different methods I want to handle. So update and delete, okay, or destroy. You can think of it as delete or destroy, but I'm gonna leave it in as delete because that's the actual HTTP method that we'll use. So inside of our views here, we're now gonna go ahead and copy our detail view and I'll paste it below. And this is now just gonna be called our update view, right? And change this as well. And then finally here, okay. So now that we've got this, I'm gonna go ahead and declare that into my update. Notice that it is almost identical to the detail view, which means that I also have this lookup field right here. In this case, I'll just declare it to make sure that we know for sure that our update view does have this. So the next part of this is defining a method called perform update. This is gonna take in the self and serializer and the instance is gonna be equal to the serializer.save, okay? So this instance is, well, what do you know? It's identical to the instance that comes through with perform create. So I can do additional things to this instance if I need to. Uh, one of those things could be related to the content as well. Like if the instance.content, well, let's, let's try it out. So if not instance.content, then instance.content, equals to instance.title. And then of course, do we need to save it? That is gonna be the big question. And the answer hopefully is clear because it says, well, it saved it right here. So let's go ahead and not save it initially. Okay, so we're gonna save the file views.py and we'll go ahead and see if our product update view ends up working. Okay, so the first thing I wanna do is go into my detail view. I'm gonna copy this one. Before I copy it, I'm gonna run it. So Python and pi client slash detail .py. I now see hello world is in there. So I wanna change the title. Let's change it to something different than hello world. So inside of pi client, I'll just do update.py. Again, it needs to be a object that actually exists. Otherwise it's not gonna work. The data that we wanna pass in is the field that we wanna change. So in this case, I'll change the title to hello world my old friend, right? And maybe we wanna change the price. From being $0, we'll change it to 120.99. Something ridiculous, cool. Then we'll go ahead and use the put data here and we'll pass in our JSON just like that. Simple enough, right? So now I'll just run Python client. Instead of detail, we'll use update.py. Hit enter, I get the put method is not allowed. Of course, I have my update view here. Let's make sure all of my URLs are saved. I should have my update view there. Everything's saved up. Let's run it again. Still getting the put method is not allowed. That's because my endpoint here should be update. Cool. Just a slight error in where that is. Now, hello world, my old friend works. If I go to the detail again, I should have that new updated method in here. And of course, if I wanted to change it back, I totally could. Now I don't have 
like revision control. Like I don't see what the old version is, but I can change it back to it just like that really simply in the case of updating. Now deleting is not a whole lot different. This time what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna list everything out and I'm just gonna delete one of my last ones. So one of the last ones in here, but unfortunately I don't have my IDs listed. So what I'll do then is in my detail, I'll go ahead and say 10. Let's just see if 10's in there. Get a detail, 10's in there, great. So go ahead and copy this whole thing. And naturally this is only gonna work one time. So let's go ahead and say delete.py. We'll paste in here. In fact, I will go ahead and say get ID or let's go ahead and say the product ID equals to our input of what is the product ID you want to use. And we'll put a new line in there. And we'll go ahead and say try int, let's say product ID is equal to the integer of that, except and print the product ID is not valid. I could probably make this a lot better. Okay, um, and then we'll just say if product ID and pass that in here, just like that, there. Now it's a little bit better of a test or a delete test, that is. And we'll go ahead and say delete. And now this is gonna be the delete method directly there, just to the endpoint, that's it. Okay, so now let's go ahead and run Python client and delete.py. What product ID do you want to use? I'm going to say 10. Delete method's not allowed. Hey, did we use the wrong endpoint again? Nope, we've got the right endpoint. Let's go ahead and make sure our delete view is there. It is not. So product delete view. And in our views itself, did we even do it? We did not. Oh no. Okay, so let's go ahead and copy this. This time, of course, I can do perform destroy. This is not gonna be the serializer this time, it's gonna be the instance itself. And what I really wanna do is if there's anything I need to do with the instance, I can do it here. Otherwise, I'm gonna run super.perform and destroy here as well of that instance. And we need to make sure that we're using the destroy API view all across the board. And product destroy or delete view. There we go. And so once this is run, it will delete it and it'll be gone forever. So product destroy view. Let's try that again. What ID do I wanna use? 10, now I get a JSON error because it's actually not gonna return JSON. Instead, the status code will be 204. So in the delete, we want this to be status code and well, we could assert that it's 204 or I could just say it's equal to 204. So we'd see that value. Now what product ID, I'll just go ahead and say nine because I know 10 existed and what do you know, it says true. Now what if I do one that probably does not exist? I'll get a 404 and false. Great. So now we have a update view and a destroy view, which makes a whole lot of sense. So there are, well, one of the biggest glaring problems here with all of this is sure it works. We now have done CRUD, that is, you know, create, retrieve, in this case, delete or detail rather, uh, update and destroy or delete. We've done all of CRUD, right? But the thing that we haven't done is lock these things down. We don't have anything related to permissions. We're just letting anybody do anything, deleting anything and everything. So that's certainly something we'll still need to do before we can ever even do anything related to permissions, we're gonna to need to do authentication, which is pretty interesting. Now, before I go much further with this though, that permissions and authentication stuff is what we will cover going forward. But before we do that, I actually really wanna see these API views broken apart into the core class-based view. So we just have a better sense of how this is actually functioning and how we might accomplish something similar to the function-based view version, but rather with an actual class-based view version. That's what we'll do in the next part.
All right, so now what I'm gonna do is something very similar to this product alt view, but using a class-based view in the Django REST framework. So to do this, we are gonna declare class, and I'm gonna call this my product mixin view, and it's gonna be generics dot generic API view. And we're gonna define our first method of git. This is gonna be self request args and keyword args, and it's gonna return something. So the biggest difference between class-based views and function-based views is we don't actually write conditions for the methods. We actually write a function for the request method, right? So in the case of this product alt view, we have a condition if it's a git method, we have a condition if it's the post method. In a class-based view, we just write an actual method on the class itself for the different request method, the different HTTP method of you know post or git, All right? So initially I'll start with just the git method itself and we'll come back to the post method. Okay, so what is it that I'm trying to do here? Now, initially speaking, there's a lot of different things I can do, like the list view, for example, I could do, we start with the product list create view, but let's make it really simple and just do the list view to start out. Very similar to like what we did here, but instead of having to write a bunch of things, we're gonna only write a couple. So the first thing that I wanna do is I wanna actually build it very similar to how the generic list API view works, and that is by using mixins. So we're gonna go ahead and import the mixins here at the very top from the REST framework, and we're gonna import the mixin right above the generic or really before the generic API view. We're gonna do mixin and list model mixin, okay? So what this does is it provides us with the ability to declare our query set like product.objects.all and our serializer, just like we saw before. And that of course is gonna be our product serializer. And now in this git here, I can just call self.list request args and keyword args. So this list method here, that right there is coming directly from this. Now, in this case, I'm actually handling this list method from a HTTP get method. But if for some reason I wanted to change it to a post method, I totally could do that. I could do that just like that. Now it is different than the product list view by default or the generic list API view by default. It now goes off of the post method. Now this same concept actually can be applied in other places, right? So coming back into this product list view here, I could actually implement that same idea here. I can use that same post method because this mixin is in here by default. I'll show you the documentation for that in just a moment. Um, but the idea here is when we want to use mixins, that will give us the ability to have access to some of the methods that are built into the mixin. This is a little bit more clear as you use it more, but also look at the documentation. So in the documentation, we've got our generic API view here. And we've got a bunch of basic settings, such as query set, serializer class. Hey, what do you, what do you know? Even a lookup field in here. Great. Now, when our when we look at a, the list model mixin, we see that it provides a dot list method that takes in a request. That's it. It doesn't say how to use that list method. This is how you use it. You put it on some sort of HTTP method. Now, I'm going to keep it in with the standard method here. The reason being is now I'm gonna go ahead and test this out with our product mixin view. And of course, it's gonna go based off of this product mixin as view. And we're gonna go ahead and run the client here. So Python pi client and list.py. So I hit enter, this should list everything out as it did before. Now, of course, in my URLs, I just wanna change this to my product mixin view now. Again, still listing things out. If I attempt to do that, I'm getting a invalid error here. So I put serializer, this should be actually serializer class, which is what we've been doing up until this point. And it will also tell you, this is the error here. You need a serializer class or implement the get serializer class method, which we could talk about later. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna go ahead and run this again. And again, it lists things out. But there's of course one big caveat, and that is if I do create and hit enter, it now says the post method is not allowed. Interesting. What if I actually change this to post like I did and now run create? Now it doesn't care what the data is, it's just gonna return back that list method here because that's how I implemented it. If I go back to that list method where it's doing a 
actual Git. It's now saying the Git method is not allowed, right? So this is actually what's really cool about using class-based views in general in Django. And it's also what's cool about using it inside of the Django REST framework if you need to augment or change things however you see fit. Now let's actually implement one more step in this product mix-in, much like we did with our alt view, where we had that primary key in here. So very similar to this, but not quite the same. So again, I'll go ahead and declare my lookup field, the default being primary key. Now this only matters for things that it matters to. In other words, the list model mix-in does not care about this argument at all, so you don't need to set it. And also the retrieve model mix in, so mixins.retrieve model mix in, which of course is for our detail view. This is the only one that does care about this lookup field. So it's going to default to being primary key, but if you need to change it, this is where you would do that. So now what I want to do is I want to print out the keyword args, or let's print out the args and keyword args. Before I attempt to use the retrieve model mix in, Let's go ahead and see what the args and keyword args on that get method by changing, of course, our detail view here to our mix in view. So yet again, I'll go ahead and go up and to our detail, pi client detail, hit enter. And let's spell detail correctly, hit enter, and I'm getting a list view still. But when I print it out, notice that I've got my args and keyword args being printed out on Django. So in here, I've got my args and keyword args. Now, I actually want to keep my primary key in my keyword args. So all I'll do here is do pk equals to keyword args .get pk. In other words, I don't need to set pk being none here. That's not necessary. And well, frankly, it wasn't necessary down here either. You could do that same method up here as well. So now we would just say if pk is not none, then we will return self.retrieve this time. And this is going to take in the request, the args, and keyword args. And those keyword args, since I'm just using the get method, those will also be passed in here now. And so it's just going to change what that get method responds with based off of the mixin. So if I run it again, I get a detail not found. So let's go into detail, and I see that it's at 10. I remember deleting that one, so let's change it back to 1. That one I did not delete, so now it is showing me that data. And of course, it's still based off of this same random product mix-in, right? Something I won't use in the long run because it's a bit convoluted, but it's really useful to understand things that are going on here and also see how convenient these model mix-ins are and can be. Because realistically, at this point, I now have a view that handles, well, two things in my URLs, the list view and the detail view. It did not do the create view, so let's go ahead and add in the create view into this whole mix. So mixins dot create model mixin. What do we need to handle here? Well, the create view is typically a post method, so we do self request args and keyword args. And of course, it needs to return something. What does it need to return? Well, if we go into the documentation and go into the create model mixin, we see that it provides a create method. Hey, what do you know? I can just return back that create method. You call self dot and that create method. Now, again, the reason that we have that create method is because I have this mixin in here. If I did not have that mixin in here, this would not have a create method. By all means, test that out on your own. So let's go ahead and run create now. And I actually don't have to change anything because of the fact my URLs, I had that list create view in there anyway. So I run this again and we hit enter and sure enough, it ends up working. So the challenge I wanna leave you with is how do I actually augment this to handle my other views like perform destroy and product update? I'll give you a hint, it's actually incredibly similar. Now, before I actually go any further, I do wanna say, hey, wait a minute, I did this create view, but what I didn't do was this, the, or that's perform update, but the perform create. Can I just copy this and bring it down here? This time, I'm gonna just change my content slightly. So I'll just say if it's none, then I'll just say this is a single view doing cool stuff. Save it. 
Now let's go ahead and try this again. Notice that this one says none. Now I'm going to run it again. And what do you know? This is a single view doing cool stuff is in there. So yes, those methods are still available. And the only reason that let's say the create API view has that method is because look at what it's extending the create API view or the generic API view along with the create model mix in quite literally what we just did. It's it's unpacking this into one single view. In other words, if we looked at it, it's just this. So the create API view is the model mix in and the generics here. There we go. That is our create model <laughs> create API view. And you, you know, you can actually look into this yourself too by going into, let's say, the cre list create API view, not running the code, rather um, coming back in here. Let's close that. Let's actually go to the definition of the code. This actually takes you inside of the virtual environment uh, package itself, right? Takes you right in there. And what do you know? We've got our mix ins and all of the methods exactly the same. This is what I just broke down for you. And of course, you can also look into those even more deeply as well, like the actual model mix in and go to that definition. And now you see a number of things that hopefully you're starting to get a little bit more familiar with as it relates to all of this stuff, right? Maybe this gets serialized or things a little new to you, but we've seen is valid and raise exception self.perform create. Well, we've implemented that. And what do you know? It actually passes all those things in as, as well as headers and some of the response data, right? So we've already seen a lot of this stuff. And so this actual mix in this, this product mix in view, which is just a lot of those mix ins all in one, um, does give us some flexibility here. And it also makes things a little bit more convoluted. Now, I don't think you should go this route. I think the purpose of this or my intention was that you learn a little bit more about the mix-ins themselves, because yes, you can absolutely create your own mix-ins just like you can in just pure old Django in the first place. But I wanna show you, generally speaking, what you can do, as well as this model method here um, in general to see also you know, doing it in function-based view or class-based view. If you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, let's take a look at permissions and authentication. Now we're gonna go and talk about session authentication and permissions. All this has to do with logging our user in and making sure they can do the things that we want them to be able to do. I'm gonna start with permissions just so we get a feel for what this might look like. So we've got our product mix in on this API endpoint here. That is something I wanna change. So jump it into URLs. I'm just gonna change it back to what it was originally. So product list create view and you should as well. And then also the product detail view. Now when it comes to generic views, so any view that's inside of generics, we can do this same thing that I'm about to do. So what I want to start off with is permission classes. And what I want to do here is I want to use, if the user is authenticated, let's let them do something. So I'll do permissions here and just do permissions dot is authenticated. Okay. So we'll save that and we will go back to this endpoint and refresh in here. I get authentication credentials were not provided. Now, if I do this same thing inside of my Pi client, let's say for instance, Pi client and list.py, I get authentication credentials were not provided. If I do create, same thing. Cool. So this is showing me that this user, this request does not actually have a user associated to it that has permission. In this case, the user is just simply not authenticated. We will show you how to solve this in just a moment. But the cool thing is there's a number of different authentication or permission classes that you can use both things, right? So permission classes, we'll take a look at the default ones, we're going to create a custom permission in the next part. But for now, notice that these built in ones here, we've got allow any is authenticated is admin user is authenticated or read only, and then a few others as well like Django object permissions, which is pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, so we've got is authenticated or read only. What does that look like? Well, let's go ahead and add or read only to this. Okay, so now I save it and I go to try to create it. Again, it gives me authentication credentials were not provided. If I go to list it this time, this time it actually gives me back this data. 
So what's happening here with this particular permission is I can actually not send post data. I can't use the post method, but I can use the get method. I can actually return back the list view related things. Now, of course, if this was a create API view and I tried to do it again, the get method's not allowed because of the type of view it is. That has nothing to do with the permission, right? So if we come back and run that again, and now do, let's say a create view, we've got a 403 error versus a 405 error. So just slightly different status codes here uh, that are coming through with the different permissions and the different view types and the different allowed methods. Now, I only mention that is because it does actually have some distinctions that if you are creating an API client, you can see what all of those distinctions could end up being. But anyway, so now we've got this permission class of is authenticated or read only. But how do we solve the is authenticated part? Well, that comes in then with authentication classes. And that is also a list that we can add in. And so I'm going to go ahead and import the authentication module. And what we want to do here is we want to say authentication dot session authentication. Okay. So these two, roughly speaking, are already in the API generics view. Like you might already have these somewhere listed out. And yes, you can absolutely use these in function-based views as well. Um, they are certain de decorators for it. So these are throttling. Uh, notice that there's authentication classes and permission classes that you can use on function-based views as well. That's not something I'm gonna cover right now, but there are those decorators if you need them elsewhere. Um, but generic API views, this is one of those things that's really nice about them. So not only can we use it on, of course, our list create API view as we just have, but you can also use it on, you know, just a generic API view like we did before. So by all means, test that out. Um, but now that we've got this session authentication, what I wanna do is I wanna create a admin user. So I'm gonna CD into my backend here and I'll just run python manage.py create super user and I'll use CFE, you know, whatever password because we're testing things, it doesn't really matter there and then I'll log in to my admin account. So CFE and then that whatever password. Now I actually have a session in Django. So if I go back into this API and refresh in here, notice that my user is actually showing up. And if I scroll down, I actually have the ability to create new things. Now, if I go back into my Pi client though, so Python and Pi client slash create.htm or create.py and hit enter, I still get this authentication credentials were not provided. Now, hopefully there's some intuition here that makes sense. My Pi client itself never actually logged in. So if I look at this, this is the only thing that's happening for that create.py. Now there's certainly a way to have them log in to the admin, like as in going to admin and logging in and having a session and then using that session to then send data, right? Or post data. That is certainly possible. And it would be done through something like Selenium, uh, which would allow to keep that session, but it emulates a browser. Now, this is not ideal for the vast majority of APIs when you want to expose them to third-party users, right? So this API right here is really meant for your standard Django project. So if you have got your Django project here on localhost, and you actually serve, let's say, a React file or any other JavaScript, now that JavaScript can interact with this API and use the session cookies to actually interact with that data and actually use this API. Um, so that is something that's fairly important for the session authentication. Um, but at this point, what I want to do is actually take a look at how to create custom user permissions. Then we'll go ahead and take a look at token authentication so that our Python client here will actually be able to work with the API as well. So let's take a look. Before we create a custom permission, I want to talk about the Django model permissions. This one is incredibly useful for all sorts of reasons, as we'll see. So the first thing I need to do is I need to log into my admin and create a user. I just created a user named staff with staff status. That's literally the only thing that's new about this, right? Next, I need to add in my product model to the admin itself. So inside of products in admin.py, we'll go ahead and do from .models. We're gonna import our product 
and just do admin.site.register and product. Okay, so we save that and now my admin user themselves has access to review these products and of course has full access. I can add things, I can delete things and so on. So what I wanna do now is I wanna take the same URL, open it up in a new incognito window and run it. Now, the reason I do this is so that I can actually have two sessions logged in at the same time. You don't have to do that, but it is a nice way to just jump back and forth between these two users. So now I've got staff, I'm gonna log into the staff user. And of course I've got forbidden here. Okay, so if I go into just simply admin, I don't have permission to see anything or view anything. So this is where the Django permissions come in, right? So if I come into my user here, go back into staff, and I look for, let's say for instance, products, and let's say view products, right? So can view products, bring it over, save and continue, we'll refresh in here, what do you know? I can actually now see all of these products. But unlike the super user, the super user can actually edit them, right? So when they're looking here, this is a read-only view, okay? So I wanna actually emulate this in my API itself. But before I go down that road, I also wanna go ahead and say groups. Let's go ahead and say staff editor, right? So just a staff editor group. And so um, we're gonna go back into products. Maybe it's staff product editor. Let's change it just to be a little bit more specific. And now we can say can change these products and can add these products. So these two we're gonna select, bring them on over, hit save and continue. So back into my users, into that staff user, I'm gonna go ahead and add them in as a staff product editor now. So they can view it and they can edit it. Okay, there we go. So we save it now. And if I refresh in here now, now of course I have those permissions. So I have permissions on two levels, one directly on the actual staff user themselves, and then the other one being on the group that they are a part of, right? Two different ones. Now this group I should probably also have can view product. And so now the actual user itself doesn't have distinct actual permissions that are not in the group itself. But we're actually gonna toggle these things a little bit so we can see how these permissions end up shaking out in the API itself. Okay, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and copy this, this endpoint here, and we'll bring it into our incognito window. This of course is to make sure our staff user is the current session we're using. So we can see, well, the permissions we wanna use here. And that of course is gonna be our Django model permissions. So back into our views for this product list create view. I'm gonna change this is authenticated or read only to Django model permissions, okay? So at this point, nothing should really change. I should be able to refresh and see that I have permission to view it and likely add things. Let's go ahead and change that. So I'm gonna go back into my staff user on my super user account, right? So I got my super user account here. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of the staff product editor group. Hit save and continue. And we'll go back into our admin or the API itself for the staff user. Notice that I can't edit anything in here anymore. And this is also true in the admin as well, right? So we can see what their permissions are right here. So the nice thing about this then is, of course, you don't wanna have your staff members passwords, right? You wanna allow them to be able to change their own passwords so they can log into things securely. I don't think it's a good idea to have your staff password. Of course, you can always change it yourself, right? You can come in here and change it to something else if they're doing something you don't want them to do. But the general idea is we wanna lock this down as much as possible, and that's what we just did. So the other thing is, if I go into a product, let's say product one, I still can't edit it, I can't do anything. I can view it, let's go actually one update. Wait a minute, so I've got the update method here. Can I actually update this? Right now it's saying method is not allowed on this update API. So let's go ahead and try and change the title. So new title for this one, exclamation mark, hit put. What do you know? It actually does edit this. How is that possible? Well, it goes down to the view, right? I didn't actually change the permission at all. So I can update and change the permission and I probably should. But something else you should notice is perhaps the session wouldn't necessarily show up there. In this case, it did. Um, but that's where our permissions, we have a glaring weakness in our current setup. The permissions are only on one single view, right? 
So two things are at play here. We've got a new kind of permission that's based off of the user's permissions, which we'll talk about more in the custom one as well. So we can be a little bit more distinct to that. Um, but it's also based off of the fact that I have the permissions declared on any given view. So in the next one, we're gonna go ahead and create custom permissions and make sure that our default permissions and authentication are everywhere. Then we'll actually start to look at the actual token authentication, I promise. But before I actually go there, the other thing I wanna take a look at is this model permission. One last thing about it. I wanna go into products. Okay, so in the products, I can see everything. So what I wanna look at is in my list, or actually for the staff user itself, I wanna get rid of this can view product here, and we'll just hit save and continue. So at this point, this staff user has no permissions to do anything. We can verify this by going into the admin, they have no permissions to view anything. If we go back into the list create API view though, what do you know? It's actually listing out all of these products. Now this is not what I intended. I intended for them to have none of those actual permissions. This is why we actually need a custom permission is to change this ever so slightly, at least for this particular model itself. Okay, so if we look at the model, the Django model permissions, the main ones are related to making changes. These are the non quote unquote safe methods. We'll talk about that a little bit too, but basically if it's an HTTP post, put or patch or delete, that's where the permissions really come in. This is the default behavior. If you want to include a view model permission, that's when we actually create a custom model. So there's many reasons to create custom models, but this is one of them. And so in the next one, that's what we'll actually do is we'll actually create a custom permission to handle this and then we'll apply those permissions as well as the authentication requirements across our entire API. Let's take a look. So we left it off with some permission issues that we want to solve in this one with a customized permission. So if we look at the Django admin, for example, this staff user has no permission to view or edit anything. But of course, if they go into the Django REST framework API view, they can actually see everything. They might not be able to edit anything on this particular view, but they can definitely see everything. So that's what we want to change here. And to do this, we're going to go ahead and be using the custom permissions here. So if you go in the documentation and go to custom permissions, you'll see all sorts of really good information on how custom permissions work. Um, and also two examples of permissions that you might want to actually include in your project. So this block list permission is a good one because you can actually track IP addresses and block them if you need to. That's a way to do it. The next one is owner read only can actually check whether or not the owner is the one accessing this. That is the foreign key user. I'll show you where that would end up being in any given object um, to actually make an edit. Otherwise, it's just gonna allow you to view it. Again, read only. And so if we look at the model itself, what you would essentially see is something like owner equals to models dot foreign key of a user. And then now this actual model itself, an object of that model can now run this particular condition and be true or false, depending on who's trying to access it and their authentication. Cool. So now what we want to do is go back to our Django model permissions here, like we've been using, and we want to, well, actually override this model permissions. And it says set the params map property. Now, before we set that map property here, uh, what I want to do is just start the process of having our own custom permission. So it's this right here. We're going to go ahead and come in to our products app and we'll go ahead and create permissions.py. We'll do from REST framework. We're going to go ahead and import permissions. And then we'll create class is staff editor permission. And there's going to be permissions dot Django model permissions. And not too many S's. And there we go. Okay. So default values here, we can say define has permission and it's going to be self request view and we can return true or false right and we also saw the other one which was has object permission and that gives us also the obj or the object itself and this is where i could do something like obj.owner equals equals to request.user or of course i could also do that method where 
uh, I'll just show you the example directly, you could check the request method if it's in the safe methods, like if it's get header options, like it says right there. But of course, I'm not actually worried about the object permission at this point, especially because, you know, the Django model permissions exist and also this example is here. So if you wanted to use this example somewhere else, by all means, bring it in and save it. Uh, but for now, we'll stick with this is staff editor permission. Now, one of the first things that we want to check on this is to check if the request .user .is staff. If they are, we're going to go ahead and return true. Now, when it comes to permissions, I think it's better to offer the least amount of permissions than the most amount. In other words, default to they do not have permission and then grant permission when they meet certain criteria. And so that's how you do it here. Okay, so what we can also do is we can actually see our user. Let's go ahead and actually say user equals to request our user here. And that way I can just reference that a little bit easier. So I'm gonna go ahead and print out user.get all permissions. Okay, so I just wanna see what this user's permissions are. So now that we have some baseline of our actual permission class here, I'm gonna bring it into my views. So from dot permissions, we're gonna import our is staff editor permission. I'll get rid of the other default that's in here. And then we'll come back. Okay, cool. So make sure everything's running. And let's go ahead and take a look at this from our staff users perspective. We'll do a quick refresh. And what we see in here, assuming that everything is saved up, we refresh in here and this print statement is not going through because it returns true too soon. So let's save that again and we can refresh now and we should be able to see the permissions that this user has. There are a none, right? They literally have no permissions. So what we can do is if the user is staff, again, doing the least amount of permissions, I'm gonna go ahead and say false. Now what I'm gonna do is basically say if user dot has perm or has the permission, in this case, it's the products app dot and the action we wanna allow for, in this case, it's gonna be view product. Okay, so view the actual model name in lowercase. So the app name all in lowercase and the model name in lowercase as well. If they have the ability to view it, then I'm gonna go ahead and return true, okay? So right now, if I refresh in here, now it doesn't, right? I have no ability to see this at all. So this is of course to view it, what about to change it, right? To make it edit to it, I can do change as well. Refresh, still the same thing. Okay, and then we'll go ahead and also add in add. And then let's do the last thing, which is gonna be delete, but I'm actually gonna rearrange these a little bit to be in alphabetical order. And there we go. And so obviously I have no permissions whatsoever yet, but let's look at the format here. It's gonna be the app name and then dot, the action, so let's just say verb, underscore the model name, okay? So that's how it ends up working. Add, delete, change, view. That's it, really that simple. So if I had a, another app called, you know, posts, we would do post.view and then post. Maybe the model's called post, right? Now, this of course is a lot of manual writing, uh, but we can still try it out. Let's save it. The main one that's gonna work on this actual endpoint is most likely going to be, uh, well, just view it list because we're doing a get option here. So let's go back into the admin with our super user. Let's go ahead and add back some of the permissions or all of them. So let's go into products and view, save it, and we'll refresh in here and here actually with our staff user. And when you know, I can actually now view these things. Um, in this case, it actually gave me the also edit portion. Interesting. So it's actually not doing the permissions correctly, right? It is sort of doing permissions correctly, but it's also really not. And that's because the view itself has different kinds of views that are going through in here. So different kinds of permissions for each inherent view. And what's happening with my custom permission here is if this user has any of these permissions, 
it's going to be true. This, of course, is flawed and at not at all what we want. We want specific actions that are allowed for this particular view. And so the nice thing is the Django model permissions has the ability to, you know, augment and to change. Um, but it is important that you understand at least a little bit that there is a way to go through here on these different permissions. So the other question here is, well, how do I actually augment this to work the way we want it to? As in, how do I make sure that its view is also one of these permissions? Well, we actually do not need this has permission overall, except for the fact that if the user is not staff. So I'm gonna go ahead and comment this out just so you have a working example in the commented code. And then I'm gonna go ahead, or somewhat working, not quite working correctly, but it still works as a uh, example. Then I'm gonna go ahead and actually return back super has permission request and view. So this is the default permission then. And now what I wanna do is make sure that they're a staff user. So if not request user is staff, then I'm gonna return false. So no matter what, this has to be a staff user. So right off the bat, it's already checking that. Now, of course, the permissions, we actually already have that, is admin user. It's the same thing, right? <laughs> right there, that's it. So that's kind of cool that that exists. So we actually could use these side by side, which we'll take a look at in just a moment. Um, now, for the Django model permissions itself, how we actually make this work correctly, well, we can actually go into the definition of this code. This is the actual code itself. Notice that it's inheriting from the base permission, which we totally could have done. And here's all the code that goes through with it. So has permission, query set, this is a method that it creates specifically for this permission. Get required permissions, as we see here. Uh, so we've got a number of things that are really cool, but the main thing here, as it says in this note, is just to augment this. And so to do that, we just bring it into our permission class here. We paste this in here and now I've got these parameters. And so what I really need to do is just change this get parameter and change it to match that format that we already discussed. I'll show you where to find this format as well if you forget. So that's gonna be the view format here. And what's cool is by using this particular class, the params map is going to map directly to the app label and the model name. Again, looking at the permissions itself, if you look at the params map, you see right in here how all of that's happening, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's always nice to review the code that other people have written because you're gonna learn a lot. Now, these two options, perhaps we wanna have those permissions in there as well as such as view. Um, in this case, I'm gonna leave them open. It's completely okay at this point. Okay, so now that we've got this, we're gonna go ahead and save it, save everything. I'll go back in here. I'm gonna get rid of all of my permissions first. Okay, so I've saved the permissions. Now this person should be permissionless. Refresh, permissionless, great. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add in the list view. So products and view. So the view product will work on a list as well as a detail, uh, if that wasn't clear already. We refresh in here, and what do you know? There it is. And now of course, if I make them a staff product editor, which has all of the permissions, I believe, we're gonna go ahead and save that. We refresh in here, and now you can do everything you need to, including create. So the last thing is, of course, just checking or verifying staff status. Let's go ahead and save that. Go back over to our list view here, I refresh. I don't have per permission to perform this action. Now, if I go and look at the admin itself, it also seems like I'm logged out. I'm actually not logged out, I just don't have permission to go to the admin any longer. Uh, so that's the staff part, right? Interesting. So what do I need to do then to augment this a little bit more so it's not that I'm putting all of the permissions I might need into my custom permission? Well, to do that then, I'm gonna actually comment this part out, only change this, or really augment it only slightly. That's all I'm gonna change. Then in my actual view, this is where I want to declare the actual permission itself. So if I do permissions.is admin user, then is staff editor permission, then it will do the same thing. So if I come back in here, make them staff again, save it, refresh in here, what do you know? Cool. So the ordering of this matters as well. So what you're gonna wanna do is what 
permission you want to match first should go first. So in this case, I definitely want to make sure that they're an admin user first before anything else. Um, so it's very similar to like the actual permission itself. Uh, so if, if we look at this has permission here, if I put a permission up here, if not request by user dot, let's say username is equal to CFE, then return false. Uh, this will basically always return false then if it's not the CFE user. Um, and so that ordering also matters, of course. So that logic matters as well on our actual view class. Uh, and that's just something you can play around with as far as the ordering is concerned. The authentication classes is not as strict. You can use different authentication classes as well, which is also pretty nice. Okay, so that's custom permissions. Now, the big thing here going forward, what we need to do is we actually need to update our defaults as well as potentially introduce a new type of authentication. Not potentially, we definitely have to introduce a new type of authentication because our poor old Pi client here uh, does not have access to listing things out now, right? So if we do Pi thought and Pi client and list.py, I still get nothing because it's not auth authenticated. So that is another thing that we need to solve. If you have questions on the custom permissions, let me know. Like I said before, a lot of the built-in permissions are gonna cover the gambit of what you'll probably actually need. Um, every once in a while though, maybe you have something that's a member, like a user that's a member, that is where you could put has permission in there. Is staff is sort of like is member, uh, but it's not quite the same because maybe you have a completely different model that covers the membership portion of your site as well that maybe adds a layer of payment or some other reason to be a member. Cool. Um, so yeah, that's permissions. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the token authentication. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and implement token authentication so our Python client can actually talk to our backend or the REST API we've created. So the first thing I need to do is jump into CFE Home, into Settings, into Installed Apps. Right underneath the REST framework itself, we're gonna go ahead and do dot auth token. Once we do that, let's go ahead and make sure we run our migrations. So into our backend, we'll run Python, and it's py migrate. Okay, so let's go ahead and CD back into the root so I can run PyClient commands in a moment. Now we can verify that this now has tokens by of course logging in. I see that I've got my auth tokens here and I can create tokens for any given user. So what, one of the things I wanna do with this is I wanna be able to create these tokens at any time, but also be able to delete them, these tokens when it calls for it. So to actually create the tokens, it's also pretty simple. Let's actually jump into our API URLs here. And I'm gonna go ahead and come in and do from rest framework dot auth token dot views. We're gonna go ahead and import obtain the auth token. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating an endpoint to actually generate these auth tokens. And so to do this, I'll go ahead and do path and it's gonna be auth slash and just simply that view, that's it. Okay, so now what we wanna do is take a look at our protected views. So in the case of our views.py for our product list create view, we do not have the correct authentication classes. We don't have all of them at least. So I'm gonna go ahead and add one more. And that's gonna be authentication and dot, this is gonna be token authentication. So now I can actually use that token authentication to work with the product list create API view. So if I run Python py client and list.py, of course it's still not working. So back in to list.py, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna create a new call. So right above here, I'll go ahead and do the auth response. This is gonna be post here. The endpoint itself is API auth, like we just implemented right here, okay? And we wanna pass in some data here. The data we're gonna pass in is the username, which in my case is CFE, and then our password. So whatever this password ends up being. So what I don't wanna do 
on the regular is to pass in raw passwords in here, right? I wanna pass in a secure password as in, I wanna actually have this based off of an input of some kind. So how do we go about doing that? That's pretty simple. We just run from git pass, import git pass. And so now our password is going to be based off of that. And then we'll pass it in here. So the endpoint here, I'll call this my actual auth endpoint. And there we go. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what that response ends up being. I'm gonna run this list again. It's asking for my password. And it gives me this response here. If I do it again, again, it's gonna give me a token, okay? So these tokens are identical. So this is good and bad, right? But for now, I'm just gonna leave it in. We're not gonna to talk too much about making better tokens because there's a lot of different packages and how we can improve things. But for now, I'll just stick with this particular token. And we're gonna assume Basically, if the auth response dot status code is equal to 200, which is what it appears to be right there, then we're gonna go ahead and do this request. So let's bring this back. I'm also gonna go ahead and say the token is equal to the response token. And that of course is this data right here. Next, what I'm gonna do is say headers equals to, and we wanna do the authorization header and in this case, it's just gonna be simply token, and it's gonna take in this token. So we use an F string here and bring that token in just like that. With these headers, I can pass it into the request itself, just like that. So now this is a little bit closer to how we might interact with this. Realistically though, we would actually store the token somewhere and have the ability to reuse it. I'm just gonna make this where I run it each time and it logs me in. Okay, so I gave the wrong credentials that time and I did it again and there we go. Okay, so I did the right credentials and now it's actually sending this stuff back. So literally every time I run this, I have to enter my credentials and it runs it back for me. Pretty awesome. Now I could also do the username, of course. So we'll go ahead and say username equals to input. What is your username? And like that, I think in get password, we can say, what is your password? And something along those lines. And then we come in here, do our username, and now I can do the full thing, username, and then my login, and there it goes. Great. So that is now how I can actually authenticate with a token. Now there is one other aspect of this that I might want to actually do, and that is having a different keyword. Like instead of it saying token here, perhaps I want it to say bearer. This is very common with authorization headers, is having bearer, not necessarily token. So to do this, it's also fairly straightforward. And this time I'm going to go ahead and go into the API and create authentication.py. And now I'm going to go ahead and do from REST framework dot authentication, we're gonna import the token authentication. And I'll say as the base token auth. And then I'll do it, create a new class, just call it the token authentication. So essentially overriding the default one. And then we'll go ahead and set the keyword to bearer. And now I have overridden that token. I just need to bring it in here now. So then we'll do from API dot, or yeah, from API we'll import our authentication. Actually we'll import the authentication itself. So from API dot authentication, we're gonna import that token authentication now and we'll get rid of that other one. Save it, now back in list, we have it as bearer. We'll run it again. And again, I'll put in my username and password. And again, it works. This time it was just a different header. Cool. So this is actually, I think, pretty clear in the documentation on how this ends up happening, how you can actually make this work. Now, some things to consider with tokens of any kind is to delete them after a certain amount of time. So one way to delete them is quite literally go in here and just say uh, delete, right? 
that will actually force a new token to be created and force the user to log in again, right? So the way I can actually show this is by, let's actually save that token. I print it out somewhere in here. So here's this token right here. I'll go ahead and copy that. And now we'll go ahead and put the raw token in just to see what happens with the create method here. So here's my token. I'll go ahead and say headers equals to, again, authorization. And I'll just go ahead and write in bearer now. Okay, so I've got my headers. Let's go ahead and add in our headers here. There we go. Let's give it a shot with create.py, hit enter. The authentication credentials are incorrect. Let's spell bearer correctly. Let's try that again. And there we go. So it actually does create them. And if I delete this token, just like that, it's kind of like logging them out, invalid token, right? So to require them to log back in is kind of the idea there. So that is just a really simple implementation of creating tokens and headers and whatnot. So one of the things that you could do as far as getting rid of tokens is deleting them after a certain amount of time. Let's actually see what it looks like as far as storage goes. This is gonna create a new token for me and I'll log in, there we go. So let's go ahead and jump into the shell and oops, we need to jump into the back end and then Python managed up UI shell. And now what I wanna do is grab that actual token model itself. So from REST framework, we're gonna go ahead and grab in the auth token dot models, import all. And if I look at locals, I can see all of the different things that are coming in here. Um, it should be something related to, oh, that's way too much stuff. But anyways, the model token or the token itself as we got there. And if we do token dot objects at all, I see all the tokens, I do the first one. And now I'm gonna go ahead and do what's in that token itself. And we've got a lot of stuff going on here, right? So um, what we kind of wanna see here is essentially when this created. So we've got a created date here. So now what I can do, let's go ahead and grab my token object by saying token.objects.first, token object.created. Now I can see when it's created. Right. So what this implies then is I can actually clear these out every day with like a cron job or something like that, or even using celery to clear it out as well. Um, that of course is going down a line of thinking that you probably should do with tokens like this is to clear out the token and make sure that they're refreshing their session. Um, but a lot of times you actually could let the user decide this stuff. If you think about whenever you've worked with a API service Sometimes they'll enforce an expiration time. Sometimes they will not enforce that. And so in this case, it doesn't necessarily enforce it by default. There is no expiration in here by default. And I think that's one of the coolest things about the Django REST framework is there's a lot of other authentication packages that you can use, including creating, what do you know, your own custom authentication class. So you can absolutely start to be smart with how you build these things. And this token model, I mean, you could just look at the code itself to really review what you might want to change in it. So to do to actually review that, you would come in here and do from rest framework and then dot off token dot models, import the token class itself. Now go to the definition and you can see just how simple the actual model is itself. It's not really that complicated. You could quite literally copy this and create another field on here called expires. That's essentially the same thing as this. That is just a little bit in the, in the future, right? So when you actually save it, so if it's the keys not generated right here, you would then say something like self.expires and then set that value. Of course, not in the actual package itself, but on your own co code um, if you are interested in doing something along those lines. Now, that kind of customization is not something you'll necessarily always need to do because there are third-party packages that also exist to help make these things happen as you can experiment with on your own. Now, the thing about the authentication packages themselves, all of these other third-party ones do rotate. They change from time to time. And since authenticating is a security issue um, and these are also production-ready, 
the idea here is, well, sometimes security best practices change. These third-party packages don't always change with it necessarily. Um, I, I can't say for sure is the point, right? And that's also true with these other authentication methods, but these are a little bit more well-worn paths. How you do these things securely is like a whole topic we could talk about for hours and hours and hours. Um, but just the general rule of thumb here is you probably want to roll these tokens in some sort of fashion, whether it's going directly from the created date, perhaps they roll every three days and then they have to create a new one or every month. Um, and it also depends on also what these tokens are getting access to, right? So in the case of just receiving a bunch of data, you probably don't need to change these tokens very often, right? Because they're not actually making any changes to the backend. So that is another thing to sort of think about. But of course, if you have questions on tokens, on authentication, let me know. Otherwise, let's keep going. So in an effort to simplify our code, we want to actually leverage the REST framework settings. Now, the reason we're leveraging this has to do with the authentication classes and the permission classes in this part. Realistically, we just want to set some defaults there so that no matter what our view is, it goes off of those defaults. And it's more important for authentication and permission, potentially throttling, um, than pretty much anything else. So let's take a look at how we do that. First off, go into the REST framework documentation, scroll down to settings, and we just want to grab the REST framework dictionary here. You can absolutely use these default renderer and parser classes. By all means, check out those on your own. Uh, but for now, we're going to go ahead and bring in our default authentication class. So this right here, I'm going to go ahead and add in this key value as an empty list, and then our default permission classes and also as an empty list. So what is it that we wanna do here? Now the permission classes and the authentication classes I think should be really clear at this point because of what we did in our views. We used authentication classes and permission classes. So the biggest question is, what do we want our default for all of our views to be? Now, in my opinion, for the authentication classes, I don't actually want to rewrite these over and over again. I'm pretty much gonna set my authentication classes for my project and then just change it as needed on any given view. More on that in just a moment. But these are the ones I'm gonna use. So to set them on our settings, we don't actually import the module itself. Instead, we declare a path to that. So in other words, we use rest framework dot authentication, right? So this is the rest framework package, the authentication module and then we do the authentication we want to use. So let's say for instance, session authentication, okay? And then in our actual authentication class, these token authentication class that we customized a little bit, we can also declare that one. So api.authentication.token authentication. And the reason I actually set it up this way is so that if I did want to change back to the default REST API or the REST framework one, I would just do it like that. But I'm gonna leave it in as just simply api.authentication. Now the default permission classes, this is going to be one that we really want to consider uh, for our APIs. Now in my case, what I'm going to do is not the same as what we have on our list create API view. Instead, I'm just going to have the is authenticated or read only, right? So come in here and do rest framework dot authentication that is authenticated or read only. So that means then any data that's going to be posted to my backend, that user is going to be authenticated. This pretty much allows only Git to use on everyone. And of course, they're authenticated against these authentication classes. So the other part of this that you can consider doing is saying that my auth classes, maybe we put them equal to this, and then if debug, I can say my auth classes are, well, literally just the token authentication, you know, something like this. And then I can set that based off of that, right? And this is what I do often to test the configuration from time to time. Now, when we go into production, the way I use production is using different modules, different actual settings modules for 
the production environment. It's going to be very similar to my local environment, but it's going to be slightly different to make sure things are locked down and secure in the way I want. But the nice thing about having settings.py in this way is we can actually use that debug mode, right? So this that should not be on in production, we can actually use it to our advantage in relation to the Django REST framework as well, uh, just like all of the other settings that are in settings.py. But that was just a quick way to look at it. But now that we have this, we have a new thought that comes to mind. And that is, do I need this authentication classes any longer on my view? And the answer is no. In this view in particular, I only need to have these permission classes. That's it. I do not need to add any additional items to this because these are the permissions I want specifically for this API view. Now, if I just wanted all authenticated users to have access to this, boom, there I've got now my authenticated users and they all have access to this. So that's also pretty cool. And this permission, uh, the product detail API view, you know, perhaps I want these same permission classes here as well. And perhaps I want them all across the board on this particular set of API views. Now, right away, you might be like, okay, well, I'm kind of repeating myself and I don't have it in a really, let's say for instance, a really non-redundant way. Like, am I really gonna copy and paste this everywhere I want my staff editor permission to be used? And the answer of course is no. So in the next one, what we're gonna do is actually cover mix-ins so that this is not used over and over again, but rather a mix-in is used on our behalf, a permission mix-in, if you will. Um, and so that is actually how you solve that problem. It's how you solve the problem for a lot of different things, as we'll see. Uh, but the idea here now is we do have a default across the board for authentication and permission. And then if we need to override or change that default, we can do it right on the view itself. At the end of the day, whatever the view says is what's going to be the last line of defense, right? So if the view is empty, for example, it's an empty list here, uh, we just cut off all of our permissions, right? So that is a good or bad thing, potentially, depending on how it is. And that's going to be true for authentication classes as well. So if this is not clear at all, please let me know. Um, hopefully it is. Hopefully it becomes even more clear when we start using mix-ins. But having these defaults are good for all sorts of things. And it's also a good place to test out what ends up happening, like a throttle class. What's a throttle class? What is throttling exactly? Well, throttling, in this case, if you look through it, it's actually just a way to limit the number of requests given a time period, second, minute, hour, day. So that means that one user, let's say, for instance, a logged in user, can only do a thousand requests in a day. Now, I don't think the Django REST framework is necessarily the best place to have your throttles for the API lookups. I actually think it might be a good idea to consider using something like Nginx, where we have additional configuration controls for throttling on our whole project, not just the API, right? This is not going to care at all if they're going to, you know, your local host over and over and over again, unless, of course, that is an API too. Um, so, yeah. And it looks like we have an issue here that we've got in our settings. I'm glad this came up because I wrote authentication. That should say permissions. Okay. And there we go, that solves that problem. Cool, so if you have any questions on the settings or configuration, of course, let me know. I think the documentation does lay this out really well in the places that have default configuration uh, for the REST framework. All right, so now I want to simplify my permission classes by creating a mix-in. Now, let's go ahead and do it first. So the idea here is I want to take this permissions.py from products app and bring it into my APIs app. And I absolutely do want to move it. And luckily VS Code will refactor some things for me, which is really just this right here. It's not anywhere else. But I want to actually now use this staff editor permission just inside the API module itself or this folder here. Now the reason for this is because is staff editor permission, I probably going to use this all throughout my site. Maybe not, but I want to actually at least set myself up for success there. So inside of this API module, I'll also create a mixin. So we'll call it mixins.py. This mixin is going to take in this permission. So we'll go ahead and do from 
dot permissions. We're going to import that permission. And I'll just call this my staff editor mixin. Let's go ahead and just say staff editor permission mixin, just so I know that it is related to the permissions themselves. So again, I'll do my permission classes, and it's going to be equal to that staff editor permission ag again. We also want to go from REST framework. We're going to go ahead and import our permissions here as well. And then I'll go ahead and just do permissions dot is admin user and staff editor permission. Now that I have this mix in, I can just reuse it in any view that needs it. Any view that allows for this permission classes argument to be added. So back into my products views here, we're going to go ahead and import that. So from api.mixins, we're going to import the staff editor permission mixin. And I'll just add it into the different views that need it. And we can do it just like that. Now I no longer need that permission classes. It's actually declared right here and right here. Okay. And we can just repeat that process for each view itself. Now, the reason I'm actually separating the lines like that is just for uh, cleanliness purposes and also PEP8, just to make sure that they are not too long of lines themselves, if I do it correctly. And there we go. Okay. And final one is right here. I'm not sure why it's doing it like that, but let's go ahead and do that. And there we go. Okay, so now I've got that staff editor permission. I can get rid of all these permission classes and I can get rid of all of the unnecessary imports that I probably have here now, which are gonna be, you know, kind of less color here. Just like that, I don't need the authentication one. I have that in by default, I don't need this anymore. And so now it's just a little bit cleaner of views. Um, and granted, I have it say staff editor on there. So hopefully that's really clear to me what's going on. Of course, I can always just go to that definition and see it right there um, and also see the permission itself. And that gives me exactly what I needed. And so we can test this out again. So my user is logged in. They don't have permission to view or edit anything. We go back into the super user and add in those permissions. Let's say staff product editor group. We save that and we refresh in here. And what do you know? It actually gives me all of those permissions back in both places. And so that mixin is just a simple and easy way to do this. Now the question is, can I use mixins for other things? Well, absolutely. You can use mixins for your query set. You can use it for your serializer class. They are a nice way to shortcut rewriting a lot of code over and over and over again, right? Now, in the case of these views, I probably won't actually use this staff editor permission in the future, which is kind of funny. But the idea though, overall is that we do now have this mix in and it's a really easy thing to just add on any view that we want. Now, of course, writing out the permission classes themselves is not that hard to do. Um, and it's also pretty easy to remember maybe overall. Um, but the general reason for this is just to be able to really simply and easily add the permissions that we might need, especially if you want to make a longer list of them. Because the other thing about this now is maybe I'm like, oh, I don't want it to be admin user anymore. I'm going to change it to being a, another custom one that's saying that the username contains, let's say, for instance, I create a new permission called username contains CFE permission or something like that. Now that's the only staff members that have access to this, right? And this is where you could change it on the fly and now it affects all of the views that actually use that permission, which of course has serious implications as well. Because if you make a mistake and maybe you say, just allow any, you know, so like permissions dot allow any, uh, well, that's a problem as well. So it is a convenience, but it also potentially can leave you vulnerable to mistakes like that. Um, but overall, I think this is a, a little bit easier of a way to just use some uh, permissions, but also a way to see how mixins work. Let's take a look at the Django REST framework view sets and routers. They are pretty interesting and let's see why. So inside of the products app here, I'm going to make a new module called viewsets.py. 
Typically speaking, you would actually put your view sets in views.py, but views.py is already pretty full, so we're gonna leave it in viewsets.py. So we're gonna go ahead and do from rest framework, we're gonna go ahead and import our view sets, and then I'll go ahead and do from.models, we're gonna import our product model, and then from.serializers, we're gonna go ahead and import our product serializer. And then we'll go ahead and do class product and view set. And it's a view sets dot view, or rather model view set. And we declare our query set first and product dot objects dot all. Then our serializer class. And this of course is gonna be our product serializer. Now this should already look kind of familiar to you like a, you know, generic API view that we've already seen. Let's say for instance, our product list create view. If I break it down a little bit, we just did these two lines, these two lines. Interesting. So that's actually pretty cool. So we now have a very similar format to something that we've already seen before. I'm also gonna go ahead and put in our lookup field here and leave it in as just point PK. That is of course the default. But now I've got a view set. Let's actually put it into routing so we can have a better sense as to what's going on. So in the root configuration of our Django project, I'm gonna go ahead and create a file called routers.py. And I'm gonna go ahead and create our first routing. Now, overall, I actually would not create routers.py. I'd put everything in urls.py, but I really wanted to separate out the view sets and routers specifically, as we'll discuss. So the first thing that we wanna do is from rest framework.routers, we're gonna import our default router. And I'm gonna go ahead and do from dot products dot view sets. We're gonna import our product view set. All right, so now I'm gonna declare my router and there's gonna be our default router here, an instance of it. And then we just wanna do router dot register and in this case, we'll go ahead and say products. Actually, let's do products dash ABC, just for illustration purposes. Then we use our product view set here, and we'll go ahead and add in a base name of just simply products. Okay, so we now have our router here. Let's go into our URLs. This is, again, our main configuration URLs here. And what I actually wanna do is I wanna update so that my router URLs are actually being used in here. So back into my routers then, I actually am gonna declare URL patterns equals to router.urls, okay? So if we print this statement out, we'll see what that ends up looking like, but let's go ahead and do that. It will be a list of URL patterns which is why I declared this variable here. Uh, but now I actually wanna do something very similar to this products URLs here. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this and paste right underneath. This time I'm gonna do API slash V2, right? So this is my version two of an API. And this of course is gonna be simply in our routers.py. So CFE home dot routers. Okay, so we're gonna go and save that and run our server. Just make sure that the server is still running. And what we wanna do now is take a look at this routing. So we're going back into our URL here and I wanna go into API slash V2 and hit enter. So API V2, I went to the root of that. And what do you know? I actually have products dash ABC and it goes into API slash V2 products ABC. If I click on that, what I see here, uh, looks like maybe I misspelled serializer class. Let's go back into our view set itself. And sure enough, I did. Hmm, there we go, save that, refresh. Hey, what do you know? I've got product list in here and I can even create something. Again, I'm not in the other products URLs. I'm in V2, right? And so the routing here then is well, this is the prepend path. This is the root path that's gonna be right here. And then if we wanted to see individual instances, we need to change our serializer a little bit. So let's go back into our serializer. I'm gonna go ahead and add in the PK value here. We're gonna save that and refresh into our list view. And what we see is the primary key. So now I can actually more easily go 
to that detail view, hit enter. And what do you know? I see product instance. It's actually giving me things about this particular product. Again, this is all coming from the view set, this you know, few lines of code, and this routers. So granted, I did print out these routers.url, and in our running server, we can see what that print statement does. It's different URL patterns that are actually coming through in here. These URL patterns are very similar to what we manually did in urls.py, like this. They are different because of how the view sets actually route every kind of request, but they're not that much different. So if we think of a product view set, what it ends up doing is we have a get method to get the list of items, which is you know just the query set. And then we also have a get method to get the, the retrieve a item, which is of course the product instance, like detail view, if you will. We also have something to post an item. This of course is to create something, so new instance. We also have put, which is to update. We have patch, which is to partial update. We have delete, which is, or rather destroy. No, delete, which is to destroy. Right. So the HTTP method is delete. These are all the HTTP methods, and these are the actual sort of functions that are being called when we run that. What do I mean by functions? Well, all of this is very similar to what we did with our product mixin view. We have these three mixins in this case, but if I added additional mixins and updated the HTTP methods accordingly, then I would have my own view set. That's essentially what's happening here. Then once I do have a view set, I then bring it in as a router. This is how I make all of the URLs that it correspond to this view set. Now, naturally, we'd probably put it in as products, so then it's more closely related to our other API views, right? So there's V2, and if I just go into products, there's V1. It's the same data overall, it's just how the endpoints work are just slightly different. So the reason I actually don't use view sets very often is because of how these routing ends up working. Router.url doesn't give me the granular control I personally like over my URLs. I like declaring exactly what my URLs are and where they go. Now I realize some of you that end up using view sets a lot start to research more about it and understand that there is an actual pattern that you can know right off the bat on how they end up working. But the thing is, view sets have a lot of features that we can do with them, which I'll show you in a moment. So this routers here doesn't really show me anything about the URLs themselves. Now, you might be saying the same thing about this include thing here on either one, but it actually does point to a place where actual URLs are declared right here. Okay, so now I wanna show you why I really don't use view sets. And it has to do with using a different kind of view set that sort of breaks the patterns, if you will. Um, and so let's go ahead and create one. I'm gonna go ahead and call this my uh, product, and we'll just call this our product generic view set. And this is gonna take in view sets dot generic view set. And again, I will declare these items here. But this time what I wanna do is instead of all the CRUD methods, I only want a few of them, and that's maybe these two, right? So I'll go ahead and get rid of these four here. Now I just wanna have support for these two. Now at this point, it's a generic view set, which the model view set does inherit from. So just like our generic view, this right here, we can actually use mixins. I'm gonna use the list model mixin and the retrieve model mixin. So again, going back in here, we'll go ahead and change this or import mixins rather, and then just add in our mixins here. And I'll tab them over. And so there I've got my mixins now, and we have a different view set. I'll go ahead and go into my routers and just change my view set in here. We'll save that. Now, when I go to my products list, I refresh in here. It only has two supported endpoints. That is products and the detail view, so the list view and the detail view, which you can actually see in the printed URLs. There are uh, other, other URLs that are actually in there, like the API root, 
but that's more related to the router itself, not the generic view sets. But everything that's related to the generic view sets has to do with this default router, right? So it's only those two endpoints. And well, what do you know? Without printing that out, there's really no good way to see all of the URLs that are currently being supported by whatever this generic view set is, right? So yes, there is yet another way to help clarify what that would end up being uh, by turning a view set then into actual, uh, you know, actual variables themselves by saying something like product list is this generic view set dot as view. And we would say something like get and list, right? So this is now that product list. And then I could do product or product, let's call it product list view. And then I could do product detail view, very similar. And then this one would just be retrieve. And now I can actually use these as view functions, very similar to my URLs like I did here. Um, in fact, that's actually part of the reason I wanted to show you how to do these as view. Some people end up doing this, not just in generic API views or any of these kind of views that we've used, as well as also in view sets. Cool. So like I said, personally, I really like using views.py and how I did it, all these generic views, so that I have a very granular insight into how my URLs are routed. That doesn't mean you can't use view sets and you can't customize them to work really, really well, because you totally can. And as you get more and more experienced, perhaps using view sets will be the method that you end up going about it. Um, I personally don't end up using them very often, uh, but there are still really interesting ideas and something that might be well researching um, a little bit more. Okay, so the other part of all of this is actually how we're serializing this data. Because on one hand, our code maybe doesn't give us the granular insight into any given URL, uh, but the data that's being serialized, as in like our list views, either one, needs to actually show us maybe an endpoint, an actual URL that I can use to review this data. So there's a number of things that we wanna do with serializers, uh, and that will come very soon. Now we're gonna go ahead and add in URLs to our serializer so that we can actually get the detail view or any of the other views we need inside of our product list view. So let's go ahead and take a look at how to do this fairly simply within our product serializer. The first way, the wrong way I would do is by copying my discount, go ahead and create it as a new field and we'll just call it URL. And then I will create this serializer method itself with URL, OBJ, and this is just gonna return the path to it. So API products and obj.id or really obj.pk and hit slash. Okay, so if I refresh in here, there we go. I've got a path now that brings me to where that ended up being. And of course, if you had the correct uh, you know, base URL, you could use that path and that will give you the detail view, cool. But this of course is flawed because if I change all of my API to the version two, that view sets thing, then well, this would have to be manually updated. Of course, with one serializer, one model, it's not really that big of a deal to change it like this, but most projects don't have one serializer and one model. They have a lot of serializers and a lot of models. So what we wanna do then is change this get URL method to be, well, a little bit more effective. So to do that, we can go ahead and say from rest underscore framework and import reverse. And what this will allow me to do is basically make this same line here, but do it using a command called reverse. Now this command is actually a little bit different than the default Django one. So what we wanna do first is actually get the request from this serializer. So self.context.get this request. Now, why is it that it's a get method and it's not something like just simply, you know, self.request? Well, this has to do with how serializers can work. They don't always have the request. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. It really depends on the context that you give it. Now, luckily the context where we're using inside of generic views, they will have the request. So all of the context we've done so far will have the request. It's more like when you actually start using manual things to declare serializers like this right here or this right here, 
um, that's when you'll start to need to uh, add the request as a additional argument. But since I have this request, I can say if request is none, then I'll just return, you know, maybe none. We'll just return that we don't know what the URL is. But of course, if the request is not none, we can use it as an argument. So we'll put it in here as an argument. I also need to declare the actual view name and the keyword args that I'm going to be using. So the keyword args are going to be our primary key. And that is going to be, of course, our obj.pk. Okay, so let me break this down a little bit. What are these keyword arguments related to? And what is it that I'm reversing? Well, really, I'm going into the URLs, these URL patterns here, and I'm reversing this pattern right here. So pk is the name of the keyword argument. Uh, what do you know? Keyword argument. And so I just need to give this path a name as well. So I'll go ahead and name it product-detail. This is the common way to name it. The model name, lowercase, dash, detail for a detail view. For the list view, it's going to be more like name, product, list. Shocking. Now, the update and destroy view, those aren't always going to be their own endpoints. A lot of times they are actually baked into the product detail view, which you totally could have yourself. We're not going to worry about that right now. Instead, we're going to worry about this one single URL. And now I've got the product dash detail in here. So I can save that and we can look at our API again. And we got a module, module object is not callable and made a little mistake here. This should be from a rest framework dot reverse import reverse. Save that and refresh again. And there we go. Now it's not just a path, but it's an absolute URL. It's the entire URL that goes there. And of course, if we click on it, uh, it'll bring me to that detail. And this is true for any of these as we see here. So that is another way to do it. And you betcha, there is yet a, another way to do it. So what I actually do is I'll change this one to just being called get edit URL. And we will change the product detail to product edit. Okay, go back into our URLs and name product edit. All right. There we go. And so I'll call this my edit URL now and this my edit URL. Save it and of course that all works. Maybe. Let's try that again. Looks like I might have to restart my server. And there we go. Okay, so now I have an edit URL. Let's go ahead and do the final method, which is the preferred method. And that is by saying URL equals to serializers dot hyperlinked identity field this is going to be our view name now. This is product detail. Hey, what do you know? View name. Uh, we had the view name right here too. Interesting. So I'll go ahead and separate this out a little bit. Next, we can do our lookup field. And this, of course, is going to be our primary key. Now, the hyperlinked identity field only works on a serial model serializer. It's like a shortcut to doing it where a serializer method field works anywhere. In fact, you can also then have all of these different URLs running from that. Uh, and then, of course, once we declare a field up here, we actually need to add it in to our fields right there, which is what this error is. And we refresh in here. Now we've got that URL. So that's one way or, well, three ways on how we can actually declare these various URLs. Now, every once in a while, you may or may not want to have these URLs show up. So perhaps the detail view, you don't want the URLs showing up. You just want some additional context or less context in there. And that's when you create a new serializer for that particular view, right? Uh, so going back into the you know detail view here, we would just change the serializer to being the product detail serializer. Now, this is also pretty interesting too, because a detail view might have, well, a lot more detail. It might have a lot more fields. So I'll leave it up to you on how you want to go about changing that. Uh, but now what do we want to do is, I just want to verify that since I added these two fields, that it's not going to cause an issue for me when I create something. So going back into the list view, if I scroll down to the bottom, there's no URL field here. So let me just go ahead and say hello world again, again, or again, gain and hit post. 
And sure enough, it does create it for me and those URLs are in there. As in, I didn't have any errors because I didn't also provide a URL field. We still need to see what does it look like if I have an additional field that's required that perhaps maybe isn't in the product model itself. Let's take a look at that in the next one. Here is a very hypothetical situation that potentially could happen. That is, what if every time you create a new product, you want to have a one-off email sent to somebody? So in your product serializer, you decide that, hey, let's go ahead and do email equals to serializers.email field, and we can pass in this thing called write only. Write only, of course, means that it will literally only write to it versus read only will only read it. Now, if I don't put write only in there and let's put this in our product fields list here and we refresh in products, I get this error because that field does not exist on the product instance. So changing it to write only presents a pretty cool, unique opportunity and that it says, hey, it's no longer showing up. So if I scroll down to the actual HTML form on the browsable API, I see that email is now in here. And of course, if I try to post data, I get an error. It says, this field cannot be blank. Hmm, interesting. So let's go ahead and send our pretend email to somebody. We're saying, hey, we're gonna add this and I'm gonna go ahead and add an email and say, hello there, ABC person exclamation mark or hello there random person, you know, whatever. I'm gonna go ahead and hit post and let me try that again. Oh, what the heck is this? Got a type error when calling product.objects.create. Now, of course, the thing about a product serializer is it will take this data and then create it in the product model itself. So what we can do is we can actually see how this is done in a serializer by overriding the default method. That default method is simply create. It takes in self and validated data. And what it does by default, assuming this data is validated, we'll talk about validation in a little bit, but we've already seen it. We just saw it actually. And that is when we went to post this, this is validating that data. So this create method will take in that validated data and then you can actually Imagine it going, you know, product and then dot objects dot create and unpacking that validated data. This is what it's doing by default for this instance. Now, another way to write that same thing is just to return back the default value or what the inherited class is, the model serializer, what that actually does, as in validated data. And so I can absolutely run something like this. Let's go ahead and take a look at this a little bit. I'm gonna just call it an object and I'll return back object. Now, I still have that email field in here, so let's go ahead and pop that thing out. I'll go ahead and say email equals to validated data dot pop email. And I'll go ahead and print out email and OBJ. We'll save it and we'll have a look. In our products app again, we'll go ahead and run this. ABC at whatever, doesn't actually matter. It just has to be somewhat of a valid email format. A title and post. Hey, what do you know? It actually created it, interesting. And if we look in here, we've got a product object and the email. So what do you know? I can now actually send that email in here. Now, that was merely meant as a somewhat arbitrary practical example. This is not the only place we could do this, of course, right? So we could actually do it in the perform create method as well, uh, and just make sure that when we are calling serializer.save, it's doing something very similar. I actually wanna see and test that assumption. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this validate data part and this email part, leave it sort of as to what it was. Now what I'm gonna do is come back into our serializer here, and say email equals to serializer.validateddata.pop. Okay, let's see if this works on the view itself. Not on the serializer anymore, but just the view. So come back in here. Let's go ahead and create one uh, on the list create view, of course. ABC at whatever.com, some random title. I hit post 
And what do you know? It still works. So that's because of this save method here. Serializer.save is being called, well, in two places. In the view itself, calls serializer.save. Serializer.save, if there isn't an instance, will run this create method. If there is an instance, it's going to run another method called update. Update, which takes in self, the actual instance itself, and validated data. And that, of course, will update the instance itself. So it would do something like instance.title equals to validated data, or let's spell that correctly, validated data dot get title, and then it's just going to return the instance like that. Uh, so that's the default. You don't actually have to call save again. It will save it for us, um, which is pretty interesting. So in other words, serializer.save is very similar to like form.save or model.save. Those work very, very similar if you're familiar with those in Django. And hopefully you're at least a little familiar. And if you're not, just realize that we can run the instance itself. We can update it. We can do all sorts of things in here, especially when it comes to this content, right? So on the list create API view, sure, I actually added in a default value for this validated data. This actually would probably be better served in the serializer that I use when I run the create method, as in it would probably be better in here. That's not something I'm gonna worry about right now, um, but there is one thing that I wanted to show you, which is related to the update method for that email. If for some reason you have this kind of silly contrived example going, um, you would then run that same validate data pop, and then you could update instance data if you want to, or you could just run the super method and say update instance and validated data. This will just ensure that that email gets popped out of here um, if you end up using it. Okay, so this was really meant as an example, not something that's really that practical, but an example of two things. One, some arbitrary field that you might want. And of course it would be then in your list of fields here. And then of course the other part, really diving into the create and update methods in any given serializer. And the validated data, of course, is the data that's being sent to the serializer to be cleaned, validated, and then the instance or the actual model itself will be called as needed. So of course, if you have questions on this, let me know. This is gonna be something that you're gonna to wanna to play around with on your own and realize it does work in conjunction with this perform create on any given view. Realistically, you might be wondering, what would I do if I was running um, this perform create method? I actually would pretty much very rarely change this perform create. Um, this I don't often have to change. It's usually done in the serializer itself because it can also get the request method in that serializer too. So we'll probably revisit those methods again, um, but for now, we're just gonna leave it as is so you have a better understanding of create and update and also adding additional fields. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and look at custom validation with our serializers. It's pretty straightforward, but we're gonna look at a few different ways and approaches on how you could do it. Now, the first approach, the simplest approach, I think, is to go directly into any kind of serializer, whether it's a model serializer or just a standard Django REST framework serializer. To do this, we pick the field that we want to validate our data from, right? So to do this, we just come in here and we define validate and then the field name, whatever that field name is. So in our case, let's say for instance, our title here, I'm gonna go ahead and say validate title. This takes in self and value, and then we want it to return the value. So this is the actual past value in here, the value that you know is being submitted when we use this model serializer, whether it's the create method or the update method. That's kind of the idea. It's not for the read only, right? It's not for the reading side of things. It's only for when we are actually needing to validate the data, clean it up and make sure it's okay to save. That's the idea. So in here with our validate underscore some field title, we can do all sorts of interesting things here. So the first one, maybe this is what you would do is actually saying product.objects.filter title underscore exact equals to that value. So this is gonna look a query set up in our database to see if this title that I'm passing in exists 
on my project somewhere. So if we say if qs.exists, then we'll go ahead and raise serializers.validation error. This, or let's say for instance, use the f string here. So value is already a product name. Simple enough. So we're gonna go ahead and save that. Let's make sure that our server is running still. Sure enough, it is. And we can validate it now in our products list create. Let's go ahead and create one with hello world and hit post. This time it created it, right? So um, there's an issue that we'll talk about in a second, uh, but let's go ahead and create another one and hit post. This time it says hello world is already a product name. Now, if we go back into our list here, um, we have other ones that have hello world in here. And also, well, this one has an exclamation mark, right? So it does have hello world sort of existing, but look at this, we've got hello world. Now this is where knowing query set lookups is really, really important. So if you do I exact, that's case insensitive, so now if we come back in here and say, hello world, and I'll do an exclamation mark, hit post. Now I've already got that product name. And so if we look for that, hello world with an exclamation mark on a Chrome search, the you know casing doesn't matter, but inside of our query set, it does. So yeah, we would definitely wanna have the I exact in here. Um, most likely. You don't always have to do that, but I think it's a good way to validate the title to just ensure that it's unique, okay? So another way to do this is, let's go ahead and comment this out. I'm actually going to copy it. I'm gonna create a, another module here called validators.py. Now validators are useful in many contexts, not just the like validators for the Django REST framework, but also you can create validators directly for a model. You can create validators for model forms as well. But in this case, I'm gonna just validate this title and use it only for the REST framework. So what I wanna do is I wanna import the serializer. So from REST framework, we're gonna go ahead and import our serializers. And then we'll also do from not models, import product. Okay. so. This is the same idea here. We don't need this anymore. We now have this same concept, but then going back into my serializer, the way I apply it, well, on one hand, I could absolutely apply it by putting it in this method here. Or what I could do is I could declare title equals to serializers dot character field and add in validators, a list of validators that I'm gonna use. Okay, so then now I can go from dot validators, we can import our new validator, validate title. Okay, so we save that. Now it's just changed the location a little bit. So let's go ahead and run that again. So hello world, exclamation mark, hit post. And what do you know, it's already a product name. All right, so that is two different methods on doing it. One is an external one that we actually put into a title field. Now you're probably wondering, wait, wait a minute, how did this end up happening? We'll talk about that in a second. Then the other one is inline. Now, most of the time you'll probably do this right here, or better yet, you'll have it right on the model. So if there's already a validator on the model, then, well, you don't necessarily have to worry about creating additional validators for the Django REST framework. Personally, I put validators on models as much as possible, especially with something that I want like the title to be unique. But you know what? Every once in a while, you might need it inside of the serializer itself because of the concept of request context. So in the case of a request, this is not something we'll actually end up doing, but let's go ahead and just take a look at it. Self.context.get and the request. Now I can actually say my user equals to that request.user. And if I did have a foreign key relationship in here, I could now say user equals to that. And this is actually another thing that I'll do a lot within validation, which I think is also fairly important on how to execute things. Um, I mean, realistically, it's for that user, right? Um, 
of course, the validation still works, but there is another method of validating a uniqueness. And let's take a look at that now. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to call it just unique product title. And what this does is we're going to go ahead and from the rest framework validators, we're going to import the unique validator. Okay, so the unique validator now, we pass in a query set with this, which is going to be product objects all. Okay, so now I have yet another one. This one, on the other hand, now what I want to say is, let's call this validate title no hello, or something like that, right? So we'll go ahead and now say if hello in value dot lower, this is when I'll raise this error and say something like hello is not allowed. And you might imagine like, you know, this could also be an email extension and saying like, oh, these email extensions are not allowed and stuff like that. So definitely play around with these values. Uh, but the nice thing about this is I now have two validators that do somewhat practical things, I suppose. So in my serializers then, of course, I want to bring in the validate title no hello, and I can put this in here. And then I also want to bring in my unique product title. Okay. Save that. Oops, let's make sure we're importing that. In fact, I'm going to change it to import the validators themselves, and then we'll just do the dot notation. Okay, so now we refresh in here, I run this again, and now I have actually two items that are coming through, two types of validation. Again, this is very, very common on Django models, so you probably have seen this before, maybe you have, maybe you have it. But the other part of this is what we did right here. Okay, so I actually redeclared what this title field should represent. So when we look at the actual documentation, we see all these different fields here, right? So let's say, for instance, I change this to being a email field, saved that, and then refresh in here and run it again. Now it's giving me a new validation. It's now validating whether or not this is an email address, which of course our title, we don't actually want it to be an email address, but it's cool that we can change it on the fly. Now, this is very, very common is to change these things. Now, another thing that you might end up doing Let's say, for instance, so let's put it back to our character field here. Let's go ahead and say name. And I'm going to go ahead and do serializers.char field again. This time I'm going to give it a source. This is going to be title. And we'll call this read only being true. So we save that and let's go ahead and go into the detail now. And oops, I forgot to add it into my fields here. So the cool thing about the REST framework is if you declare fields here, in especially in a model serializer, you need to make sure that you also declare it in this list here. It tells you that all the time. And so I refresh in here now, check this out. So I, I now have two fields that are identical, just with a different key value, you know, or a field name, right? So um, this is incredibly practical. And all I did was use source to grab that title. Now, the only reason I showed you this is mainly because we used this to override the default for our title. So it's just a little dive into what else you can do with that. Um, the other cool thing is you can use foreign key relationship in here as well. So if you did something like this and you had a user attached to the model, which we don't, then you could definitely do something like user.email. Pretty cool. Um, so that's custom validation with serializers. Definitely play around with it a lot more because you may or may not want to use these things uh, from time to time. Now, in my case, I have this validate title. This is an invalid item here, so I don't want it any longer, but it is um, something nice to know about uh, because especially when you start having a bunch of users generating content for this REST API, we want to actually start locking that down. So let's talk about that in the next one. Now we're going to go ahead and update our product model so a user is actually attached to it. So I'll go ahead and say user equals to models.foreignKey. And we want to, of course, use the user model 
So to do this, we'll do from django.conf, we're gonna import settings, and we want to use user equals to settings.auth user model. This is really just ends up being a string to auth.user, uh, but this is the preferred method to do it, especially because customizing the user model is not uncommon. It's actually very well supported in Django. But we're gonna use the default user model. And in this case, I definitely wanna have it on here, but I'm gonna go ahead and declare the on delete method, which is something you'll have to do. Now, in this case, I'll go ahead and say set null, okay? Um, we could do set default because I actually want it to be my default user, but I'm actually gonna say that no user owns it if it is deleted, or rather if the user itself is deleted, I don't want to delete all the associated products. So I'll go ahead and allow null being true. But notice that I have blank being false and I still have a default. So the default is gonna be the very first user, which of course assumes that I actually have a very first user, which of course we do. So I made some changes to my models. So I definitely need to run python manage.py make migrations and python manage.py migrate. Okay, no huge surprise there. Now with that, um, let's go ahead and take a look at some of these models. So inside of our admin, if we go to any of these, we should be able to see that now that user model is associated to my super user. Okay. So I still have my staff user logged in here and they still have access to a lot of this stuff. So what I wanna do is enrich my serializer a little bit with that user. So I'll go ahead and say user actually just into the fields. I'll put it at the very top, save that and refresh in here. And so there's our user. Okay, user one. Staff user is not user one. Let's just verify that inside of our views what I want to do is for the product list create view, this is where I'm going to go ahead and say define, and we're going to go ahead and call get query set. And it's going to take in self. And what I want here is the request, which is self.request. On the view, it's self.request. On the serializer, if the request is attached to it, it's self.context.get request just a slight difference, but the view will definitely have the request. The serializer may or may not. So with this, I can print out the request.user. And for now, I'll just go ahead and return the default get query set method here. And whenever in doubt of the arguments that go into any given method, instance method, I always put in the args and keyword args and bring those down as well. Okay, so at this point, hopefully it'll just show me a requested user. So I refresh on my staff user, and then I look in here, I see that it says staff, great. So what this means then is I can take the default query set, which is gonna go to this, and I can filter that down. So I can return qs.filter, and request.user is of course gonna be our user here. Let me comment this out, okay? And so there's our query set. We know that they're logged in because we have staff editor permission mix in, which of course, if we forgot what that was, we could just go look at it, is admin user. These are the permissions in here. And then of course the default would be the authentication. But since we have those permission, I think we can feel good that this view, uh, that we can definitely use this request user. Of course, if we didn't, we would do something more like this and say if user is authenticated, then we would maybe return that filter or better yet, if they're not authenticated, then we could do product.objects and then dot none. And that would return an empty list, but it's still of that model class. Okay. So now let's go ahead and take a look at what happens from this. If I refresh in this product list create API, I have nothing, I have absolutely no products whatsoever. This of course is on purpose, right? So we're actually seeing only the items that this staff user is associated to, right? Now in this case, it is a staff user. So, you know, perhaps we want to filter it in a different way, like perhaps that we want to see if they're a part of a certain group or something like that. Um, that's getting a little bit more advanced than we need to. Realistically, this is just about who actually owns the products in there. 
uh, or really the query set that's in there, which I think is very clear now. But of course, we now have a new problem, and that's this right here, this user data. I absolutely do not want that. The other part is we also want to make sure that when we are saving this data and it is there is a request user and we do have a user foreign key, now what we can do is in this perform create method, much like I mentioned up here, we can now say user equals to self.request.user, okay? So now I've got that. What I'm gonna do is just really quickly on my serializers.py, I'm gonna go ahead and comment out the user on here, right? Since I am the user that owns this data, like the query set that's associated now, in my view, is only directly to me. So I don't actually need my own information on the serializer data, uh, not exactly at least. We will come back to that in the next one. But uh, for now, now I've got this title here and I'll go ahead and say, hello world, my old friend, exclamation mark, hit post. Notice that it's not allowed. I got hello is not allowed, which is kind of funny. So let's go ahead and look at our validators here. This of course is not giving me my proper validation. Okay, so let's try that again. And again, hello is not Allowed. Great. So the validation is working. So I'll go ahead and just say product ABC and we'll hit submit. And I'll hit it again. Must be unique. Great. We're seeing some good stuff here. Let's go back into my other user and do the same thing. And I'm going to call this product ABC and hit post. Wait a minute. It worked. They're the same thing. So what we have here is a problem with this particular product unique validator. When we did it up here on our own, we didn't have that problem. So what we can do here is we can actually change the lookup to being I exact. We can just change that right in that unique validator. And refresh in here, and now it's saying it must be unique, but um, of course if I do A, B, and then lowercase c, let's try that one because it already did create the other one. And of course, that's saying unique as well. And we could try this all again by, you know, deleting those last three products and saying I'm sure and try it again with either user. There's the first user and then the second user. I'll put it all lowercase and we run it again. Cool. Still unique. So now we have our data associated to a particular user with any given query set. So this lookup right here something that I personally like doing is using it as a mix-in as well. So instead of having, as we see here, we've got our, I, I really, it's just gonna be this. I don't, I probably don't even need that. Um, but basically I would come in and I'm gonna put it in my main mix-ins here. And I would say class user query set mix-in and then define git query set and again, we're going to go ahead and return the default. So args and keyword args here. So we can say the user field is user. Okay, so the actual user field will end up doing. So this means then that my data or let's say my lookup data is going to be equal to an empty dictionary. So we'll do the lookup data and then this is going to be self.user field, and this is going to be equals to self.request.user. Okay. If you're not familiar with this method, well, this is maybe new to you. And so now that we've got that, let's go ahead and grab the default query set, which is going to be super. And we'll go ahead and just run get query set dot get query set and args keyword args. And then we'll just return qs.filter and then unpack the lookup data based off of that user field that we added in here. We'll save it as is. Now I'm gonna go ahead and use this user query set mixin, query set like that actually. That's usually how query sets are written. So back into our view, I will import this one. So let's go ahead and put it just like that. And so 
here we go. I'm going to bring it in right above this one. It actually doesn't matter as long as it's be above this. Now what I can do is comment this out, save that, and we'll look at products list. We don't need to submit the form data, but we'll look at the list. I'm getting none back. So let's go ahead and verify our mix in here. And first off, we'll go ahead and print out our lookup data. And then I'm gonna go ahead and print out my query set and refresh in there and take a look. So I've got a full query set in here that's coming through. And I also have my user data. Okay, so there's a good chance that this user has no data. So I'll go ahead and say product new post. And we take a look again. Sure enough, there it is. Great. So if I wanted to change my user field in my view, I can now come in here and say user field equals to, let's say owner, for example. And I refresh in here and now it's saying it can't resolve that. These are the only options that you have, user being one of them. So that's another reason to, to use mixins and to just have a better understanding of how all of this stuff works in concert together. So now that I've got this user query set mix in, I can use it anywhere else I need to have the query set narrowed down. So I keep in that default query set on purpose so that I can go off of that essentially, right? So then in my mix in, it's actually going to have some sort of default that it's grabbing. And this lookup here, something that it's doing is basically saying lookup data is equal to the dictionary of whatever this field string ends up being. So if it's owner, it's going to be owner. And then that's based off of the self.request.user. And this is a quick and easy way to do that. And then of course, when you want to unpack it, you just do this and that turns that self.user field equaling to self.request.user as the actual filter in there. Um, so just a nice and cool way to do that. And then of course, back into our views, everywhere we, we need to actually run a query set related item, we could come in here and do that. I won't worry about the product mix in view, but here we go. So now if I go into this products here, I got product 34, staff user can see it, this user cannot. Okay, so this works somewhat in concert with the actual permissions. So here's the biggest flaw as to how it currently works and this mix in. It has to do with our actual permissions here. Um, so if we think back to our views, if I wanted to have, or let's actually think back to our uh, permissions again, is staff editor permission, right? So if they have permission to edit every product, but our mix-in on the other hand actually changes our query set, then we kind of need to think differently about the query set itself. So what I do then is basically if, well, let's go ahead and declare our user, and this still is gonna be self.request.user. And now if the user is staff, I'm just gonna return the query set. And we'll set that equal to user. Okay, so this will just return that default. And this should say is admin rather. This will return that default. So if we refresh, or no, it's this def. No mistake. Okay. So in the CFE user, they can now see this stuff. Uh, the owner can see it as well. Uh, so it's kind of that combination, right? So uh, again, you could also do allow staff view being true or false. And so then if self.allow staff view and user is staff, then we can take a look at this. And of course, if I come through and just change this allow staff view on any given view, let's go into the list view again, to being false, then it's gone. So in my case, I am gonna actually come back to my mix in and keep that as false. Right. I want to keep it as false because you want to have the least amount of permissions as default. Now, this is just a simple way, even though it might not feel simple, it's a simple way to have a little bit more robustness in your system. 
But by all means, you can absolutely write Git query set on the views that you need to based off of any given user. But through my experience, I just feel like only writing it one time and then using a mix in over and over wherever I need to narrow down a query set based off of the requested user, this is a simple way to do that. And I also wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of other packages that potentially could do that as well for us. Um, but I'm not going to worry about that now. I really just wanted to show you how to uh, grab requested user data first and then how to make it a little bit more efficient overall. Now we're going to take a look at how to do a related field serialization or foreign key serialization. Now it starts with this. We've got a product lookup. The user can be attached to that lookup. So if I look at this user, there's that user and here's the product object, right? So those two have a relation. Now from the user, I can also find all of the related products that are associated to that user. So that's a reverse relationship. Now, what we can do is we can actually, well, enrich our serializer data based off of this relationship. We've already seen it basic, right? So if I do user like that, I can refresh in here and I can see my user, right? On every one, every single one now has the user, but more specifically, it has the user ID. That's what it does by default. Now, on one hand, we could use the serializer method field, right? So if I came in here and said something like, you know, my user data, and I went in and did serializer dot serializer method field. We'll go ahead and say read only being true. That way we don't try to write this data. And then I can use define, you know, get that user data, get underscore whatever we named that field. And it's gonna be self and object. I can now return, let's say a dictionary based off of the user. So let's say username is obj dot username. Right. And in fact, I could do a lot of other stuff with this serializer method field. We'll actually bring that back shortly. Uh, but that, of course, is not what we want. We don't actually want to use that field, my user data, at yet. Right. And product has no attribute username. This should be pro object a user a username. Uh, but, anyways, so now we've got that. And what do you know? It shows this up. Now, this is not the preferred method. This is not the recommended method for serializing related field data. Instead, what we can do is create a new serializer. So in my API, I'm going to go ahead and create a general user serializer in here. So serializers.py. Now, generally speaking, for user related things, I would actually create an entire app that's dedicated to the user. Uh, but I want to just simplify things and make it only in the API because what we're going to do here is incredibly simple. So let's go ahead and do from REST framework. We're going to go ahead and import serializer. And then I'm going to just declare a class user public serializer. As in, this is going to be public data that is serializer dot just serializer. That's it. That's all I actually need. So I'll go ahead and say username equals to serializers dot char field or character field read only being true. And this should be serializers, not serializer. Silly. Okay, so we've got our username field here. Now let's bring in this serializer to my other one. So we'll go ahead and do from api.serializers import our user public serializer. And with this, I can now use it very much like I use all of these other fields. I can go ahead and say user equals to user public serializer. We initialize it with the parentheses. Let me just break this down so you can see how it relates. And again, we can declare read only being true. Now, the reason that I have a read only here as well as here is because on the serializer itself, I'm going to declare which things I want to be read only. And then when I reuse that serializer, I also might want to declare which things are going to be read only. But now that we have this, if I refresh into any product itself, I have more insight or more detail related to any particular user. So naturally we can go even further than that. I could go ahead and change this to being simply owner and then changing the source to user just like that. So then I would come down here and change the field name to owner as well. And that's a quick and easy way to just change who this is or what this represents, even though I didn't change the model at all. 
Um, so it gives us a lot of flexibility in how we actually display this data, right? Then I also mentioned this email field here. You can also bring in user data this way as well. So if you wanted to actually source out some data, uh, there we go. In this case, I don't actually have an email, uh, but that is a way to do it. And this should probably be email field, not character field. Uh, but that would be a way to show that up. Now, of course, I actually don't want to have user related data like this. If I'm going to associate the user, I would put all of that data in their serializer itself. And more, more realistically, I probably won't ever put emails at, in a public serializer either. Um, so in any case, let's go ahead and take a look at maybe some other field data we might want. Let's say, for instance, ID, and I'll go ahead and do serializers.integer field. And again, read only being true. We save that and we refresh in here. And what do you know? There's my ID. So this is a basic serializer. Notice that there's nothing model related. So if I come into saying something like my serializer method field in here, what's going to happen? Well, let's go ahead and say related or other products, for example, right? Something like this, serializer method field, other products, define get other products, self and object, and then we'll go ahead and return an empty list. I want to just print out the object itself. Save that and refresh in here. It shows other products. It shows Steph. What do you know? It's actually still working. I have never imported the user model at all here. It's still working. So I can actually declare this. The user is equal to that object. So I can have products in here now and say something like the query set that I want is going to be product.objects.all or not. No, it's going to be all the related products. So it'd be something like my products equals to user dot product set dot all. This is how that foreign key relationship works, right? Now you're like, wait a minute, I actually want to show my products here. Now you might be like, oh, I'm going to go ahead and import from products dot serializers. I'm going to import the product serializer now. And now we're going down a rabbit hole. That's not a good idea. But I will explain how to do this. So what I'm doing here is I'm importing the public serializer from api.serializers. Then in API serializers, I'm trying to import that product serializer. Even if somehow I could do those imports correctly, I have some conflicts with how they're imported. There's a circular import here. They're both importing the same thing. But the other problem is that I have also a nested import. So this user public serializer is in that product serializer that product serializer perhaps or that user public serializer maybe we want to use that product serializer that's of course not what i want to do so um, without getting too much in the weeds on that let's actually just create a class and i'll say user product inline serializer and this is going to be again serializers dot serializer and then what do we want here well uh, one is going to be our url and maybe our title so serializers.char field. Again, read only being true, and then read only being true. So here's our user product inline serializer. That is gonna serialize this data in theory. I'll explain why this is probably not good practice, but I will put it in here. And I'm gonna actually gonna limit the number in here also uh, up to maybe five. So five related products. So to use these things together, what I could do is I can actually pass in that query set and also pass in the argument of many being true. And then I can say data. So this query set here. Now, if I refresh in my product, I get this extra thing here. I need the request argument. Okay, so I actually need the request in this serializer. So this actual serializer doesn't work with my URL identity field. So let me just get rid of that for a moment so I can at least show you that this part works. Okay, so, so far it's working. Let me bring this hyper link identity field back in and actually get that working as well, if it's possible. So we'll go ahead and say request equals to self.context.get the request there we go now to add that context in here 
And actually, it would probably just be easier to do context equals to self.context. So it gets the same context as the user public serializer. So we save that and refresh. And what do you know? Now I have a nested, nested serializer. This is even more clear when we look at my other user. And we can see each entry here has the owner and some other products. It's pretty neat, I think. Now this right here, I don't think is actually that practical realistically um, in this case, right? Like if you're gonna be looking at all of the products that you have, uh, why would you need to look at some of the other products that you have? Um, so in other words, how our view is currently set up for this, we have the user query set mix in that's narrowing down the query set based off of the user. Why would we then also need to see not only that, yeah, I am the owner of this, but also all this other data that potentially could come through. That wasn't really the point of this one. The point of this one was to show you how to bring in some nested data, some nested serialized data, and a lot of it, right? So on one hand, this is these two things is probably a little bit more practical, even if it's your data, right? So something like this. That's, that's probably very practical, I would say. You have your data in there, and also if you changed it to where the permissions are different so other members of the staff can actually come in and see who's the owner. Now, actually being able to serialize a lot of different data can be useful um, and maybe in a way that is a view specifically dedicated to other kinds of products, right? But I really just wanted to show you that you can do it in here. Now, the other thing is in our product serializer here, you know, perhaps we also want to do something very similar. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab this user product inline serializer and I'll paste this in here. This time I'll go ahead and say product inline serializer, very similar still. And I'll go ahead and say related products equals to the product inline serializer. Now I'm gonna try source being user.productset.all. Again, read only being true and we'll go ahead and pass in these related products down here as a field. Save that and we'll refresh in here. And query set has no attribute PK. One problem here is that I didn't pass in many being true as well. So many is always associated to a query set. And I refresh in here. Now I have another way to see some of that data, right? Uh, of course, it's not limited, so there is some challenges to this. And yet again, we could do something very similar to this with that serializer method field. In other words, looking back to what we just did, this can also be done on this other product serializer. That it doesn't really matter. Just as long as you have a query set and then you use a serializer that can actually serialize that data. Now, the only reason that product inline serializer and user public serializer can actually serialize this data is because I'm not using fields that don't exist. So if I said, this is not real, and then tried to serialize whatever this is not real is, and refresh in here, well, that data should not actually come through at all, right? There's nothing for it to serialize. It doesn't cause an error, but there's nothing for it to serialize. Now, if I wanted to do cause an error, I would change it to a model serializer. I would do from Django.contrib.auth. I would import get user model. And I would actually set the get user model and update this a little bit. Say class meta model equals to user. Fields are going to be these fields here. So username and this is not real. And then finally ID, we save that and we refresh in here and still not getting any issues, okay? So if I did try to have this as a write only field or a write field as well, uh, there's a good chance that that will cause issues. Um, but overall, the nice thing about this is it's not breaking things if I use a field that just simply doesn't exist. Um, but what we had here, when it was just a serializer, it still worked and it worked really well. 
The only reason you want to use model serializers realistically, or well, maybe not the only reason, but a really good reason to do it is if you're using create and update on those fields. I usually default to using the model serializer because I don't know when I may use those update and create fields, except for when it's like public data. When I know for sure, I'm definitely not gonna be updating this public serializer. This is just a lot cleaner, very simple, a lot easier to test, and there we go. So if you have any questions on using foreign key serialization, let me know. This was fast, definitely fast as a section, but I sort of assumed that you already had some experience with foreign keys. So um, a lot of the things that I kind of breeze through, like the relatedness of these fields was because of that. The other part of this is, this is not a very good example to really look into how foreign key serialization works. And you'll start to learn it a lot more as you actually apply it, as you actually start using things a lot. Now, the last real big challenge that we have with this current iteration is this related products thing is getting every single product. So as your products grow, it's going to grow. It's going to grow a lot and it's not going to be good, right? Uh, so that's interesting as well. Whenever you end up using a query set or list view, it's often a really good idea to use pagination. That's what we're going to implement in this one across our entire project. Now, let's go ahead and think through the logic here. If you think about our list view, it is narrowing down my query set. It's making it a smaller query set because it's based off of the requested user. That's what we did with this user query set mix in right here, right? That actually should filter down the data. So it's not literally product.objects, you know, dot all, right? That's kind of the key. It's not getting literally everything, but this data can still be incredibly massive. Like if this user adds thousands and thousands of products, we probably don't want to have to look them up every single time, right? So in this case, I'm looking them up not only from the list view perspective, but also in the serializer itself, I'm also then looking up that same list, which is nuts. We should not be doing that at all. So our first step to making this more efficient is to get rid of that related products inline. That was meant to illustrate a purpose. I don't need it anymore. I probably don't need my user data anymore. Like I can really kind of hone in on these things. My discount probably don't need that anymore either. So let's go ahead and get rid of some of those things as well. And also some of these comments here, just to really focus in on our serializer. If you look at different branches, you can still see a lot of this old data that's in here if you need. Okay, so now our serializer is a little bit more refined. I refresh in here, it's a much better query set overall because I'm not doing two of the exact same lookups anymore. But it's still not great because it's not paginated. So what we want to do then is I want to paginate all query sets, all list view query sets, basically. To do this, we just go into our settings module. We scroll to the very bottom and we go into our REST framework here and we define our default pagination class. And this is going to be, let's put a comma right above it, get rid of that red squiggly, is just simply rest framework dot pagination dot limit offset pagination. And then we'll go ahead and do our page size and set it to like, let's set it to 10. Let's make sure we have all of our commas correct and all that. If for some reason you have issues spelling these things out or finding these packages, whenever in doubt, just go into the API guide, go to pagination and you know, copy this first item here or some of it at least. Okay, so now we've got this page size of 10. Now, if I go into my list views here, let's make sure it's actually running. Looks like it's not. Let's go back in here. Now what I've got is different kind of lookup. It's just slightly different, but it's still different. It now has results. It has a count as in the number of pages that are here and where we are currently. This lookup here is more efficient than, well, looking up everything. And now it's actually going one by one and we can actually see various things that correspond 
to all of these lookups, right? Um, and that's really the key here is I can actually paginate through. And of course I could do this all uh, with a API client of some kind, like our Python client. Um, and if we actually look at our Python client now and try it, so if I do Python and Py client list.py, username, staff, our password, uh, now it's actually showing me those same things, right? So the actual data is inside of results. That's by default. This will also show me how many pages there are, which what this does is inform us how I could actually change my Python client ever so slightly. Um, I'm actually not going to change it, but I will mention how to do it. So basically what you would do then is this response, you get a next URL in that response, the JSON data that is. So we would get JSON data. Right, so we do data and next, which is what that would end up being. And basically if next is not none, then I could do another request to the next URL then. And then I would just keep that going. I would run that recursively if I actually wanted to request every single piece of data. And then of course my results would actually be in data and results. And that would be, uh, or not request, but rather results. And that would be the actual data that I might want to display or use, right? So that's the actual product data now. And again, if we do this now with a little bit more data, uh, we now see quite a bit in there. And I also should see uh, that next URL uh, coming through. Oops, I didn't print it out, it looks like. So let's go ahead and print out that next URL as well. And we'll just say next URL. Let's run it one more time with that user that has a bunch of URLs. If I scroll up a bit, I should be able to see that it's now giving me that next you know, endpoint, which of course I could actually verify with my session authentication that I have running as well. All right, so that's pagination. It's a very simple and easy way to break up our query set so it's a more efficient of a lookup. And then we just use these parameters here to iterate through those iterations, right? So if you change the offset to maybe, let's do it at 30 or 40, uh, doing that offset means that, well, what do you know? I actually don't have any data at this offset, right? Uh, which is also pretty interesting. But if I change it back to like 20 or even changing this offset up here to like 14, right? It will still do that. And this limit here, this, this is the number that's gonna be responded back to me. So if I do two, it will show me only two. And then I'll have a number of pages that correspond to the limit and the offset. The offset is like how many pages in advance based off of the limit, right? Um, so if the limit's two and you go 14 in advance, that's only 28 pages in, right? Or 20 entries in rather. Um, so it's not gonna give us the full range at all. Uh, but if we change our limit to let's say 200 and an offset of zero, uh, then it's gonna give me everything right? Because I don't have over 200 entries. Um, so of course, you can customize a lot of these things. And that's where the documentation comes in really well. So we did the limit offset pagination. Uh, you can also do page number pagination. I say pages, it's similar. Both of these things are very similar. Uh, pages just have like an actual page number, uh, where limit offset is sort of like a page number too, but it allows you to give a amount that you're okay with for the lookup, right? So you can actually have a maximum limit as well. To do that, you actually have to configure, you have to create your own limit offset pagination class and change it as as you'd like, right? You don't do it here, you would just customize that, uh, which it actually I think even might show you that. And you can even change what's coming back through it as well. Also really, really interesting. This is where the Django REST framework docs really, really shine. Uh, it is like giving examples of things. You're like, oh, I want to change my pagination a little bit. How do I do that? Um, so um, overall, though, pagination is a really good idea when it comes to having more efficient lookups in your API. Now we're going to go ahead and implement a basic search. So what I want to do here is I want to go into my products and I want to add in a, another field in here that is just simply whether or not this is public. So I'll go ahead and say public equals to models.boolean field, and we'll just go ahead and say default being true. Realistically, the default would probably be false, but this is really to highlight 
what I'm trying to do with a search. So we want to search only public records or records that we own. So either or. So now that I've created that new field, let's go ahead and make our migrations as we do. So Python and manage.py, make migrations, and then Python manage.py, migrate. Now we're going to go ahead and create a method on this model so we can filter down a query set based off of whether or not it's public as well as whatever the query ends up being. So to do this, I'm gonna go ahead and first off create a model manager. So product manager, and this is models.manager. And what we're gonna do is define a method called search, where it's gonna take in query and the user potentially. So what this is gonna do then is essentially saying something like product.objects.filter, and we wanna filter public being true. Then we also wanna filter, filter that down even more, maybe the title and I contains being that query, right? Of course, we also probably wanna filter this user, but before I do that, I actually wanna implement this in a way that is, well, how Django would do it, which is by creating a custom query set. So we do product query set, and this is models.query set. And now we're gonna define, first off we'll just define is public. And it takes in self, and then we return self.filter public being true. Okay, so I wanna use this query set in here. The first step is changing this to self.get query set. Get query set is a method that's built into the model manager that actually refers to the query set methods that you can wrap in as well. So what I need to do now is define get query set. We are just overriding the default here. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring in args and keyword args. And then we're gonna go ahead and return this new product query set using self.model and, or passing in self.model and then using self.underscore db, which is just using our default database. This is actually a place where you could potentially use other databases as well, which is kind of cool. But now what I can do, instead of this filter public being true, I can now just use dot is public. And that will actually run this method here. And I can also then do a model manager or a query set, a product query set, a custom query set that is, with the query as well as user being none. And in here, I can now go ahead and return the self dot the filter of that query. And so now we would then do dot search query right there and then passing in that user being user. Okay. So going down this a little bit further, we can actually make this lookup more robust. So I can actually do lookup equals to, well, let's go ahead and just first off, make it really simple and just call it that. Okay, so this is gonna be my first lookup and I'm gonna import something called Q. So from Django.models, or rather from Django.db.models, we're gonna import Q and I'll put Q right there. So this allows me to write my lookups like this. And then I can also do, let's say for instance, this is gonna be our query set now. And then if my user is not none, then I can filter it down even further. So QS.filter being user equals to user, right? So this is getting that first filtering. This is gonna filter this down further. And then we can return back our query set. But of course I can make this lookup more robust and that's actually what I wanna do. Put a pipe here, add that queue again, and we can say content now, I contains that query as well. So what this lookup does now is it will look in both the title and content fields, the data inside of there. And it's gonna look if there's a match. So if there are matches that relate to this query that basically are contained in there, it's gonna look in there. And then we're gonna filter down even further based off of that search user. And that's one of the ways that we can do a query search inside of Django. Um, so let's actually now implement this as its own view. So what I wanna do is actually create a search uh, app. So I'll go ahead and do python manage.py start app and call it simply search. Now, the reason that I actually create a whole nother app 
mainly is so that I have views separated out from my other views. I certainly don't need to do that, uh, but I think it's a nice and easy way to make things happen. So what I wanna do now then is inside of my search view, I want to bring in, well, some sort of views. So we'll do from REST framework, we're gonna import our generics here and I'll call this class, we'll call this our search list view, generics and list API view. The query set is going to be products.objects.all by default. And we need to import product, of course, that model. So products.models, import product. We also are gonna import from products.serializers. We're gonna import the product serializer. Okay, so serializer class is equal to that. Now what we wanna do is, well, a couple things. First off, we want to verify again that what we're looking up in our search is public. So what we've got here is our search saying is public in the manager method. What I actually want though, is that it's done in the query set method. So I wanna for sure have is public on whatever search I end up doing. Right, so both of these things are repeating themselves. It's not necessary any longer to repeat it here. But if I run search, I wanna be able to make sure that the data that I'm searching is public because I'll show you why in a second. And that has to do with the fact that we're using this query set by default. So if I do get query set here, self args and keyword args, and I do query set equals to the super of get query set, all this is doing is calling my default value of a query set, which is this right here. Now, if I do results equals to QS.search, which I can do, because I made this product query set, this product manager, and then the last thing, of course, I just need to do is objects equals to that product manager. That means that this method right here can be run on any query set, and it just verifies that it's public. Okay, so that's kind of the key here. So the search is gonna be what our query is. That query is gonna be based off of request.get and .get q. We'll look at that in a moment, but I'll do q and then user equals to. Well, by default, the user is gonna be none. Then I'll just say if self.request.user is authenticated, then I'll set the user equals to that request user. And now I can narrow down these results or include those user results is actually what I want. Let's put the self dot in here. So I actually have another problem with my querying right now is if the query itself does not find anything, um, you know, perhaps I wanna also look in this user model. In other words, perhaps I want to include the user query set, not necessarily all results in here too. Right, so perhaps I want to actually query it down by this and combine it with the results that are similar to that, but only for the user, right? So it's possible that I have non-public data from my user is kind of the key there. So the way we would do that then is we'd first off run self.filter. So there's gonna now be QS2, uh, self.filter this, and then dot .filter, that same lookup, Again, now it doesn't matter if it's public or not. So then my final query set is gonna be the combination of QS and QS2 and then dot distinct. So before, if the user was not, uh, not none, we just actually narrowed this query set down further. This is not what I wanted. I wanted to combine those two results and that's what we get here. Okay, um, so now I've got these results here and I wanna return those back. And there we go. Let's go ahead and break this down a little bit. Um, or actually, let's go ahead and first off, just bring in this as a URL itself. Uh, so I'll go ahead and do urls.py here. And we're gonna do from django.urls uh, import path and URL patterns equals to an empty list. And it's simply path and empty string here. And we'll do from dot views or from dot 
import views, and then we'll bring in our search list view. So views.searchList view, as view, and then our name being search. Okay, and there we go. So then we just need to map this in to our main URLs. So let's go ahead and grab this API here and do search and search.urls. Great, and so far so good. And now let's go ahead and take a look at our search URLs. Let's do a quick search here. And it looks like maybe our server is not running correctly. No module named search. Let's go into our settings and add it. And then maybe restart the server. I should definitely have a module named search. So perhaps it was just something I just needed to restart. And there we go. Looks like everything's working now. And can I use none as a query value? Of course not. Okay, so back into my views. Basically, if query, if Q is not none, then we'll go ahead and do this. Otherwise, we'll just say the results are product.objects.none. So by default, we are having the results be none. And if the query set is coming through, then it will actually search down from that query set. So the final query set is assigned to results. The initial query set is just simply QS. So we refresh in here, and now I've got zero in here. So if I do a quick search with Q in the URL, setting this equal to like hello, hitting enter, now I'm getting hello coming through, you know, seven times. And what I actually want to look for here is I want to look for something that's related to the staff user. So I'm going to go ahead and grab one of these. Just let's say um, PK3. So PK number three. We're going to change the user real quick. Leave it in as public for a moment. We'll save that. We'll refresh in here. Hello. It's still got a count of seven. Now PK3 should have a different user. And let's see, where did it go? PK4, there it is right there. So here's our other user. It is showing up, coming back in here. Let's change that from being public, hit save, refresh. Now there's only six. So the query has been limited, which is pretty cool. So of course the next step in this evolution would be then to try this out on the other user and search in there, they get seven as a response, which makes sense because this one right here is actually technically private. Pretty cool. So the product serializer is probably not necessarily the class I would want for this one. I'd probably want to actually have a search serializer that might declare whether or not something is public or not. Um, but now I can actually feel good that if I am doing this search as a user, I can actually go in here and I know that this is public or private. Um, and of course, updating my product serializer, it kind of makes sense at this point to bring in whether or not it's public here. And save that. And this one's not public. So now if I refresh in this search, I see that it's not a public data, but I'm still being able to perform that search. Okay, so this is how we do search functions. Now, just to recap, a big part of this is this query set here and really these Q lookups. But of course, one of the biggest downsides of this search method at this point is merely the fact that it's only tied to the product model. So there are ways to make it work a little bit better for us in terms of Django. We're actually going to take a look at a way of a third party service, a, another API service that we can actually wrap in to our API service so that our search is robust and can work across multiple models and it queries a little bit better than what we have here. Maybe not a little bit better, a lot better than what we have here. Um, and so that's what we'll do in the next one and for a few videos to just really refine how our search works. Now, on one hand, not every product is going to need a search feature. But on the other hand, it's incredibly useful when you start to build REST APIs that 
need to search across your data. I actually think search is becoming more and more powerful uh, as a third party service, but also the fact that we sort of expect it now, right? So even if you're building just a, an API like we are here, especially if you have a lot of entries, it, it sort of makes a lot of sense to have a search feature. Um, so seeing this sort of basic example uh, will work for a lot of different search cases, uh, but it's not necessarily gonna be the most robust in the long run. At this point, our search is not great. It works to some degree, but it's not providing very relevant results. Now you might be wondering, wait a minute, your query is hello world, and the first thing that's showing up does say hello world. The second thing that's showing up also says hello world. But of course, the problem with this is actually the ordering of this data. If you look at it, the primary key of two is the first item. The next one has a primary key of four. The next one has a primary key of 22. And the pattern that we're seeing here is the oldest entry is showing up first. Now, yes, we could change the ordering of this, but this gives us insight to the fact that this search that I implemented is really just a better filter. It's just filtering down data. It's not really providing that robust of a search. And of course, that is exactly what Algolia will do for us. That's why we're using this. The other part of this is it's gonna teach us how to integrate an external API service. Now, in our case, it's gonna be a search service, but it can be all kinds of API services. And our end users, whoever's actually using this REST framework, doesn't necessarily have to know because of the response we'll end up giving here. So there's a lot of really good reasons to learn how to use external APIs. So let's go ahead and take a look at the Algolia one. First and foremost, go to algolia.com and create a new account. It's free to get started and it's free. Everything that we're doing here uh, will be free as well. And it gives you quite a bit of things that you can do. So the first thing is you're gonna wanna log into your dashboard. You're gonna see something like this. Now, if it looks like you're building an application already, that's okay too, because we're gonna do that right now as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new application. So you might log in and see this. Um, and so in my case, I'm gonna go ahead and call this application my Django REST framework, and I'll call it app. I'll say it's free, that's the only one I want. But of course, if I was doing pay as I go, look at this for, let's say for instance, 25,000 requests a month, it's only $15. Now this is gonna improve your search a lot, especially over time, which might make a much better service that you have. Now, if you're not ready to spend $15 a month to improve your search, well, then perhaps you should just stick with the free plan for a while and see how well it improves your search because you get 10,000 free. So anyways, let's go ahead and add our data center next. And what we wanna choose here is the data center that's gonna be closest to our production data center, right? So like if I was deploying my application in New York, I would choose US East. Now I'm only doing this in local development and I'm in Texas, so I'm gonna go ahead and use US Central. Uh, but of course you're gonna wanna change this when you go into production or you can just create a new application for your production app, which is probably a good idea too. Anyway, so we're gonna stick with free and yes, this is free. I agree to these terms and all that. I'm gonna go ahead and create this application now. Um, and this is where maybe you started here, maybe not. But the idea here is I'm gonna stick with experienced user because I'm gonna walk you through all this. But by all means, go through the new to Algolia user setup if you'd like. So after I do that, boom, I now have my Django REST framework application. Now in my case, I have another one called a video membership. This is for a fast API version of this, which is quite a bit different actually because if we go back into algolia.com, jump over to developers, into documentation, over to integration, and what do you know, Django right there. So there's a built-in integration for Django. This is the first step that we're gonna do. We're really just gonna be setting this up and it's gonna be tied directly to our models, which is great. This is exactly what I want, right? I want something that's tied directly to my models, just like my serializers are as well. So let's go ahead and actually implement this. Now this guide right here is actually pretty good. I'm gonna go further than what this guide has uh, in the long run, but by all means, go ahead and play around with this guide here. I think there's a lot of good information. So the first thing I wanna do is install the you know package, the Algolia Search Django package. 
the officially supported package, which is so cool. Anyway, so at the very top of here, I'm gonna go ahead and put in Algolia search dash Django. I will use greater than 2.0, or let's say greater than or equal to 2.0, and then less than 3.0. This is directly from their documentation, so I'll stick with that. And we're gonna run pip install dash r requirements.txt. And it looks like maybe I'm in the wrong place. Let me just back up a little bit here and run that again to make sure that I have Algolia search installed. Great, easy enough so far. Next up, of course, we're gonna go ahead and jump into settings.py. I'm gonna scroll to the very top here and right above these, I'll say this is third-party packages and these are internal apps, right? Right above that, I'll go ahead and put in third-party API services, which you might have others, right? Not just Algolia search. Maybe you have an email one, for example. But I'm gonna go ahead and do Algolia search underscore Django, just like that. And I wanna run my migrations, but as soon as I go to do that, it gives me this attribute error because I've been running this server. And if, of course, if I try to run my migrations as well, or simply just migrate, I'll get that same attribute error. This, of course, is because I don't have the configuration for this project. So let's go ahead and scroll down and start putting it in. So Algolia equals to just an empty dictionary. Let's save that and run migrate again. And yet again, it gives me another error. Now, this is just showing me insight to the configuration I need to use. Now, of course, if you go to the documentation, it shows you it right there. And in fact, it even gives us some things that we could copy. So if we did copy them, I'll paste those in there. And there you go. So this right here, I'll show you exactly where to get these, these values in just a moment. But this right here, I would usually put into environment variables. So to do that, I actually use something called Django-.env. And it's not Python-.env, it's Django dash dot env, which reads from a dot env file. Now, the only reason I'm not implementing this in this project is it adds complexity to something that maybe is already complex enough and it adds some time. So by all means, if you're curious about this, let me know. I have a lot of different things that cover it. But anyway, so, so let's go back into Algolia. There is one more thing I wanna add in here, which is gonna be my index prefix. And in this case, I'll go ahead and add in CFE. By all means, add whatever you like, but I'm gonna add that in as my index prefix, which we'll see a lot in just a little bit. So before we go any further, let's go ahead and see where these keys are coming from exactly in this documentation. To me, this is a great sign of documentation that has the keys in there already filled in for you. But let's go ahead and take a look into our dashboard here. We've got the Django REST Framework app. If I click on API keys, and I scroll down to the application ID. Here's that application ID that we have. And what do you know? It's the exact same one. The next key, you might think, oh, maybe it's the search only API key, but it's not. It says this is the public API key for your front end code. The admin key is the secret one. You definitely want to keep it secret and it's only for your back end. So if we copy that one or look at it and paste in here, what do you know? It's the exact same thing. Pretty cool. All right, so now that I've got all of the configuration done or the baseline configuration done for this package, I could run migrate. Okay, so now I need to actually create my first index. Now, the index itself is stored representations of our value. So it's actually gonna take this data that we have in our database and put it into their service. So yeah, we absolutely can accidentally expose data that we shouldn't be exposing of data. For that reason, I am very particular about how I design my index that goes into Algolia. So if I go into products here, I'm gonna go ahead and create index.py, and I'm gonna go ahead and just start off with class product index. We'll fill, fill this thing out in a moment, but I just wanna just highlight what it is that I'm gonna put in here by declaring the fields I want available here. So let's say for instance, I had a password field. I don't want that password field in this index. Let's say for instance, I had a customer you know, email field. Definitely not, most likely. It, there's certainly times that you might actually want it in there, uh, but I'm not gonna do that, right? For this, I really just wanna be very specific about the fields that I'm gonna use. In my case, I'm gonna go ahead and use title, content, and let's say price, 
We'll also throw in that user there as well. Let's just, you know, just reiterate, there's the user title, content price, and then heck, we probably wanna have that public value as well. So these are the default values that I'm gonna use for my product index, which again, just means that Algolia is gonna essentially take a copy of everything I have in my database that corresponds to these fields, and they're gonna be mapped pretty, pretty clearly. Okay, so how do we actually implement this? Well, first off, we're gonna go ahead and imp import the class that it needs to inherit from, which is Algolia search underscore Django, import Algolia index, and we'll bring this in here. Next, we need to use our actual product model. So I'll do from.models import product. Now, maybe at some point it'll be model equals to this, uh, but at this time it's not like that. That is a little bit closer to the serializer or the actual you know model forms and stuff like that, but it's not like that. Instead, we use a decorator that goes from Algolia search underscore Django dot decorators. We're gonna go and import register. Now this decorator here, I'm gonna use it on my index and push in product. But the way I actually think about this is very similar to the Django admin. When we do admin.site.register and we do our product and then our product model admin. This is literally how I think about these two things and how they correspond to one another. The product model admin doesn't always have to declare the model itself is really the point of that. But there's our index. Okay, so now, of course, the biggest question, now that I've created all of the conditions to have this index, how do I let Algolia know about this index? Well, the first thing I wanna do here is run python manage.py and take a look. Just python manage.py to see all of the ma management commands I have in here. There's a lot of them. One of them being Algolia reindex, clear index and apply settings. Pretty cool. So if I actually grab the reindex one, which is the one I want, this will actually do something pretty interesting. The following models were reindexed. Product, if I run it again, it works. So now going into the dashboard that I have for this application, and let's jump back into it. And there we go. So here's our search here. I'm gonna jump into search and let's go ahead and close out this product list here. And what we've got here is a number of records is 30. If I search hello world, my old friend and hit enter, look at all that. It's doing a search. And if I scroll down a bit, I've got two entries in here that actually show that. And I can see all of the attributes to this which in this case, it's showing me attributes that, well, relate to the fields that I chose. It also gives us object ID. This is definitely the primary key. This is the one that's stored in our database. All of that was designed by default for the package. But these fields were ones that I picked. Now, what if I said I don't want non-public fields to show up? How could I do that, right? So let's go ahead and go into our model. I'm gonna define a method here, an instance method, that's gonna say is public. And it's gonna take in self and it's just gonna return self.public. Okay, so it's just checking some arbitrary you know, condition in here, but really it needs to return back you know, true or false, right? It needs to return back some sort of Boolean value, otherwise uh, this is not working correctly. So once it returns that Boolean value, then we can go back into our index and say something like should index and then pick whatever that field is or whatever the method is, the actual function itself. Now, the reason I like having the function versus the actual field is because then if I had, let's say for instance, I had a publish timestamp field in here as models.date time field and all that, then I could reference and say if now is greater than, or not now, but now is greater than self.publish timestamp, then I'll go ahead and return, you know, true or false or something like that, right? I'm not going to implement this right here, but that's the point of having one of these functions. It gives us a little bit more robust control over whether or not it should be indexed um, inside of index.py or being displayed as public in other places. But now that we've got this, I made a change to how my 
uh, Algolia should be indexing all of my data. So I'm going to go ahead and run this again. And this time, well, it, it actually had one less. Now, depending on where you're at, maybe you had no changes here. So what I want to see is, does it change in real time? So back into my admin here. Uh, let's make sure our server's running. So Python manage.py run server. And let's refresh in here. I got this public value here. Hello, my dear old friend. I'll change that from being public. We'll save it. We'll go back into the search console itself. And I can just refresh on this search because it's in the URL itself. And when I do refresh it, notice that one's gone. And it's the instance of 35. If I change it back, hit save and refresh again. Oops, not there, but rather our index. If I do a refresh in here, now it's back. And what do you know? It's object ID of 35, object ID of 35. So it's actually updating my index based off of that should index value. That is amazing. That is exactly what we want when we're building something like this. We want it to have the ability to really quickly change what is being indexed and if it sh should result in our actual searches. Now, if you think about this in our current method, um, toggling between what is public is tricky, right? Certainly this method right here could change over time and then maybe you need to run re-index again. So back into the back end, you know, running our Python manage.py. You know, if we do that and come back up to Algolia re-index, you might have to do this every once in a while, but thinking back to this search method here, um, how would I actually change it if I'm like, oh, I don't want this is public thing based off of this, I would have to, you know, do a number of things related to the instance method itself, um, and then maybe changing the actual query set method as well. In other words, it's cumbersome just to toggle whether or not the search results will show this, right? Um, or whether or not the index will actually have that data. Now, the other thing is we don't have to have this index being shown up. Like, in other words, I can keep this public value, this true false value on there, and I can narrow down, I can actually filter still uh, further down on this, right? Uh, this is really just really meant to state, is this going into Algolia's console or not? Um, and of course, there's other items that we can do to augment this index. We're going to talk about a number of them. Uh, but for now, what I want to do is one more thing, and that's related to tagging. So let's say, for instance, I had another model called tags. So let's say tags model values. And those values are going to be something like electronics and cars and boats and movies and cameras, whatever, right? So we've got a bunch of tags in here that, you know, if I was a little bit more further along on my models, perhaps I would have it as a form key in here, but I'm just going to keep it in as a simple list here. And I'm going to go ahead and import random. And I'm going to go ahead and declare a new method in here and call it get tags list. And this is going to return back a list itself. So what I'm really just going to do is random choice of one of these tags. And again, still keeping it in as a list. So I just want one of these per index value. Okay, so now that I've got that, the next thing I wanna do is go back into index.py and go ahead and add in tags. Like what is the method that I can call to declare tags inside of Algolia? And it's literally tags. Like it's like these kind of values, comma separated tags, just like this. We're gonna go ahead and call get tags list. So I changed my product index. So what do I need to do? I need to re-index everything. So it's gonna re-index. In some cases, depending on how much stuff you have stored, this can take a really, really long time. And so now that I've got it re-indexed, if I do this search again or refresh in the console of Algolia, I should be able to now filter things by these tags. So if I go in the query filter and do say cars, for example, let's go ahead and search this. Uh, in this case, it actually did give me a result. So I've got a tag filter of cars and the actual query of hello world, my old friend. If I come down in here, I see that tag of cars is working. Let's go ahead and just go to hello with cars being tagged. 
Now I've got a few more. Well, I only have two in this case, right? Um, and what if I did electronics? So, and let's change that tag and add that parameter of electronics and hit apply. And electronics, I've got another one. So this is yet another thing that just gives us a little bit more robust of a query, right? And going back into our search here, um, yes, there is a way to filter things down based off of what I just did, but it is not gonna be easy. It's certainly not gonna be nearly as easy as what we'll end up doing with our own Algolia stuff, um, as hopefully indicated by how their console works and how simple their console is as well. Um, so we, in the next one, we will actually implement a client to do and perform searches on Algolia's API. Um, but as of now, we are really have the foundation of building out a lot of different indexes or indices. Um, so the other thing about this is, let's say for instance, you wanted to add in other kind of indexes. So you can also have our product quick view index or our product um, electronics index or so, you know, something along those lines where we can have other indices specifically for the model itself. Now, I actually don't think it's always that practical to have multiple indices for any given model. Um, there's probably some debate to that. It's gonna be based off of the fields, of course, that you may want to in include. Um, but the other thing is you could also create an index for your users or basically for any other model that you have, uh, which is really nice. So that means that wherever you are, you can do really robust searches. So let's say for instance, for blog posts, if you want an index just for your blog posts, there's two things that you could do. You could index the blog posts and you could search across the blog posts and the product index. It's pretty great. So now let's actually implement our search client for Algolia. Now that our product model is in the Algolia index, we're gonna go ahead and create a client, an actual search client that our Django project can use. So inside a search here, I'm gonna go ahead and create client.py and we're gonna import from Algolia and search underscore Django import the Algolia engine. Okay, and so, and this is backwards, there we go. So we're gonna define git client here, and this is gonna return back the Algolia engine dot client. Now the reason for this is so that we can do something like client and git client, and then say index equals to client dot init index, and then whatever our index name is, which I'll just tell you right now, it's CFE underscore product. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but the reason for this to even create a client in the first place is if you go into the Python API client documentation, or really just the documentation for various search methods, in our case, we're doing the search index, you'll just see this index.search. And you'll also see something like this, which this is basically taking, oh, well, there's already a client initialized. That's what this is, okay? Um, and so to me, I actually then go ahead and say git index and say index name and what my default name will be is mine is CFE product. And then I do this same sort of thing and then return back that index. So we can pass in this right here and we'll return back that index. So I can use it in other cases and also different indices as well. Okay, so now what I wanna do here is I wanna develop a method called perform and search, okay? So it's gonna take in a query and then we'll also pass in keyword arguments as we'll see. So the first thing is I need to grab that index, which is simply just get index, right? And then I wanna perform a search. It's really easy. We do results equals to index dot search and then whatever our query is, and then we return those results. Wow, shockingly easy, isn't it? Okay, so let's go ahead and implement this on our views. And this time I'm gonna call this old search list view to something different, maybe search list old view. And now what I'm gonna do is say class search list view and it's generics dot generic API view. Let's bring that back dot generic. There we go. And then we're gonna go ahead and define our get method, which takes in self, request, args, and keyword args. 
Now, certainly this could be not a get method, but that's what we're gonna leave it in as. Then I'm gonna go ahead and do from dot import client, and then just call our results being cli uh, client dot perform search and whatever our query ends up being. So that query is gonna be request dot get dot get of Q, just like what we have down here. But now I actually have the request on here and there's our results. Okay, so with these results, we have to return something. Now you may have forgotten what we need to return, but if we go back into the product model itself, like the view here or our other one, product mix in actually doesn't help us, but the actual function view does because it has this response class. So that's what we're gonna return. I'll grab this response class and we'll come back into our search here and we're gonna turn the response of the results. Okay, so let's just say if not query, then our response will be something different. Let's just put it in as, you know, an empty string and status being, let's say 400, something like that. Okay, cool. So back into our Django project, we've got a search engine here and it's already working. Cool, so hello world searched and it's giving me back all sorts of results in here. Result highlight, check that out. So I can actually iterate through all of these results and have the highlight show up. And it emphasizes with HTML, it emphasizes the two matching queries. That's pretty cool. It gives us fully highlighted matching words. What if I just said hello? Eh, same thing, it gives us the highlighted values, uh, which of course is not really that easy to do when it comes to how all of this actually worked in, in Django itself. Um, so this is cool. I now have this ability to do this, right? And all of the items are public. And of course the actual object IDs, you know, look at it and be like, okay, we've got four and then 35 uh, and then let's see, 27. So the IDs are varied quite a bit. Uh, so if I search something like my old friend and hit enter, uh, you know, it's gonna it's gonna change exactly how these results end up being. Um, so what I also want to do though is I want to be able to narrow down these results. I don't want them just to be a general query. Although even with just the general query, it's already a more relevant search than what we had, and we get a lot of lot more context in here for each field that we have. Right now, I didn't search anything by tags, so. Let's go ahead and see how we might do that. Let's go ahead and do the tag portion of all of this. So what I wanna do then is come back into my client and I wanna do something about these keyword arguments here. So initially speaking, I'll go ahead and say tags is an empty string. Then I'll say if tags is in my keyword arguments, then I'll go, just go ahead and say tags equals to keyword args pop of tags or it's an empty list now. Okay, so we can have tags being a string or a list in this case with this search method. Now, what I also wanna do is add in a params dictionary, a default one that's empty. Let's just verify that empty default one doesn't do anything to our search. It doesn't break anything just yet, and it didn't. So with this, I can now see that, oh, well, I have tags here. And realistically, now I'll just say, is if the length of those tags is not equal to zero, then I'll go ahead and update my parameters. So this is params and tag filters is equal to those tags or whatever was popped from here. Again, if I do a quick search, got nothing. Now, if I do an ampersand here and tag equals to, let's say cars and hit enter, of course the Django view didn't change much other than the fact that this right here now has two different Git parameters, query and tag, or Q and tag. Now in our search, we can actually add that one in and say tag equals to request.git, rather git.git .git of tag. And I'll just leave it as one item here. You could make this more robust if you want, uh, but now I can do tags is equal to whatever that tag is. Right, or I could actually just use the tag itself. In this case, I'll also go ahead and say or none. 
let's refresh in here. And now it's saying cars. Notice that there's one result here that's coming through. Okay. And if we come down here, we see our query. It says, hello, my old friend. It shows my also my parameters that are coming through as well. Let's go ahead and change this to electronics to see if it actually does change. And what do you know? It does. So already, again, our search is just that much more robust. Okay. So one of the things we did when we were creating this, this actual search feature, is we had this staff user in here, right? So the staff user we still want to have. But the thing is, I want to allow the staff user to see in results that aren't public anymore, right? So I'm going to change my index a little bit to narrow this down also a little bit. So let's go ahead and go back into our product model into index. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this should index method here based off of that Boolean value of public. I'm going to leave that one in here. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow for me to narrow down based off of whether or not it's public and also maybe our user. So what I want to do here is declare settings and we're going to go ahead and do attributes for fauceting. And this is going to be our user and whether or not it's public. We also, in this same breath, we can also say searchable attributes and declare which fields are actually searchable. So like title and content. You know, perhaps we don't want the user field to be searchable. This does that. So it really just narrows these things down quite a bit. Okay, so let's go ahead and actually bring this filter down a little bit more. Okay, so this is gonna take a little bit of Pythoning. So let's go ahead and actually open up the Python shell here. And we'll do Python manage.py shell. And what I wanna do is essentially rebuild this search engine index. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do from the search.client, we're gonna import all. And the reason for that is so that I can manually put this search feature in here. So the idea now is we want to grab the index filters. So essentially anything else that I'm going to pass in here other than tags, let's say for instance, I did, let me just put these in here. I'm going to do perform search and hello is our query. Tags are going to be just electronics. Let's put that in as double quotes as well. Or just empty. And then maybe public being true. This is how I want this search feature to end up working. So that means that all of my other keyword arguments, I'm going to actually put in as index filters. And this is going to iterate through each one. So we're going to go ahead and say that the key value is a string just like this. And then we'll go ahead and do four KV in keyword args items. So this might be an empty list, of course. So if not, or rather if it's not equal to zero, the length of it rather, it's not equal to zero, which it certainly can be. Then we're gonna go ahead and add on these parameters, not as tag filters, but now face or rather faucet filters. And then we'll go ahead and add them in like that. So again, it's another list, list of items, and it's just gonna filter things down. There are more advanced ways to filter this, like this and that, and many other things, but we're gonna keep it nice and simple, or as simple as it can be for now. And again, these are the attributes for fauceting. So I can only really filter by these two items which you know, maybe in our client, we should probably check that the key value pairs are only in that list, but I'm gonna just keep it fairly, uh, you know, loosey goosey here. <laughs> probably not great, but anyway, so let's go ahead and grab this search now. Paste this in here. Now I did change my index from that public, so I also need to update my index. So Python and manage.py, Algolia and reindex. Okay, so this should give me my private values as well. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and perform that search and there's gonna be hello. 
and they will go ahead and say that public is false. We hit enter, and what do you know? It does a search for me. It does public is false, and there we go. What if I use a keyword argument that doesn't work? Well, then it passes that, right? So it actually tries that keyword argument that doesn't work, which is why I made it sort of flexible like that. And of course, if public is false, and let's go ahead and do tags are equal to, um, what tag did we have for the one that actually worked? The tag that we had was boats. Okay, so let's do boats. Public is false, gives me the same one. And if we do public is true, and it gives me a different one, right? So we've got boats here and now true. Uh, so now it's a, quite a bit better of a search. It, I know this is probably still confusing overall, uh, but, but the idea here is we now have the ability to search by tags and filter down by any given argument that we might have. So the other aspect of this is if I did, then said user equals to staff, then I can actually bring it down even further, right? So now I've got a completely different search. So let's go ahead and update our view now. And we'll go ahead and say user is, well, none. If request.user is authenticated, user equals to request.user. And I'll go ahead and just use their username here. So now, of course, we can say user equals to user. And then if there is another filter that we want to have, like public is true or false, we could do that. So I'm going to go ahead and say public and request.get.get public. And I'll just give the string of that being, let's say, equals to zero or is not equal to zero, basically. So that'd be false. So the default is true, right? So that's what that would end up doing unless it was zero. Okay, and so now we've got a little bit more robustness. One thing I need to fix in my client is really just say if V, just to make sure that uh, there is a value. <laughs> if there's not a value, we don't want it to show up. Let's go ahead and see if that ends up working and say public user is none. Okay, so yeah, it doesn't look like it ended up putting that one in. Cool. So now let's go ahead and take a look at this query. I got to make sure my server is running. So Python manage.py run server, come back in. And now I search hello. And what I've got is nothing. So it's for the staff user, right? And so what I want to check here on my search, let's just check all these different queries. So I'll print out user query public and tag. Let's save that, refresh, and we've got public is true, okay? Uh, I got tag being none, which is fine. Hello being none as well, great. So now that I've got that, let's go ahead and change and public being zero, hit enter. And what do you know? It's now toggling between that, great. So, and it's also going based off of that particular user, right? So it is only showing this user stuff. And that would be true if we had no query as well, which by default we need a query. So let's just put A in there or E in there. <laughs> That's funny, it doesn't even do it for a single letter. Uh, but anyway, so we do hello. Actually, I think this user doesn't have very many data. So let's go ahead and put A in there. There we go. So the other user actually does give me some results, quite a few results actually. Uh, and all of these results are public by default based off of this. Cool. So that is our Algolia search client. Now, there are more robust ways to do this search, as I mentioned, but I think this is actually a pretty solid way that you can do where you're controlling the entire view. You're basically controlling the entire aspect except for what's actually being returned. That's really the only piece that Algolia is doing in this case. It's taking in our data, it's ingesting it, and then it's returning back what we're searching for. But we have a lot of granular control over all sorts of things. The other cool thing is you can absolutely filter by price, like if something's over or less than something. Um, so the documentation I think is really good for all of these things. And the, the reason I wanted to show you how to build this stuff 
was because the documentation does show you just generally speaking, like how to add in items like that. Like if you look for search or search faucet values, you can see here are some faucet values. You look at the examples and here are some of those, those examples, right? So we have some in there as well. Um, and so this, this is essentially what I just did, but instead of being filters, it's, it's faucet values, which um, there is definitely documentation all over the place on how to actually find exactly the way I did it. Um, but the idea being that we did that key value pair, and that's exactly what these parameters end up being. So if we print this out again and take a look at that search for any user really, and say, and public being to one or zero, and tag being, let's say cameras, get another search in there. And now we see exactly what the data that's coming through for those parameters is, right? So we've got our tag filters and our faucet filters. Um, pretty cool. I, I think overall, this is like one of the, one of the, one of the best things that we could do um, at this point without getting too far advanced. If I change the user, let's see if that actually ends up changing. It won't change it for me. Uh, but of course, if I change public being one, uh, then we get that one in there too. So of course, the only reason that the user is not changing is because of how we set it on our view. We didn't set it as a parameter. So now the big question is, do you make this get request or a post request? That is a question. I'll let you sort of think about what type of request it should be. And really, the way you can learn that is by looking at what actual search engines do like Google search engine or Amazon search engine, or in this case, of course, Algolia search engine in the console. How does it actually make requests? And should you follow along with what they're doing? Of course, my answer is yes. Now, the other thing is something we haven't set up yet, but we will is a front end client, something to actually consume all of our API as well as our search. And we'll take a look at how to use another feature that Algolia has in conjunction with our current application to have better searches as well on the front end to make it a little bit easier for our end users. Now, when it comes to creating REST APIs, what you're going to want to start to think about is this unified design to how you serialize and index your data. What I mean by that is if you take any given model, you want the final serialized data and the final indice to match what other models might look like, right? So if we've got our product model here, for example, I have user title, content price and public, that's fine. The model can be in that representation. But if we go into our serializer, this is when we actually have clients that we want to consume this. Now we're talking about something completely different potentially, right? So I've got content in here. So what I mean by this is, let's say, for instance, somebody on your team or, you know, someone sh who's showing you how to do this sends you a brand new app that you didn't actually build. And they send you a model that looks like this. No content in there, but rather body, right? So if you're sharing these things, we got content as our main body content for the product, whereas article body is really the content of that article. So two different fields here, and they're represented in two different ways, right? So this one says body, and then our product says content. And then also has a lot of other stuff in here as well that our article one does not. I really just want to narrow in on just this content versus body section to really highlight why it is that we need to have a unified design. Okay, so if we go into the API first, let's go into products here. And what we see is if I zoom into content, I've got content, no big deal, right? If I wanted to actually edit this thing, I would go into update and this would be my editing portion. Notice that it says content still. It does not say anything related to body. Now, of course, if I go into my articles though, and let's go into articles, what I can see here is it's body content. So we already have a mismatch as to what is the primary source for the body. But again, we're gonna be changing what we've done as in our product serializer to match the new stuff as in the article 
serializer or let's closer match it, right? It's not gonna have everything the exact same, but it's gonna at least illustrate what we need to do in this case. Um, so going back into our products, let's jump into the serializer now, and we wanna change this to being body. Now there's a lot of different ways on how we can think about approaching this. The first one might be just to go on the product model itself, create a new property, similar to like that is public method here, uh, new property with the property decorator and define body and it takes in self and it just is going to return self.content right so what's cool about this is it will just come in and it will actually respond back with whatever stored in the database so then if i jump into my serializer i can go into that content and just change it to body no harm no foul i refresh in my list view here and hey it looks like maybe it's not refreshing let's go ahead and oh yeah the decorator that's silly the decorator is not callable, so we'll leave it in like that. And we refresh in here. So now we've got body in here and it says, now I have content. Now, of course, if I go to update this, like one update, what I've got is, well, nothing. The content field is gone, right? This is not what I want at all. I wanna be able to update this content still in my API. So what to do? Well, of course it goes back to the serializer itself. Inside of the serializer, what we want to have in here is simply body. And we're now going to go ahead and do serializers.character field. This time, all I need to do is add a source. This source is going to be content. So now that I've got that, I now have a serializer and I can actually make changes to that content using the field name of body, right? It just maps directly to content, which is great. So if I come in here and say another new product and this is my new content. Let's go ahead and make sure it's public. I'll change the price to something outrageous. And then we'll go ahead and say put, and there we go, right? So here's that new content, it's all in there. It's looking good. We can verify this if we go into the admin uh, for that single product there, product ID of one. What do you know? Everything changes, although the field in the actual database is still content, uh, but how it's represented is now body. So now we've got title and body and also public and that how is that going to correspond to let's say for instance api and um, articles okay so api articles doesn't have the public distinction here maybe we don't actually need it i'll explain that in a moment um, but we do have title and body so at the very end of the day what we've got is our end users will or our actual clients the ones that are going to consume this api now have a better unified cohesion across the two different kinds of data types or the different stored data. That's product and article types, right? So two different kinds showing up, pretty cool. Now let's actually go into the search portion of this. If I search for anything or a new content or something like that, uh, what do we call it? We said it was another new product. Let's go ahead and do a quick search for that. So slash search and another new product there. We go. Okay, so here's my result here. Notice that it still says content. This is probably not that surprising because I didn't change much in terms of how it's indexed. So let's go back into the index for products. And now of course, instead of content, it's just gonna be body and body. Okay, so now that we've got that, we need to run our re-indexing command, so Python manage.py and re uh, algolia underscore re index, hit enter. And we got zero articles, we'll come back to that. Uh, but we've got 30 products. If I refresh on this search, content goes away, body comes in. Fantastic. Okay, so along with some sort of unified design and cohesion, one of the things we also might wanna have on here is maybe a path. Right, so if you think about our products, when the web version of this is showing up, we might want this path right here. Or maybe with our articles, we're gonna to wanna to have this path, right? Of course, I'm not actually gonna put these in action um, on this project, but the idea is we wanna have those paths. And so they're basically gonna be the model name plus the primary key or whatever the object ID ends up being. Okay, so that's what we wanna do now. First off, we're gonna go into our product and we're gonna go ahead and define 
path. This time I'm going to leave it in as a property. You can have it as an instance method as well, but we'll leave it in as a property. So path, and this is going to return again, the lowercase of the model name basically. And so uh, we'll go ahead and just call it product plural and then self.id or let's be more specific with primary key. Okay, so now that we've got that, I'm also gonna bring this in over to my articles model and we'll paste this in here. And of course, this is gonna be articles. Cool, so now I have some cohesion with those two things. Again, going into my serializers for product, I'll go ahead and put the path at the very bottom. This is basically a read only field here because, well, it's a property of the instance itself. And then we're also gonna do that same thing on our articles. Okay, so we refresh. Um, let's go ahead and jump into products and there's our path. Maybe I wanna have a leading slash. That's probably be a good idea for both of these things. There we go, Art uh, products and articles. Great. So now that I've got this path, let's go ahead and add it into our index as well. Path, say product index, just like that, and in articles as well. Save it, and we're gonna now re-index again. And sure enough, we got products re-indexed. Let's do a quick search again. This time just hello. And the result here, now has the path in there. Uh, so again, this actually helps us quite a bit when it comes to working with any given search. Now, when it comes to the index as well, what we have, we have the path, um, but we also might wanna have the URL, right? And so typically speaking, what you'll see is get absolute URL in here. Uh, I actually really prefer URL. Uh, I shouldn't say typically, but a lot of times you'll see get absolute URL because by default, what you'll end up seeing a lot of times inside of Django projects is the get absolute URL method. And in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and return the API version of this. And so it would be better if I actually had um, reverse coming through in here, but I'm just gonna hard code these things for now just to illustrate the purpose of them. So again, we've got two methods in here, get absolute URL on both of them. And then yet again, I'll just go ahead and define a property and I'm gonna define it as URL. And this one is gonna return self.getAbsolute URL. All right. So um, the reason that we have the URL method in here is because if we are having this as a client, we've got where they can actually look up. And maybe this should be endpoint instead of URL. Uh, so it's kind of the thing that you want to think about here is not so much what you actually name it, uh, but whatever you end up naming it, you want it to be consistent across all of your projects, right? And so this get absolute URL is interesting because, well, I actually want this to be my entire URL. I don't want it just to be that. Um, and that's something that we'll have to do uh, another time. And I would also leave it with you. But anyway, so we've got URLs on an attribute there. Oh yeah, we need to make sure that we are changing when we do change those methods, the property methods that we update the index as well for each one. Okay, and these also might, you know, maybe we put them in our serializer fields as well, uh, but the serializer field does have the URL. So again, having things cohesive, it probably makes sense to call them both URL and have them somewhat hyperlinked identity fields. But at this point, it also makes sense to be like, okay, well, in my product serializer, you know, perhaps I don't want to use this anymore or edit to really just match what I've got with my articles. And now I just have endpoint. And everywhere else is just simply endpoint. And that hopefully would have our absolute URL going through. Let's go ahead and do that re-indexing again. And it looks like we did it, okay, so we do a search and now it's got my endpoint. And actually to me, this actually makes a lot of sense to say path versus endpoint. Endpoint being the API endpoint, path being what you want the display path to end up looking like if you're using like React or Vue or any other sort of front end JavaScript um, library here. Um, so yeah, 
I think I think we covered a number of things related to this, but one of the things I wanted to get into was why isn't it that the index is not actually indexing articles? Why isn't Algolia indexing articles when on the display here at the article list, it actually does show articles? Well, um, so there's a couple of reasons for this. And one of them being, if we go into our models here, what we've got is this is public method. So the goal of this is to see um, if the item is public, right? So, or if it's in the past. So what it should be doing is is public should also match the public manager here, right? So make public being true and publish date is less than or equal to now in the past. Now should be greater than or equal to. And we'll go ahead and refresh that here. And now it actually does index these things. Just a really slight little change if you make a mistake. And that's where this shouldn't index is coming from. Just like what we had before, but this time it's just based off of a Boolean value and a published date. So the cool thing about that, of course, is now if I wanted to pull an article, I could go into any of them and just take off the make public, say no, and now, if I try to re-index everything, I should only see one article in there because it's no longer public. And it actually would have already been in, updated in the Algolia console. Um, so the idea of having unified design across your API is not something that's just like trivially solved, solved here. Um, it's something that you'll have to do consistently across your APIs. Now, I also would argue that you would end up doing this consistent action in your models as well. Like it should probably actually start in the models then in the serializers or the index values, right? So models.py, this is actually where we should probably correspond to a lot of things, but it, it, it's not always possible and it's not always something that you'll necessarily remember. Um, so that's actually kind of the key thing here that I wanted to get across as well, that you'll start with the models, but if you don't have control of the models, you can't change the model for whatever reason, then your index, the way you index these things as the well as well as the way you serialize these things, um, that's going to be where you can create that unified design across many many different um, models and applications inside of Django. Now the last thing to really kind of tease here is the idea that our search client at this point only searches one index. So if we want to have multiple indices, which we sort of do we might need to update and change how this is. I wanna leave that with you for now and see and challenge you to figure out how to actually make that happen, how to use different indices. And I will say the other one that we do have in here will be CFE uh, article, because it's gonna be CFE underscore, which is that you know prepinned value that we had and then article is the model name. Uh, so that's the other one. Definitely wanna challenge you to do that. Look it up on your own and try and get that perform search happening. And a big part of the reason to do that is it's going to leave you with another question. If we have a unified design of the index values, we're going to start to see this look identical across the board. Maybe we do have this price tag on here, but maybe we don't. And if it is starting to look identical, is there another field that we'd want to add in here to distinguish between a product and an article and whatever other models? And of course, the answer to that is absolutely. I'll give you a hint, you'll probably call it object and it'll probably be directly related to the name of the class that you're using. Cool. So now that we've got this, let's go ahead and sh switch gears a little bit and start working on JOT authentication tokens. In a moment, we're gonna implement the JSON web token authentication for our Django REST framework. But before we do that, go to this blog post right here so that you can scroll to the bottom and download the API client that I created for you. Now this client you're gonna put into a file called jwt.py inside of your Py client, just like this. You shouldn't have to change very much to this Jot client. Um, we will look at it a little bit, but overall, the way it's set up is very similar to what we've already done with a few added features. By all means, read a little bit more inside of that client itself. I try to give some notes as to how it ends up working. So a JSON web token or JWT is actually pronounced JOT. I don't know why, please somebody tell me. 
But the idea behind it is we aren't actually storing this token into our database. This is a little bit different than the auth token itself. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have three endpoints that will actually allow us to create a token or obtain it, we'll refresh that token, as well as verify that token. So that's actually one of those things that we'll need to do. So now what I wanna do is actually start installing this thing. So let's go ahead and go into requirements.txt and underneath the Django REST framework, I'm just gonna use Django REST framework dash simple JWT. Now it is, is important to note that the Django REST framework's recommended JOT package has changed over time. Right now it's simple JWT, it didn't used to be this. So whenever in doubt, just go to the Django REST framework documentation, of course, and look for their JSON web token authentication that they recommend. This definitely has changed, so it could change in the future. But the concepts behind JOT aren't really gonna change very much, as you'll see. So now that we've got that there, let's go ahead and install this. So pip install-r requirements.txt. And of course, I already have it installed because I was doing some tests here. And so now what I'll do is I will go into settings up high and we'll add this one in simply rest framework and then underscore simple JWT. We'll save that. And then I will also add into my default authentication classes for the Django REST framework, uh, the simple JOT ones. And it's simply this right here. Now I got this directly from their documentation. It's also in our guide, I think, perhaps not, uh, but it's definitely in their documentation as you'll see in here. So if you go into installation, we've did this, we just added this. Now we need to add their actual token and whatnot. So the actual paths for this. So this is another thing that we'll put in to the API module. So in urls.py, and again, I'm gonna go ahead and copy and paste this stuff because it's pretty straightforward on how it works. Let me know if you would prefer me to type it out. Uh, but anyways, so now we've got this and three different views. So I think they're actually pretty explicit as to what they do. The first one is to obtain the view, to actually obtain the token, the access token, as well as the refresh token. The token refresh view is how you actually refresh those and then verify will verify your actual access token. The key for our client, our JOT client here, is to make sure that these endpoints are slash API and token. In this case, they certainly are, but you definitely wanna make sure that that's the case. Otherwise, you'll have some issues with JOT.py, okay? So now that we've got all of these things implemented, I'm gonna go ahead and run migrate, so python manage.py migrate. Just make sure there's no migrations that need to happen, which there shouldn't be. But anyways, I'm gonna go ahead and run this server now. And now I'll run python pi client slash jot.py. Now, just like we've seen before, it's gonna ask us to log in. So our username and our password. And it looks like maybe I did invalid token. So I got an invalid token here. This is actually the error that I wanted to see. Um, and also the other cool thing is I now also have creds.json in here. So let's actually take a look at this first. So we've got an access token and a refresh token. This access token is actually what we're using for our header. So going back into JWT, we see that we've got a header type of bearer. So when we actually use the headers, we've got authorization, the type it is, whatever that is, and the token is the access token, right? So this is not really not any different than what we were doing with our other authentication, where we actually grabbed the request, the response, all that stuff, and then we just grab that token and put it in here. And this is actually where the problem is. This is why we're having an issue with our access is because both tokens, both authentication methods are using the same type of authorization. They're both using bearer, right? So that's why it's saying invalid token here. So how we solve this is, well, it's many fold. Number one, we could change our JOT token header. So we can come in here and do simple JOT, put in some configuration on settings up high, and we can say auth header types, and we can change this to, instead of bearer, like it is, that's the default, we could change it to like, let's say JOT, right? 
I actually don't want to do that. This is a symptom of a problem I created on purpose. So we'll leave it in as bearer. And actually, while we're here, I'm also going to add in access token lifetime. And we'll talk about that in a second. And then I will copy this and change it to refresh token lifetime. Now, the idea here is I want to have these things expire pretty quickly while we're testing. So I'll go ahead and navigate to the very top and import date time. And then we'll go ahead and add these in as date time instances. So the lifetime for the access token, we'll do date time dot time delta and seconds being 30, maybe even shorter than that, but let's leave it in as 30. And then the refresh token lifetime, we'll do minutes being one. Now, typically speaking, you would probably have this in as maybe let's say like hours being three and then this being like a day or days being one. Uh, maybe hours even being one. You could even consider it being five minutes or something like that. This is something you'll have to play around with. Uh, but the general idea is when you have a shorter access token, that just means that it needs to refresh more often, assuming that you can refresh it. Once you can no longer refresh it, in this case, after a minute, then both of these tokens fail and they'll need to re-authenticate, which we'll actually see. Cool. Um, now, the other thing I want to actually look at is inside of creds.json, the actual access token itself. I'm going to go ahead and copy this. You can just watch me for now. And I'm going to go to jot.io and go into the pasted token here. And what I see here is a bunch of information about this jot token. It gives me a user ID. This is actually important because it gives me the user ID of the user that is actually authenticated. Right. So it's giving this authenticated users data. So we actually want to make sure that this is not exposed. Right. So if you used a custom user model, for example, you're not going to want to have the actual user email out here. You'd probably just want to have the ID. Um, and even that might be something that's a little bit too exposed. So that it is one of the downsides of using Jot, but it is something important to know that you can parse a, a, a But it is something that's important to know that you can actually parse out the JWT token into a few other things uh, related to the data that's in it. But it actually is important to know that you can actually parse out a JWT token and the things that are related to it. Now, in some cases, you can insecurely add a bunch of, well, private data to this JWT token. That's not something I recommend. Instead, if you need data about this user, do a request to the backend for that because we have the expiration and whatnot all set up. Okay, so how do we actually solve the problem, though, of this authentication? If I run this again, it's still saying invalid token. Now, it actually, again, going back to the header types, it has to do with that. But before I even change the header types, what if I change the ordering of these tokens, right? So let's say, for instance, we have session first, Jot second, token third. Now let's go ahead and give it a shot. This time it refreshed the token and it showed me that there was two different lookups that were successful essentially. So it did a couple things. It refreshed the token for us. So it gave me new credentials. Um, and then also it does actually do the lookup. So the ordering of these default authentication classes actually does matter. Um, so if you have something higher up, it's going to go off of that first. Now, of course, if I wanted this other order for some reason and did the authentication again, it's still going to say invalid token. So the actual symptom of this is because of our token authentication class. I purposely wanted to break it so that we could see that this right here, probably we should just leave it in as the default, which is token. And so now if I run it, I shouldn't have any issues. So the other part about this is if I wanted to quote unquote simulate logging someone out with the Python client, I would just delete creds.json. And then now with my new client, it's gonna ask me to log in again and we would log in again. And there we go. So now we've got access granted and we're able to actually do these lookups, right? And so this time, creds.json is definitely back, but this time the token itself should be different than what we saw before. 
Like if I paste this in here, it's actually a different token, even though it gives us some of the same user data. And so that's actually part of the client itself, being able to do this refresh. And it's actually really simple on the refreshing itself. First off, we've already seen the perform authentication. All this does is write the response to a file called creds.json, which I named above. But the idea here is there's that data and it writes it in. Next, we have a verify token here. This doesn't actually print anything, but it will verify this token on some of the requests to make sure that it is a valid token. That's what this is doing, right? And I think that's a good step to have when it comes to using your actual tokens. We have a way to clear them out, and then we have this perform refresh. All this does is take in our token header, that original access token, and then passes in that refresh token. And then what do you know, it actually gets us new data in here based off of the response uh, from our refresh token. Now the actual refresh token itself doesn't change, but the access token does, and then we rewrite to that. Uh, so it's a lot of stuff that we could definitely go through, uh, but the reason I just wanna skip over it because you can hopefully at this point read through it, and now you have Jot authentication in your project, um, which is something that we're gonna use a little bit more. Now, the thing that I really do like about this is the fact that we can really just expire out those tokens by default. So after 30 seconds or a minute, they no longer have access. So after both of these times elapse, they are gone, they're done. But especially after the refresh token has elapsed. Notice that it does this, I talked for over a minute, refreshing token failed, invalid data, you need to log in again, right? So all of the things related to it have failed. And we can see this with this request right here. So we've got verify, that failed. So let's go ahead and try and refresh, that also failed. So we log in again, and now it's working, and I do this again. Notice that it is verifying this token on the request. Now, you don't necessarily have to verify it on every single request. That's not always necessary but it is a good idea to do if for some reason it's tampered with at all um, to just verify, hey, this is a valid token still, let's go and try and refresh it. If refreshing fails, then we'll go ahead and just have to issue a brand new token. Um, and so that's pretty common to do. That's one of the reasons that Jot has become so uh, incredibly used is because it's not stored in the database, so there's no way of tampering there. And then it's also has these access and refresh ability over time that you can really modify on how you see fit, which also is pretty cool. Now we're gonna log in with a JavaScript client to our Django REST framework. Now what this is gonna highlight is this allowed hosts key here and the challenges in sharing resources across different hosts. We'll talk about that a lot in detail in a little bit. Now, the other thing here is to show you a practical implementation that's not based off of a Python client, but rather a web client of some kind. And that's why we're creating a JavaScript one. So inside of our main root folder here, I'm gonna create a new folder called JS underscore client. And here it's gonna be two files, index.html, and then we're gonna go ahead and create the client.js. Okay, now naturally these two could be in the same place, but I'm not gonna do that, I'm gonna have them separate. First off, we need to create our HTML document here, and it's just like this. I'm not doing anything any really complex when it comes to HTML or JavaScript, to be honest. So the next thing is we're gonna go ahead and declare a form, and it's gonna have three inputs in here. The first one is text. It'll have a name of username and a placeholder, just saying something like, you know, your username. And then we'll close that off, and then we'll do input type of password and the name being password and spelling that correctly and the placeholder being your password. The final one is gonna be a submit button. So input type being equal to submit. And this of course is to submit the form and the value is just gonna be simply login. Okay. So as it stands right now, there's nothing really uniquely identifying this form other than the fact that it is a form element on this single HTML page. But of course, if I had other forms in here, none of these are uniquely identified. 
So what we do is we can use an ID here. This is incredibly common, as you may already know. This ID, I'll just call it login-form, no big deal. This is going to be how JavaScript can access the data that's entered into this form. Next, we're going to go ahead and do script source equals to dot slash client.js and close that off. This, of course, is referencing client.js right here. Now, to run this, we just navigate into there. So cd into js client and run python dash m http dot server and then a port. I'm going to use 8. 1111 and now I've got that port going which I can open it up here but I also I actually want to use just simply localhost so I'm gonna go ahead and write localhost here you could also do um, 127001 uh, but I'll stick with localhost okay so what is it that I'm trying to do with this form well first of all I want the post method here and of course if I actually try to run this let me just refresh this page real fast let me try and run this and go ahead and log in. I get a 501, right? So the reason that this is happening is because by default, this form can't go anywhere. It's not being sent anywhere. So JavaScript's gonna come in and prevent it from being sent to whatever the default is, and then we'll redirect it to send to where we want it to go. So the first thing I need to do on client.js is we need to grab that login form. So when it comes to JavaScript for variables, if the variable is not going to change, we use const as in constant. We could also use var, which means that it can change or let, which also means that it can change. We'll go ahead and just stick with const as a constant here. We're going to go ahead and do the selector called document.get element by ID. What do you know? It says element by ID. This is a form element. And what do you know? It has an ID. So I can actually pass in what that ID is. In this case, it's just login form. That's it. It definitely is there. Uh, but of course, if we want to make sure that it is there, we can also have a condition saying, hey, if this login form's there, you know, handle this login form. Now, what do I mean by handle it? I mean that if it's submitted, hey, what do you know? Submit, there's a type called submit. If it's submitted, let's actually do something with it. This is just a event handler. So we add something called a event listener to that specific event and that's submit. Then we create some sort of function to handle this. So the function will be called handle login and it takes in an event by default. That's what is gonna be passed to it from here. Now notice that we write out function here instead of define, but overall it's roughly the same. And then we use these curly brackets, just like we did with this if statement here, instead of spaces. That's how JavaScript works, if you weren't aware. So we are going to go ahead and handle this login. So at this point, I don't have a whole lot going on. So what I want to do is prevent the default ha action that happens with this event. We can also console log this event out, save that. And again, my server is still running on this JavaScript client, but I'll refresh it because I made some changes. So let's go ahead and log in here. I'm going to go ahead and inspect the element and actually navigate over to the console here. Now I'm on Chrome, so you could always just go to view developer, view source, or more specifically, we want to go into the JavaScript console itself. That JavaScript console is available in a lot of browsers. In here, we can actually write out JavaScript. So everything that I'm writing, I should be able to test in here as well, just like that. Think of the JavaScript console like the Python shell, if you weren't already aware of that. Anyway, so let's go ahead and log in here. I run that and I see that there's this submit event here, right? So it's giving me the event that happened and the error did not happen because I ran this event.prevent default. So this just prevents the form from being submitted like that. You can also have event listeners on buttons and all sorts of cool things. If you want to know about more about JavaScript, let me know. Um, even if this is confusing for you just a little bit, stay with me because I want to show you the error that comes about. So what I want to do now is I actually want to submit this data somewhere. Where do I want it to submit? Well, of course, I'm going to go ahead and say my base endpoint up here is going to be HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 8000 slash API. Now, 8000 is deliberate 
8,011 or 8,111 is also deliberate. Those are meant to be different on purpose. They are not on the same host as far as Django is concerned. Okay, so now I've got my base endpoint here. So what I wanna do is I want to send it to my, uh, let's say for instance, my login endpoint. That's gonna take in, we'll use these back, tick, back ticks here. This is how you do string substitution in JavaScript. It's just dollar sign curly brackets with these back ticks, which are usually above the tab. So shift and, or actually no shift, just back tick. That's it, okay. So here I've got my API. I'll just do slash. In this case, I want token. I want the jot token here, okay? So that's gonna be our endpoint. Then we're gonna go ahead and set up our options here. So I'll go ahead and say const options equals to, we want our method being, well, what HTTP method do we want? In this case, it's post. We want our headers and actually the, we don't have to put quotes on the key value pairs in JavaScript. Headers is gonna be a dictionary value, content type, and it's gonna be application, JSON. Then we need to add in some body data here. So what data do I need to add in? For now, I'll just have it as an empty string. Next, we're gonna go ahead and do fetch, and fetch is the actual method. So we do fetch, and then we pass in these options. Okay. So thinking through what this is like in Python, uh, going back into, let's say for instance, our list view here, the first part here is that fetch that we're essentially doing. We're basically doing just this right now in this client. It's just different a little bit. So fetch in this case is kind of running like requests.post, right? It's very, very similar. The only difference is instead of having keyword arguments for all the data, we just pass in it in as a object, which is this dictionary value here. That's a JavaScript object. Okay, so we'll figure out the body data in a moment, but let's go ahead and try this out. So I made some changes to this client. Let me restart the server in here and we'll go back into it and I'll try and do login. Okay, so my console's in here. If I scroll down a bit, I now get has been blocked by cores policy. So I attempted to do a request to localhost 8000 API token from this origin. Now we will solve this with something called Django course header in the next section. But before we do, I actually wanna get this data ready to be sent because right now I sent nothing to that endpoint. So there's actually literally nothing being posted here. So to turn this into something, what we can do is we can take this form, this element right here, I can actually extract all of that data by saying, well, we'll go ahead and say let login form data equaling to new form data of that login form. So this class right here is built into JavaScript, at least on the browser, that you can actually get the form data from a form element. This of course is a form element, get element by ID. So that's the element itself. And what this does then is allow me to then turn this into a, a object. So login object data equals to object dot from entries of this login form data. And so now what I can do is console log that data. Okay. and. You know, if you're familiar with JavaScript a little bit, you might be wondering why I'm using this method specifically versus, you know, attaching IDs to the inputs themselves. The nice thing about this method here is it doesn't actually matter what the inputs are on the form itself. This will turn all those inputs into some login or some actual object data. That's what these two lines do. It's pretty cool. I really, really like this method. Um, in any case, let's go ahead and try this again. So now it should actually give me the data that I'm passing through here, right? And there it is, there's that object itself. And so I can actually think of this object as uh, something I can use with this data. So if I use the key method here, I can say username, I could just log in that username here or console log it and just run something like that. And what it'll give me is the, the username that actually came through, cool. 
Uh, so that then means that I finally can wrap this into my request by making json.stringify this data. So by default, it doesn't come in JavaScript object notation, although this is technically a JavaScript object, the notation part is missing. This turns it into an actual string itself. So what I can do is say, let body string equal to that data. So we can just see the difference between these two. So if I do console log of the login object data and that body string, now I can, let me just refresh just to make sure all the changes happened. And we'll just put in some data here. Doesn't really matter what. Now I have two different data types, right? So this first one is an actual object that has key value pairs in here. The second one is just a string of data. That's actually a JSON string, something my API will know how to handle. My API knows how to handle a couple of different data types here, but this is typically what you'll end up doing with your JSON data is you'll turn it into a JSON string, which is then attached into your body itself, and then we send it somewhere. But of course, now we actually have to handle this fetch method here. But before I go down to the back end, let's actually do what's going to happen with this fetch method. So what we can do is do dot then, and we get the response back. Then we'll use an arrow function here. This arrow function will return response dot JSON. We can also take a look at what comes into that response itself. Then we have another promise that we're handling. That's, that's essentially what this is doing is handling a promise. This will handle that JSON data that comes through here. So we can do another arrow method or arrow function here and console log X. Now, these two things will only work once we implement the cores headers with Django, uh, but we should be able to see the response at this point. Okay, so let's go ahead and refresh our page and I'm gonna go ahead and unpreserve this log so it's all clear. Now I'll preserve it again and I'll hit log in. And now it's showing me this, this data here and it's actually still not even getting to the uh, re response itself. So I'm gonna go ahead and do catch. This will catch any errors. So I'll do console log error. This is actually probably where I'll see the actual error itself. So we save that and let's try it again. And there we go. So now I actually can see the error coming through uh, in this method. Okay. So to me, if you're not familiar with promises and, and you know all the things related to JavaScript, asynchronous handling of things, uh, this is it right here. Okay. So this is definitely maybe a complicated part if you're really just a Python developer and wanting to see this stuff. Um, the general idea is this right here returns something back called a promise. This right here handles that promise. So, so that dot then is like a brand new function that goes on this promise and then handles this data. And then if these two things aren't here, it can still catch that data. Again, it's complicated if, if you aren't that familiar. So I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this, but do let me know if you wanna learn more about JavaScript. At this point, we're gonna go ahead and handle a this you know cores issue that's coming up uh, because it's incredibly common especially as you're learning because of this no access control allow origin header on the requested re resource itself. It's a security thing that we definitely need to address. Now we're gonna implement Django cores headers. Now this package is maintained by my friend, Adam Johnson. He's a fantastic contributor and has a lot of really good Django books. Check it out if you like this package and the work that he does. Anyways, so what we wanna do here is we wanna implement Django cores headers so that our JavaScript can, well, overcome this issue right here. And of course, this is a security risk potentially, right? So if you don't implement this correctly, then yeah, you might just have everybody accessing your API all the time. Perhaps that's what you want, but it's also perhaps what you don't want. So we definitely wanna be careful about how we implement this. So I wanna go ahead and go through some of these things right here. Um, it's pretty straightforward on the documentation itself, but let's go ahead and make sure that we have it all installed. First off in requirements.txt, we need to add in Django course headers. In my case, I already have it in there. I believe I put it in earlier. So let's go ahead and do a pip install-r requirements.txt. And yeah, it's already installed. 
yours might be as well. So the next thing is going into settings.py. We'll scroll down to installed apps and we'll just add in our third party packages here, cores headers, save that. Whenever I add in a third party package into installed apps, I go in and run python manage.py migrate. I already know that course headers doesn't have anything that should be migrated, but I do it as a default action. Okay, so now that I've got that inside of my middleware, above common middleware, um, I want to go ahead and add in course headers dot middleware dot course middleware. Okay, so me personally, if I know that I'm going to be using the Django REST framework and some sort of web client, I often implement this course middleware right off the bat with very minimal settings. The minimal settings I'll do is cores, URLs, rejects, or regular expression. This regular expression is just the API endpoint that I actually want to use. So it's slash API dot star. Okay, so now I've got this somewhat set up. Let's actually see if it works like this. Now, in my case, I still have my backend running and my JavaScript client running. You know, perhaps you have to restart some servers and stuff like that. Uh, let's go ahead and give it a shot in my local host. I will try and log in and I still get a invalid error. Now I noticed something off of the video. This content type is just like this, right? We need a dash in here. This is what course headers is looking for. So if we scroll down in the documentation, you can actually see the allowed headers. So this is another cool thing that we can do if we absolutely wanted to limit the headers that we wanted, like content type, we could also implement new headers as well. So if you created your own token, for example, and you wanted to use different headers, you totally can uh, with that. And so content type is just content dash type. In the case of course headers, you could always add both of them in. I think the Django Rust framework knows both values, um, but cores is just a slightly different. Anyway, so, so I changed the content type. Let's go ahead and try this again and log in. I still get that blocked by course headers. Now, this is where the actual domain makes a big difference or the URL that I'm you know requesting from. This is called an origin. So right now I'm requesting to this origin, so localhost 8000 from localhost 8111. Now, if it was on the exact same origin, as in the same port as well, we would totally be able to request the data. We wouldn't have any issues. In fact, we probably wouldn't even have a cores problem in the first place, but we're not requesting from the exact same location. We're requesting from a different one. So let's go ahead and do cores allowed origins. And now what I'll do is add in all of the allowed origins that I want. In this case, HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 8111. And of course, if I had HTTPS coming through here, same thing. And if I wanted codingforentrepreneurs.com to have it with the subdomain, and the subdomains are important, codingforentrepreneurs.com would be right there, right? And you could go down this line uh, for every allowed host that you want to allow. I don't think you want to have any particular domain. I don't see why coding for entrepreneurs would be necessarily doing this request anyway. Um, but the idea here is you want to have the correct origins for interacting with your backend. Okay. So now I'm going to get rid of this preserve log here, refresh on my client and try and log in here. And what do you know? It logs me in and it gives me my tokens. Pretty fantastic. All right, so that's it for our course headers for this series. Now, the idea here is you might need to add additional configuration to match your specific needs. Now, of course, when you go into production, you probably want to turn localhost off, right? So if we said if debug, then we do cores allowed origins plus equals to whatever local testing that you're doing, you know, that's probably okay. And that's probably actually the preferred method because you don't want to just all of a sudden have local host have access to it, but no other site does. Um, and so debug in this case would be probably the preferred method of adding in your allowed origins or of course using a different module for production and uh, development for settings. 
Uh, but in any case, we've got now better setup for local testing with all kinds of web-based clients now. So with whatever web-based client you're working on, go ahead and do that. Now, the other thing in with these allowed origins, you know, perhaps you want to have uh, a lot of your allowed hosts in here as well. But unfortunately, you need to include the protocol too. So you can't just like reference allowed hosts being your allowed origins as well. It has to be the entire origin, at least the root of it. It doesn't need the paths. This is where the paths are handled is the cores URL rejects. Um, and of course, we could change that too. We can have more specific URLs that are allowed. Um, so there is a lot of different configurations. So I do definitely recommend that you check out the Django course headers package because there's all sorts of good stuff in here. And we'll probably see more things come in um, over time as well as course continues to evolve. Since it's a security idea and a security issue, um, this will definitely evolve over time. Although what we just did here is probably pretty fundamental and it will be for uh, some time to come. So that's it for this one. Um, now what we need to do is come back into our JavaScript client and start to handle some other things related to it so we can actually interact with more of our backend as we've seen with the Python stuff. Now we're gonna go ahead and use Jot with our JavaScript client. So inside of our handle login here, we actually want to store this data, the actual data that's coming through on a successful response, assuming that it's even there. So the idea here is I'm gonna create a new function and we'll call this handle auth data. It takes in just the auth data for now. And what we wanna do with this auth data is use local storage to set item. So setting item is a key value pair, so key and value. So the first key that we wanna set is really just our access key, which is in auth data dot access. And not to catch, but dot access. So that same concept for refresh both items here. Okay, so this function now, instead of having it console log, I can just pass in that function right there. That will actually handle it for us then. So if we take a look at this and actually log in, we can see, notice that I have the application open, the application tab with local storage open as well. So let's go ahead and do our login and I get my access key and refresh. Okay, so right off the bat, this should show us potential security risks with storing this data right here. Now, actually talking about all of the security risks with this um, are well, well beyond this course. The general rule of thumb here is if we are gonna store these keys, I highly encourage you to do it over HTTPS, that is HTTPS on here, as well as with your REST framework, right? So that means in production, you're not using insecure websites, that's one thing. Uh, and there is a way to lock down the Django REST framework to only accept HTTPS requests, we've already seen it. That's these allowed origins. So we don't have to allow HTTP in here. We could just deny it and you know what? Then they won't be able to have access to the tokens at all. Um, the other thing is constantly having them being refreshed is probably a good idea. But overall, if it's on the browser, in local storage, there's a chance that the security could cause issues. Again, this keeps changing a lot with Jot tokens themselves. So HTTP only storage is sometimes used. So HTTP only, um, but we're not gonna go into all those methods. Instead, I just wanna see how to implement this and make it work and we'll worry about security, better security, I should say, in the long run. I think we already have a good amount of security in here it just better security is something that we just can't spend a whole lot of time on right now. Anyways, so now we've got this handle auth data, we have those tokens, so it's finally time to do a proper lookup. So what I wanna do now is, let's say get product list, and this shouldn't actually be that big of a surprise of how we're gonna do this. First, we're gonna go ahead and grab the endpoint. So I've got my login endpoint, now I'll just call it endpoint, and we'll go ahead and say products. Then we'll go ahead and set our options. So our options being, you know, what kind of request this is, method being get, that is the default request. Headers, we are absolutely gonna have to set our headers in here. 
So the first one is gonna be simply content and type. And this of course is gonna be application JSON. And that's all we're doing right now. Then we're gonna go ahead and do fetch to the endpoint with all those options. Then we'll go ahead and you know grab the response and return back response.json. Then we'll go ahead and grab that data. So I'll go ahead and just call it data. And what I wanna do with this data is I wanna store it or actually, actually display it on index.html. To do this, I'll just go ahead and create a div called ID and content container. And that's it, okay? So we'll grab this content container. And then up here, I'll go ahead and say const content container equals to document dot get element by ID of that content container. And then I'll also create a new function and we'll call it write to content. And I'll just call this, you know, data. And all we're doing here is say, if the content container exists, then we'll do content container dot inner HTML equals to, we'll do a pre-formatted string. That string is gonna be JSON dot stringify of this data like we've seen before. And we'll go ahead and do slash pre. So all this is doing is just creating new HTML with the data I pass into it on this container element. So this write to content, or let's actually call this write to container. I'm gonna go ahead and now grab this data and say write to container of that data. Okay, so we can also console log that data if for some reason that write to container function just doesn't work for us. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look. I'm gonna refresh in here. We're gonna log in and I have a problem already. So first off, the access token stuff went away when I did the incorrect values for login, which is actually pretty great. We do want it to be cleared out, right? So we didn't actually get proper auth data, which is fantastic. And of course, the next thing is I actually don't have the product list being called anywhere. So on one hand, I could call it right here and just have it attempt to do it when it first logs in. Or what I could do is come back up into this handle auth data here, and now just go back into calling this auth data and passing in that function itself. Closing that off and passing in auth data here. But I can also pass in a callback as in when the auth data portion is finished, what could we do? We can pass in callback and then say if callback, then we just call that. So it's really just calling a function that I put in there. So basically after these tokens are set, then call the get list function, which is this. Now I don't need that. I mean, perhaps I want it, but for now I don't need it. I'm gonna go ahead and now log in and author, you know, my credentials were not provided. So that authentic the authentication there, the reason they were not provided, of course, is these headers right here. So I can go ahead and write them in. Authorization and bearer. Let's just write in an incorrect token. Let's take a look at what that does. Okay, so let's log in. And now it gives me this. If I want this formatted just slightly better, what I can do on the stringify is say null and then four, and that will give me a better look at this. There we go. So now we see another kind of token happening. Okay, so let's, let's just actually manually call it every single time for a moment. And so there is saying that I've got an invalid token. If I don't have a token at all, it's just saying that the credentials were not provided which is clear. Now the credentials are provided and they're incorrect, which is also clear, hopefully. So the final thing here is just using the actual stored credentials. To do that, we're gonna use this string substitution method here. So dollar sign curly brackets like that with these ticks on the front and back. So we use local storage again, get item this time, and then the actual key that we stored just a little bit ago. You probably wanna make these keys a little bit more unique than access and refresh, but that's fine for now. Okay, so now let's go ahead and log in. Notice that I'm still undefined here. I'll log in, run it, and sure enough, there's my data. If I refresh in here, that data is still coming through because 
those tokens still work, which is fantastic. But after a short amount of time, those tokens should no longer work, right? They should actually expire. It's gonna be about 30 seconds before this will expire, or at least it should expire based off of my current settings. Um, and so then the lookups may or may not actually come back for us. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. The other thing here is this options method here, much like write to container, I probably wanna change it into a function and we'll go ahead and say get fetch options. And this is merely so I have some defaults, right? And so the idea here is then returning back this data. So really just return what that data is. And again, const options equals to get fetch options. But of course, as you know, the method is not always gonna be get. So we can put this method here. And basically if the method is null, then I can use get. Otherwise I can use the method. Okay, so the, the, argu the method argument that is, of course. And then we also might wanna have the body data in here, whatever that is. So again, if the body exists, this time I'll go ahead and put that body in. Otherwise we'll use null and the body data will be here. Now you could also make it as like the, you know, JS object. And then if it is a JS object, then we would do json.stringify, something along those lines, uh, much like what we did up here. Uh, but realistically, I'm just gonna leave it in as body to make things simple on these options. So it's just body, body, and body. So if there is a body, we'll do that. Otherwise, we will not. So now my get fetch options can work in other places. Now I can actually think about that same idea with fetch itself. It doesn't necessarily have to be get fed op fetch options, but rather just have some sort of callback for the successful data. Uh, but I'll let you play around with that. And that's where learning a little bit more JavaScript could really help you here. But the other thing is me personally, I would use something more like React JS in this scenario um, versus writing pure JavaScript like we've been doing. Anyway, so now when I refresh in my access token, here I get this token not valid. So this is a correct response, right? So if we go back into our console, we are seeing what the response is. This is like not an error that's happening. Okay, so this is the response here. So realistically, what we wanna do is, let's put these curly brackets in here. Once you put those curly brackets, you need to return response.json. Now we can actually go into console log this response right here refresh, now I can see the response, right? And so when I get a 403, perhaps that's when I need to take it one step further and actually re-log in, you know, so I can actually handle that kind of response right here, or I could actually handle it up here. So we'll do function and um, is, let's say, token not valid. So this is gonna be my let's say response data or JSON data. We'll, call, we'll just say JSON data. And we wanna look for the code message in here. So if JSON data.code and JSON data.code equals to that exact code, token not valid, then maybe please log in again. Or, you know, run a refresh token pattern or refresh token uh, query or fetch, you know. So this part I'll leave up to you. But now when I run this, let's go ahead and make sure that we come in here of that data. So this is really just validating it. Refresh and now again, it's please log in again. It's not, I mean, it's showing that original data, but of course we don't have to. So the other thing here is I can just return false and, or return true. And then we'll go ahead and say const valid data. And then if valid data, we can write to that container finally. And naturally this is a simple way to handle token not valid errors. But if you remember back to our URLs, our actual API endpoint, 
we have a way to verify these tokens. So in our JavaScript client, what we could potentially do is when we resume on a browser of any kind, I could actually come in and run validate jot token, something just like this. Now, obviously I just copied and pasted some data here, uh, but everything that I have in here is not really outside the scope of stuff that we've been doing and just the options have changed a little bit. And so now what I could do is actually run that validate method right off the bat instead of anything else. So when they come back in here, then I get this token is not valid here. And from that, then I would probably just clear out my local storage or something along those lines to have the user actually log in, right? So basically just checking that code again, right? So it's similar to what we just saw. So this is not token data. Let's actually see if that ends up working for us. And so now it's saying, please log in again. And there we go. So this is actually also a opportunity to run refresh, right? So refresh token, you know, and if that fails, if there is a refresh that fails, then, then you can remove the local storage and run that other error, right? And so that would be one of the ways to do it, one of the many ways. And of course, still, you know, checking your data to make sure the token is not invalid. Um, but the goal here is not really to build a front end full on. It's really just to sort of think through how to actually consume this REST API as it currently works. And part of that is actually running refresh and verify with these tokens, because that's something you'll have to do from time to time. So at this point, I actually want to challenge you to figure out how to do that refresh based off of what we just did for validate, as well as the handle login method itself. I think it's pretty straightforward if the documentation's in there. And you know, maybe at this point, your JavaScript skills are there. If you're not interested in learning more about JavaScript, don't take that challenge down. Um, you could always reference the Python version as well, because that's not a whole lot different. Okay, so now what I want to do is take this one step further and actually implement a search feature that's based off of our search API that may or may not need our actual tokens. Now we're going to go ahead and implement our search API. It's going to be very similar to our login form, but now it's just going to be our search form. The actual input itself will be Q for query. This time the placeholder should be your search, right? Whatever that is. And then we'll get rid of the password portion here. Post data doesn't really matter. Get data, whatever the method here doesn't actually matter because we're going to handle it with JavaScript, but it should be a get method. Uh, the value itself will be simply search. Okay, so let's save that and we'll take a look at it. There's our search there. And so what I want to do is I'm going to perform a search in the client or handle it with the client that is. So let's copy the login form and call this a search form and search dash form. Very similar to the login form. So we'll go ahead and copy that and say if search form add event listener for submit. This time we'll call it handle search. Shocking, I know. Next, we're going to go ahead and copy the handle login method here. Now, what I may or may not need is my authorization. But we'll, we'll deal with that in just a little bit. And we're going to change handle login on the second one to handle search. Base endpoint is simply search. I'll just call this endpoint. Now the question is the actual form data itself. So let me just cut these out. And this is going to be, we'll just call this form data and just simply data. And of course, this is coming from instead of the login form, but the search form. So now I've got this data and this endpoint. I do not want to turn it into body data. Let me go ahead and get rid of that. This is actually a get method. And so what I want to do is actually add URL parameters to my endpoint. And it's actually pretty straightforward on how it's done. There's a built-in way to do this by actually creating something called a URL search params object. So I'll go ahead and say let search params equal to new URL search params. And we just grab the object itself, the data from that form. And so with that, I just come in here, 
put a question mark. This is how you designate search parameters into a URL. And then we put dollar sign, curly brackets, those search params. It's really just that simple. Next, of course, we're gonna do our endpoint here. And this time it's not auth data, but rather just simply data. And so I'm gonna go ahead and write to the container like we did here. So write to container of that data. Okay, so I'll talk about the authorization in a moment, but now we'll go ahead and handle that search and I'll say, hello world, quick search and what do you know? Here's the data. And of course that data comes back as a object itself. So if I do data.hits, I can console log that. So we can do console log, you know, data.hits. And again, searching hello world, exclamation mark. There, it actually logs out each one of those objects. So that means that I could, of course, iterate through those and just display it a lot better, um, which is just not something we're gonna do at this point, obviously, because this is not about building the best front end with JavaScript, as I mentioned. Okay, um, so now we have a way to see that data. What about our actual authorization, right? So what's definitely gonna happen here is if I put in authorization and bearer, and then you know some random token, let's say that and do another search here of hello world, hit enter, I get this token invalid error, of course. Right, so it's not a valid token at all. So the authorization here, this is where actually having my validate jot token method, that would make a lot of sense to validate it right off the bat and also handle set validation, right? Handle it in some way, whether it's refreshing or whatever. So um, what I wanna do here is let's go ahead and look at our application and we've got our tokens in here. They actually are in there. Um, and so now what we wanna do is grab one of those tokens, but only if it exists. So I need to change how my headers are written only slightly. So the first thing is I'll go ahead and say const headers is equal to, first is just simply the content type, okay? Next, I'll go ahead and say my auth token equals to local storage dot get item. And we've been calling it just simply access or nothing, basically. If auth token, then we'll go ahead and go into our headers and set the authorization header, right? So we can now set it in here and we can use string substitution for that auth token. And now of course, we can set our headers just like that. So this is for those views that may or may not need that token. So if I get rid of these tokens in here, I can search hello world and have no worries. If I log in and log in correctly, that is, and do a search, I can now see what that search is again. Now, of course, if the token itself is changed and do a search again, I get an invalid token. So naturally I would wanna handle this in some sort of fashion, not like what I just did, but handle it where there's actually some JavaScript that shows it. And to give you a little sample of what we could do to improve the user interface for this, we could actually just set something along the lines like this. Again, we're validating whether or not the token data is there. We're also checking if the content container is there. If it is there, we're gonna empty it out. Then we'll check if the data is there. If the data is there, we'll do stuff with it. Otherwise, we'll just say no results found. So let's go ahead and try this out. We'll do a quick search for hello world and please log in again. Okay, so in this case, our actual access tokens are incorrect. If I get rid of those, this time it does show up, which is maybe not the behavior we want. Perhaps we always want them to be logged in. And again, if I do this login, here we go. If I do something that has no results, let's do Let's say like, I don't know if this will. There, we got no results here. This time it actually did have hits. So there actually was hits in here. So really maybe we'd have something along the lines of checking if the hits length is of certain length. So, or perhaps we put in here, let's just go ahead and say, if the hits.length 
is you know equal to zero, then we will also put in this data here. Okay, so we do some weird search and I gotta log in again. Again, weird search, no results found. Hello world, bunch of results found. Great. And so this is okay, right? Again, I would use React.js or something like this to handle this and make it look a lot better and have a much better user interface. Uh, but the overall idea of all of this was really just give you a sample of how to use a JavaScript client with a REST API. Now, the thing about this search method itself, it has, well, a few things that are left to be desired. One of them is like auto suggesting some of the searches as you type. And so Algolia actually has a feature for that for JavaScript. So this is part of the thing that we've been working towards is seeing just improving our searches overall with our backend. Um, and it's still going to be basically the same data, right? It'll still result in the same data, but it's just going to be a little bit more powerful. So that's what we'll take a look in the next part. Now we're going to go ahead and implement Algolia's instant search. So let's go ahead and dive right in because once you actually start using it, you're going to be hooked. So going into algolia.com slash docs, go to building search UI here and click on what is instant search. So if you scroll down a bit, notice that there's support for React, React hooks, view, many other places, as well as just pure JavaScript. We're going to be using the pure JavaScript one, but I am stoked that there's React. If you want to see that covered in some of our React tutorials, let me know. Otherwise, let's go ahead and jump into the installation. Uh, you also might want to check out the live demo on your own, but let's go into the installation itself because I want to get right into this. And we're going to be putting this directly into our page. So let's click on that to get the JavaScript itself. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this, jump over to index.html, right above my client.js, I'll bring this in here. And while I'm in here, I'm actually gonna go ahead and say form, style, and display none. I no longer want my search form in here at all. Um, and so now that I've got the JavaScript side of things, I wanna also add in the styles as well. So all of the CSS related to making this look even better. So of course you don't have to use their styles, you totally, can style it yourself, but I do recommend using their styles if you aren't great at CSS or if you just wanna save a ton of time and still get something that looks great. Okay, so now that we've got this set up, all of our HTML is, well, almost done. Next, what we're gonna do is, well, basically, we're gonna declare our search box. This is gonna be the container element for it, much like we did with the content container. This is gonna be just the search. Next is gonna be the hits. Okay, so these are the things we'll initialize. A search field and then the actual results themselves. So going into client.js, I'm gonna to navigate to the very bottom here and we want to initialize this. So the first thing is our search client. This is gonna be Algolia search and then it's gonna be our actual app ID and our key. Now, the thing about this is if we are in this installation and I scroll up a bit, uh, notice that these things are already filled out for me. Maybe not everything, but some of it is. So if I paste in here, I get some code that's already ready to go, including the search box and hits. Now, where are these keys coming from here? So if we go back into our, you know, our application itself and we go into our API keys, first go into the overview here, still in the Django Rust Framework app, go into API keys, application ID, there it is right there, there it is right there, and then the search only API key is right here. You might wanna regenerate that from time to time, and in fact, when you go into production, you'll probably wanna have these keys actually retrieved by some API endpoint. That's not something I'll do at this time. At this point, I think you can do it yourself. Now, that's also true probably for this instant search here the actual index itself, like what index do we want to use? In this case, it's going to be CFE product. Now, generally speaking, I like to avoid hard coding any values that could change over time inside of my JavaScript, or of course, hard coding API keys. So all three of these things would probably be better served as an API endpoint that we just use. But to spare some time, I'm just going to omit those for now. So that's it. That's all I changed. 
just a few things, some copy and paste. So let's go back into our project. And what do you know? I already have some results in here. And if I search hello world, my old friend, I actually get results and it's happening in real time. It's searching everything. But of course, this is not how I want this to look. I want it to look, well, better. So how do we go about doing that? It has everything to do with this hits portion. We can come in here and say templates and we can go ahead and say item and then set in an item related to all this. And so, and the first thing is, I'm just gonna go ahead and do title, just like that. That's it. Refresh in here, there's all my titles. This should look a lot like Django templating engine or even Jinja templating engine. They're not identical, but they're very close, at least for rendering out things like this. So I can also do, you know, a P tag and do something like price, save that, refresh, and what do you know, there's my price. Now, if I put a dollar sign in here, this is now causing some issues because that's a tick there, right? So we need to escape that with a slash, and then now I've got my dollar sign. So I can actually run inline create view, and well, only inline create view shows up. I can do some gibberish and no results. Fantastic. Like, look how easy that is. I don't know. Um, I can't gush about it enough. The next thing is maybe narrowing down our actual results right off the gates. This is called a refinement list. Uh, there's a number of refinements that we can actually use, but I'm going to use a very basic one. Now, the question would be is, where do I find these values as well as the refinements themselves? And this comes back to how we indexed everything. So going back into our products and index.py, here's all the fields we can use, literally all of those names. And here is all of the refinements I can use. So the attributes for uh, faceting, right? And so, or faceting. And so what we wanna do here is narrow it down based off of user, for example. So going back into the client, we can go ahead and say instant search dot widgets and then dot refinement list and declare the container. And I'll call this hashtag user dash list. That's of course gonna be something we need to add. So go into index.html. Above the hits here, I'll go ahead and do ID equals to user dash list. Okay, so back into our client uh, client here. The next thing I wanna do in this refinement list is declare an attribute. In this case, it's gonna be our user. Okay, so that attribute again is something else we can put in here as a P tag, and we can say what user it is just to you know see that actual user come out. Now, in your mind, replace user with author or, so, or like brand or all sorts of things. But what we see here is I can now narrow my results right off the bat based off of either one of these things, right? So staff, we got product new. Let's go ahead and just do product new. And notice that CFE also has one. And now I have both of these things in here. Now, the other thing about this is we can use roughly the same thing. I'll just go ahead and copy this. Instead of a refinement list, you can actually just say clear refinements. This is just a button to clear user selections or something like that, or really refinements. This is how their documentation has it. No attribute necessary. Just make sure that it is in there. And then we're going to go ahead and add this in. Now, if you ever forget something, like if you added like I just did and didn't actually add the element into the, um, and this is, should be clear refinements, excuse me, not refinement. Um, we get container must be a string or element, right? So it's not an element at this point. So it does break it, right? Uh, unlike what we did with these if statements there. Now that doesn't mean we can't do it where it doesn't break. In other words, like, you know, this, this doesn't exist on our HTML. Um, we could totally make it a little bit different to where it does some validation and some checks for it. Uh, but I'm going to skip that for now and just say div ID equals to clear refinements, save that we refresh in here. And now I can clear these if I have any. And again, we can have multiple. Let's say what it looks like with multiple. I'm going to copy this 
and this is going to be called public list public okay and so back into index here user list and public list save that refresh and now we've got both right so naturally i could put another div here and just say you know h3 public items public <laughs> okay um and so then we put that in there just like that and that will like separate those two things out a little bit uh, but now we have a pretty robust engine for searching and it it didn't take very long i mean granted i i mean i'm not doing the work algolia is doing the work but we had to have our index actually working even to get to this point but as far as instant search con is concerned this is fantastic and we have a lot of customization over it now let's actually customize our result a little bit more, right? So this is okay, uh, but perhaps I wanna have, well, some highlighting in here. So let me just tab these out a little bit more. So I'm gonna go ahead and highlight the title, for example. And I also have a body element in here. So both things, maybe I wanna highlight a little bit. Some of them have body, some of them don't. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do a div here and a div here. just like that. Okay, and there we go. So how we actually highlight this is something I'll just copy and paste to show you how it's done. So we change it from this to this. Let me open this up a little bit. And so first you just put helpers on the outside and then you gotta close it out. Notice the slash and hashtags, and then you declare which attribute. In my case, I use title. If I do the same thing with the body, I would just need to change the attribute to body. And then if I come back into my search, do a quick refresh and do hello world, now it actually even highlights my results. And then my old again, what do you know? Look at that, I think that is just so cool. Um, anyways, so that's how goal is instant search.js. I think this is a much more practical thing to use in all of your projects, whether it's uh, something that you're familiar with or not. That is the JavaScript portion of it. And the reason that we even built the JavaScript client was to lead up into this because a lot of you may have very little experience with JavaScript. But even if you do have experience with JavaScript, you see, hopefully see how much easier it is to use all of this. Now, some of you might be like, well, why is it styled this way? Why isn't it spaced out a little bit better and all that? Um, that's just because of how I styled it. I didn't do much in the way of styling. I didn't like put a sidebar and main content area and stuff like that. Things that I'll leave up for you. Um, so if you do have questions on Algolia, Algolia Instant Search, please let me know in the comments. Otherwise, let's keep going. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Hopefully you got a lot out of this one. At this point, I recommend that you learn how to build some sort of client to consume our newly created REST API. When you build these clients, as we did a little bit, you actually see some of the back and forth, the things you need to consider with what the data is in the REST API and then what your client might end up needing. Sometimes they're aligned really well from the get-go, sometimes they are not. That's one aspect of this. The other aspect is to actually review other API services that are out there and see how they design their APIs and see if you can do things similar to really just make your Django REST Framework API that much better. And also, let me know what you do. I would love to see the projects that you're working on, whether that's just a simple GitHub link or an actual full-on website. Let me know in the comments. Otherwise, thanks again for watching and I look forward to seeing you next time.